Bennett, it's time for you to settle down with someone. I glanced up from where I was resting on my VIG Chesterfield sofa, which shift to keep from indenting the material, as I trained myself to do. At the foot of it stood my mother, who was giving me such a deep disapproving look that I almost, almost made a move to sit up properly. Her expression was the definition of disappointment. Slim nose upturned, devil red lips twitching. I already knew where this conversation was heading and I let my cheek fall onto the cool leather with a sigh. This again, I said. You're almost 30, Bennett she said, folding her arms across her chest, the many bracelets lined with diamonds on her arms jingling as she moved. Her dark hair was tied in a tight bun on the top of her head, giving her an all-around stern aura. I raised an eyebrow at her. I'm 25. I don't really think that's close to 30. Your father and I married when we were 22, she said matter-of-factly. It's time for you to stop fooling around and creating scandals and making our family look bad. I don't make our family look bad and it's time for you to start your own family so we can give a head start to the next successor of our business. She pressed on. I pushed myself into a sitting position, making sure to smooth out my waistcoat, lest I gave her something else to complain about. So, do you expect me to meet someone today and fall in love with them, get married, and have children? It doesn't work like that. Well, maybe it does nowadays with all the dating apps going around, but I'm not like that. There are plenty of young women interested in you. Cecil's daughter has been asking for your hand in marriage since you two were five. She's very beautiful, too. I raised an eyebrow at her. Legal arranged marriages aren't a thing in America anymore. It's 2015, not 1765. I don't want to marry someone just because it helps our business. You want a marriage made out of love, she asked, her voice taking on a hard edge. Rich families marry into other rich families to keep their wealth. It's what all our ancestors have done before us and what we will continue to do. That's how we keep our business alive. Arguing with her was fruitless. I'm not interested in marriage right now, that's all. She closed the little distance between us hovering above me intimidatingly. I've given you 25 years of freedom. I've given you everything you've ever wanted. All I ask is for you to repay me with the promise of keeping our business alive, and I will, just not right now, I responded firmly. The business wouldn't be going anywhere in a long time. We were basically the new Hiltons. What was eating at her? Why was she suddenly trying to force this on me? You have no more choice in this matter. If you don't settle down, I will take your car and your house. I own this house and my car. You can't threaten me with that. My mom smiled cruelly and I felt a chill run down my spine. You think I can't find a way around that? As much as I wish she was joking, I knew she wasn't. I scrambled off of the sofa, placing my hand over my pocket where the keys were. Wait a second. Wait for what isn't this a little abrupt. I need time to think about it first. You can't just barge in here and expect me to go along with this. It shouldn't come as a shock, Bennett. You can't thank your brother for that, a surge of heat shot through my body. I bit my lip, clenching my hands so tight my fingernails bit into the skin of my palm. Don't fall for it, I warned myself. She just wanted me to back down, and she knew where it hurt the most. Your brother wouldn't give me this much of a hassle. How can you use Lee against me, I said tightly. It's your choice, Bennett I'll, I'll find someone. It wasn't like I had a choice. I just had to think of a way out of it. Quickly. Will you? Yes. Good. However, I want you to give me a year. Her eyes narrowed. A year. For what? Exactly I would like to find someone on my own. Then when the year is up, I'll bring her to you, and we will talk about marriage. You can't really expect me to just suddenly meet someone and marry her, can you? At least let me meet a few of the other candidates first. The room was deathly silent as my mother contemplated my offer. I could feel sweat forming on the back of my neck. If only she would agree to my proposal, then I could have more time to figure out what to do about the ultimatum she'd given me. If she said no what could I say against her when she used Leah's leverage? Six months, she finally said. Six, you may have six months to court someone, she permitted. 
Not a day more. When the time is up you must bring the girl you choose to me and I will decide if she will be allowed to marry into our family. If she fails, you'll marry who I choose. Of course, there would be conditions. There were always conditions. Fine, I agreed, knowing she would get her way no matter what. I had to take what I could get. The wrinkles on her forehead relaxed and she smiled. Good. You may keep your car. Make sure you come to work today. There's someone you need to fire. I understand. I responded, watching as she turned on her heel and clicked away from me. As soon as she left, I collapsed back onto the sofa, feeling a headache coming on. Why was she so adamant about marriage? I was perfectly content with the way I was living my life satisfactory and alone. I didn't feel the need for a girlfriend. And even if I did have any of those needs, I could find a willing partner from the local bar. For now, I had to find someone to at least trick my mother into thinking was my girlfriend. It wouldn't be too hard. It wasn't like I didn't have the physical appearance to goad someone into doing it. I was on the cover of multiple business magazines. Paired with my conditioned polite and charming personality, I knew I was a good catch. And if that weren't enough, I'd just show them my bank account. If only money could buy me a girlfriend, I thought wistfully. Then it hit me. The plan was simple. Find a woman, hire her to date me for six months, fake a breakup right before I brought her to meet my mother, and then claim I was too heartbroken to move on. That way I wouldn't be forced into a marriage with a stranger and I would be allowed to stay single until I met the person I was meant to be with. Surely my mother would feel pity for her son going through his first heartbreak. It would be easy. I grinned to myself, adjusting my tie. Henley Hattie, table four has been waiting over two minutes for someone to come and take their drink order, Colin, the manager on shift, said as he walked by me, heading toward the hostess stand. I blinked at him, trying to ignore the fact he got my name wrong for the thousandth time while wondering if he noticed my arms filled with plates of food for a different table. When he glanced over his shoulder and frowned at me, I gave him the fakest smile I could produce. I'll be right over. Good. Rolling my eyes, I hurried back to table number seven. I hated table number seven. I didn't know if I was just my luck, or maybe the table was cursed but whoever sat there ended up always being the rudest and crudest and most condescending people on the earth. This time around it was a bunch of businessmen in sleek suits that tried to leer down my shirt every time I leaned over to clear a plate or a glass. Chicken cordon blue I announced as I set down one of the plates in front of a large man wearing a star-spangled tie. Nice, he commented and I wasn't sure if he was talking about the chicken breast or my breast. Still, I held my tongue. If I remained nice enough, these guys would definitely give me a generous tip. Do you need anything else before I go? I asked after I'd handed out all the dishes. Please say no, I begged internally. Another blue moon please, star spangled more unrequested. I flashed him a smile. Right away, as I turned around, I caught sight of Colin staring at me and pointing to table four frantically. Am I the only one on shift? I muttered to myself as I turned toward the table. Noticing there were only two people sitting at it, I relaxed a little bit. At least it would be an easy one. Hi, my name is Henley, I'll be serving you tonight, I greeted them, offering the two a wide smile. The two young men both turned toward me at the same time and I immediately felt my confidence drop as I recognized the pair. They came in at least once a week and they were both drop dead gorgeous. At this point, I had thought I was used to handsome men and beautiful women coming to this restaurant, but the feeling of inferiority never went away. And these two were top tier. Tonight they were both wearing button-ups, rolled at the sleeves to reveal their veiny forearms. One of them wore a black shirt with a white tie, while the other had a white shirt with a black tie. I didn't know if it was on purpose or not, but either way, they made a great duo. It made me a little mad. What was up with filthy rich people being so attractive? Wasn't it enough that they had money? They had to steal all the good looks too. It was so unfair. Or maybe I was just too bitter. I had to work on that. A strange name, but I guess that's not important, the man on the right said, his tone smooth and curious. He had dark, 
neatly parted hair that was pushed up in the front. It a strange name, but I guess that's not important, the man on the right said, his tone smooth and curious. He had dark, neatly parted hair that was pushed up in the front. It was a little curly at the top and the back of it was styled so that it looked tousled. He studied my face, his dark green eyes squinting a bit. The other tried to cover a laugh and my eyes shifted to him. He looked like your typical description of a boy next door chestnut colored hair, brown eyes, a pretty face, and a kind smile. Uh huh, I get that all the time, I said, feeling like I'd been staring at them for five minutes when in reality it was only five seconds. His comment annoyed me. I'd served him a couple of times before. Is this really the first time he paid attention to my name? It's cute though. The boy next door responded, smiling politely at me. I stared at his teeth, feeling a stab go through my heart. Of course, he had perfect teeth. Perfectly straight, perfectly white. Why would I have ever expected otherwise? These two were on a whole different level than me. I couldn't look even a fraction as flawless as them even if I took five hours getting ready every day. Can I start you off with something to drink? I asked wondering if I sounded as depressed as I felt. Every second in front of them was like a hard kick to my morale. A shot of lag of villain for me, Henley, the dark-haired one said, not even bothering to pick up the drink menu. Absolutely. And sorry for this, but I need to see your ID, I responded, offering him a half smile. He didn't look underaged and I was pretty sure I'd served him alcohol before, but it was better to be safe than sorry. What? You don't know who I am, am I supposed to? He looked troubled for a moment before something dawned on him and he nodded. I guess I wouldn't expect someone like you to know, something about the way he said that irked me. Was he a celebrity? He looked like he could be an actor or maybe a musician. But then again someone like me would definitely know if he was. He was probably the son of some rich guy who made airplanes for a living. I didn't particularly care who he was. Your ID. I repeated. The guy dug out a black leather wallet from his jeans and stitched along the lower left-hand cover was the word Hermes. He held out his hand. Here you go. I took the ID from him, my eyes sliding over the name on the card before I could stop myself. Bennett Calloway. Really? I thought. Bennett? What kind of name was that? It didn't ring a bell, either, so he probably wasn't famous. Pursing my lips. I scanned over his birthday, December 25, 1989. You're a Christmas baby, I said, handing the card back to him. Bennett nodded, tucking his ID back into his wallet. Since the day I was born, I felt my lips twitch into a smile before I could stop myself. Kinda sucks though, doesn't it? I bet your Christmas and birthday presents are combined as one, without even blinking his response was a nonchalant, no, never. I just kind of let out an awkward laugh. Figures. Anything for you, I asked the other man. I'll have a glass of ice water, he said. No, he won't. He'll have a nice shot of whiskey with me, Bennett cut in. Give her your ID, I'm going to stick with water, Bennett shook his head, giving his friend a disapproving look. I'm going through a crisis right now and it is your duty as my best friend to drink the night away with me. Give her your ID, I wondered what kind of crisis this probably filthy rich, 25-year-old could be going through, but figured I was better off not knowing. If I heard anything along the lines of not being able to afford three Porsches I'd probably off myself. I hated to believe first impressions, but this guy kind of looked like the type of spoiled person who would consider that a crisis. Then, I wouldn't really call this a crisis, aha. Uh -huh. It probably was a three Porsche ordeal. What a world I lived in. Seb, we are keeping this lovely girl from doing her job. Just give her your ID I promise I won't make you take more than a couple of shots. I know you're lightweight. The light-haired man hesitated for a moment before grinning and pulling out this wallet. You're a pain in my ass, make that two shots of Lagavulin Bennett said smugly. After checking his friend's ID Sebastian was his name and it rather suited him I went over to the bar to give our bartender Trav their order. When I glanced back at their table I saw Bennett eyeing me and I stared directly back at him until he noticed. 
At this point usually the other party would look away, embarrassed at being caught, but this guy just held my gaze with a pleased expression on his face. Feeling awkward, I turned away first and saw Star Spangled Moron at table 7, waving me down. Crap! The Blue Moon! Can I grab a bottle of Blue Moon? I said to Trav. I totally forgot I was supposed to get him one. Trav peeled the cap off on the edge of the bar and handed me the open bottle. He's been watching you like a hawk all night. Twenty bucks says he asks for your number. I pretended to gag as I walked away, reluctantly heading back to table number seven. As I grew closer, I summoned the sweetest smile I could. I'm so sorry about the wait for this, sir. Maybe I'll forgive you if you give me a kiss, he joked, causing all of his douchey colleagues to laugh along with him. For the tips, for the tips, for the tips, I chanted in my head. Maybe when I get out, I flirted. His eyes flicked up and down my body and I felt my skin crawl. Ooh, just you. Anyone else need anything? I inquired. One of the other guys muttered something I probably didn't want to hear under his breath. I decided to take their silence as a no, so I flashed them a quick smile and hurried away. Tables 2 and 8 needed to be wiped down still and I didn't see either one of the two busboys on shift around to clean it. Just as I turned to head into the back Colin appeared in front of me, scaring me a bit. Jeez, warn a girl when you're approaching like a ninja, please wipe down tables 2 and 8, he requested, pulling at his necktie. They've been dirty for the past 15 minutes I'm way ahead of you, I said, letting a little irritation bleed into my tone. Why did he always feel the need to tell me to do something? I knew what needed to be done before he probably did. He pissed me off. Oh now guests are coming in, go greet them, Headley. What are you waiting for? It's Henley, I gritted out before heading off to go do the hostess's job now. Honestly, working at Michelangelo sucked. It sucked hard. However, the money I made. That did not suck. Since this was a high-end restaurant for even high-end people, I made a good sum of money every shift I worked. So even though I usually played waitress busgirl hostess bartender while the other employees barely did their one job, the money kept me going. I could deal with Colin being a weird creature and never knowing my name. I could deal with the creepy, old businessman hitting on me all night. I could deal with it all because I needed the money and the money was worth it. So I greeted the new guests as pleasantly as I could still trying not to feel inferior in my black pencil skirt and white blouse while standing next to gorgeous women in silky red cocktail dresses. And then I wiped down the dirty tables. And then I got another beer for Star Spangled Moron and I knew someone would have to take his keys from him. And then I completely forgot about table number four until Colin was on my ass for forgetting about them. Fortunately, Trav had seen I was running around like a chicken with its head cut off and had delivered their shots of whiskey, which were empty on the table when I finally got back to them. I'm so sorry, I said immediately, lowering my head and praying they didn't yell at me. There goes a good tip. Sebastian offered me a sympathetic smile when I raised my head. Don't worry, are you ready to order? You probably are. I've been gone for like five years. I'm really sorry, hyperbilies aside, you've been gone for 15 minutes Bennett informed me, glancing at his watch. Do you usually make your customers wait this long to take their food order? I opened my mouth to reply, but I was a little too caught off guard by his curt words to think of anything. Sorry, I finally said. Typically, a customer should spend a little over an hour in a restaurant. Drink orders are taken upon immediate arrival food order taken after 5 minutes. This allows about 20 minutes for food to be prepared and about half an hour for the customer to consume it, he explained, speaking very matter-of-factly and very elegantly. We've been here over half an hour and have only had our drink orders taken when at this point in our visit we should already be receiving our food. Sebastian shifted in his seat. I gawked at Bennett, speechless. I so did not need this today. Um? Okay. Sorry, sorry doesn't make up for poor service. Stay cool. Henley, stay cool. I'm sorry, I said again. I wonder what the owner would think of how his employees run this place. 
Surely this isn't suitable for you. How much do you make to act like this? Listen, I apologize. So is it really necessary to be so rude about this? I snapped, feeling my hand start to shake in humiliation. Did he really have to go as far as making fun of the fact that I worked as a waitress? I didn't make enough to put up with this. Bennett jerked his head back. What I really am sorry about forgetting your table and I'll admit it was my fault, but it was only 15 minutes. You could have flagged me down, or anyone else for that matter. I don't expect you to know who I am, but I'm sorry but I don't really care who you are, I interjected. Is there a level of importance that makes it okay to make fun of someone's job? If you want a new waitress, fine, I'll send someone over. Although I can't promise you'll have better service since I'm probably already taking care of her tables, Bennett furrowed his eyebrows. That wasn't going to be a threat. I was just going to say I admire your courage to stand up for yourself. Oh, I blinked. Oh, I wasn't trying to scold you, either. That was a piece of information that would be useful for you to tell your boss. Not that I expect this place to have such high standards, Bennett Sebastian sighed. Nothing against you, Bennett added, directed to me. My words are mainly directed to your so-called co-workers who seem to think chatting in the back is more important than the guests on the floor. When I asked how much you made, it was because you clearly deserve more, I looked between the two of them, feeling confused. So, he wasn't trying to be a jerk. He was just spreading his knowledge. Either way, I probably shouldn't have snapped. I was seriously lucky he didn't seem offended by it. Bennett's pretty oblivious to the way he speaks, so you'll have to excuse him, Sebastian told me. He means well, usually, oh, um, that's okay. I really shouldn't have snapped at you either. Sorry, do you make enough money here to live okay, Bennett asked. What Sebastian elbowed Bennett in the side. Ignore him. We've held you up enough. Should we give you our orders? Oh, yeah. Sorry, no need to apologize, Bennett said, rubbing his side. I'll have the herb encrusted pork chops with asparagus. Another shot of Lagavulin with it, please, I nodded, making a mental note in my head. I'll have the ginger glazed mahi mahi Sebastian said, taking the menus off the table and handing them back to me. And a glass of water, sure and sorry again. I'll let you off this time because you seem suitable, Bennett said, lounging back in his chair. I raised an eyebrow. Rich people had weird personalities. The next hour passed slowly. The businessmen at table seven were steadily getting drunker and drunker as each minute passed and I wondered what Bennett would have to say about their average consumer time. The whole lot of them had been here for more than two hours. Not like Bennett could really talk either as he himself was a little past tipsy and on his way to drunk as well, so he'd probably be here a while too. He'd switch to beer though. Just as I was about to start cleaning off the countertops, I saw someone waving at me in the corner of my eye. Groaning, I went back to table 7. We are ready for the check, one of them slurred. And some cabs, I joked. I want you to take me home, star spangled moron purred, eyes lighting up mischievously. Trying not to make a face, I forced myself to laugh. Ah, if only I could leave this place. Do you guys want me to do separate checks? Put it all on mine, Star Spangled Moron said and I took his credit card from him and brought it up to the register to ring him out. I balked at the final total. It was more than I could make in two weekend nights waitressing. I hadn't realized how much they'd really ordered until now. And he wanted it all on his card. How generous. On my way back to the table a hand shot out and grabbed my arm. I jumped a little bit, relaxing when I realized it was just Bennett. Gotta pee, he stated. I pointed to the far left corner of the restaurant. Over there, using me as a support and almost taking me down, he pulled himself up and then stumbled to the bathrooms, muttering something about marriages. I glanced at Sebastian, who shrugged at me. I returned the card to Star Spangled Moron and he filled in the tip and signed the receipt, handing the notebook back to me. It was hard to resist the urge to see how much he tipped, but I managed to slide it into my back pocket. Thank you very much. Have a good night you guys. Get home safe, 
as I turned to walk away. I felt a heavy arm across my shoulders. You said you're coming home with me. I saw the spangled tie and felt my stomach churn. Please don't touch me, I know you like me. You were eyeing me all night. Lucky you, little blonde girls like you are my favorite. I tried to duck under his grasp, but he only held me tighter. He placed his other hand in my hair, his breath heavy on my neck. I have to go check on the other tables, I said. What are you? Just a tease, when I signed up to be a waitress, I figured I'd have to deal with a little bit of harassment from creepy customers. It was a given in any customer service job, unfortunately. So yeah, I was a little pissed at this guy, but I could handle it. I'd done it before. If I made him mad it'd make my manager mad too, because you never knew just who these people were and what kind of influences they had. Me flipping out at Bennett was a mistake that could have been ten times worse than it was. I couldn't let it happen again. So I took a deep breath. I'm sorry, I'm just really busy. So you are interested how that translated into that, I had no idea. Please let me go, that's when I felt it. A massive hand on my ass, pinching it roughly. I felt the blood rush to my face as a wave of nabsy coursed through me. Okay, this was crossing the line. This was sexual harassment. I wasn't sure what to do. I didn't want to cause a scene. It could cost me my job. But did I call my manager? Call the cops? I couldn't let him keep touching me. Hit him, someone barked out. And without really thinking, I listened to the voice, bringing my fist around and straight into the pervert's jaw. He let go of me and I shoved myself away from him and into a hard body. For a moment we both wobbled but then a pair of hands clamped down onto my shoulder, steadying us both. I turned my head to see it was Bennett. You bitch, star spangled moron sped out, moving toward me. I flinched a bit, pressing myself more firmly into Bennett. Enough, Bennett said. Who do you think you're talking to? Bennett raised his eyebrow at the older man. Who do you think you're talking to, Mr. Curtis Vahum? Star spangled Moran while Curtis actually froze, his eyes widening in recognition and maybe fear. I glanced at Bennett, who picked a piece of lint off his shirt and flicked it onto the ground. There weren't a lot of people in the restaurant, but they were all staring at us. I saw Colin in the far corner looking like someone had run over his cat and I knew I was in trouble. MMR. Callaway, Curtis greeted, sweat starting to form on his fat neck. Good seeing you, it surprised me to see this pervert who definitely had more than 200 pounds on Bennett and was probably twice his age look so terrified of the younger man. Why was that? Was Bennett part of the mafia or something? I wish I could say the same about you, Bennett remarked. However, any man who could watch what I just witnessed and still be glad to see the man involved wouldn't be a friend of mine. Maybe I'll rethink our friendship, it's her fault, I scoffed. Oh please, whether it was her fault or not, you simply do not touch women without their permission, Bennett said. Please take your leave now, and amazingly, Curtis did just that. Not even another word back. The group of men he had been with had already dispersed leaving him to waddle away alone with his head down. I let out a long breath of air. My body felt gross and I knew I'd have to take a long, hot shower to feel clean again. Where did men get off acting like they could do as they pleased to women? I should have punched that guy more than once. Crap, that's right. I punched him, I groaned. And my boss saw. He's so going to fire me. I messed up. That guy deserved it. You should have punched him instead of telling me to do it, I muttered. Then my jaw wouldn't be at risk, Bennett stared at me flatly. My hands are too delicate I caught myself staring at his hands. They did look pretty dainty. No, I shouldn't be thinking of that, Bennett. The plans for the hotel in Walea, Hawaii have gone accordingly. Both our construction team and the town mayor have approved the blueprints. I have the estimated budget here and if you approve. You may sign and we could start the construction by next week. I looked up from my phone to see a few nervous pairs of eyes blinking at me. I turned to my wild-haired assistant, Henry, who had the same apprehensive expression on his face. I'd forgotten I was in the middle of a meeting. I had no idea what we were talking about. 
I cleared my throat. If my mother agrees to it, let's go along with it. Oh, Bennett, your mother said for you to oversee this, Henry whispered to me. If we go to her she will scold us. I shifted uncomfortably in my seat. Were they still talking about the building of the hotel resort in Walea? Or had we moved on to something else? I couldn't concentrate today. It was all that girl Henley's fault. It had been one week and she had yet to call me. Every few seconds I glanced at my phone wondering if I'd see it vibrating with an unknown number on display. What was taking her so long anyway? I figured she'd call the next day and we'd work out a deal. But she hadn't. And the last two times I'd been back to the restaurant she hadn't been there. Mr. Callaway. Ah. Let me see the projected costs again, I said, hoping I could piece together everything by that. It didn't matter what I said anyway. My mother would get the final say on the plans no matter what. After the meeting, I went back to my house and found Sebastian waiting for me by the front door. He held up a hand in greeting. How'd the meeting go? Boring. They don't really need me. All I say is yes or no. What are you doing here? Hiding from my mom. He said, following me inside. I raised an eyebrow at my friend. You can't at your house. Why don't you just lock your doors? She has keys. Change the locks. She'll have keys, he said, shaking his head. She's crazy. She won't come here though. I think she's afraid of your mom. I wouldn't have been surprised. Most people were. I definitely was. Don't be noisy, I warned him. He waved me off. I'll do my own thing. Don't worry about me, sighing. I plopped onto my couch and checked my phone. Nothing. Sking, I tossed it away from me. You look like your prom date ditched you, Sebastian commented from across the room, where he'd taken a seat at my computer desk. In his hands was a newspaper he'd produced from God knows where. So much for him not being noisy. I gave him a moody look but realized I was just proving his point so I looked away. Why hasn't she called? Who? Henley, the girl from the restaurant I nodded. Well, your note was a little weird, he informed me, opening the newspaper. I was drunk though. She knew that, he shrugged. Did you leave a bad tip? I blinked. Did I leave her a bad tip? I remembered writing the note, but I couldn't remember writing a tip. I can't remember what I left her. Maybe it really was a bad tip. Well, we did have to wait half an hour for our food. I said. She hadn't been a bad waitress, but not exactly the best one, either from a professional view. From a personal view, it wasn't fair she seemed to be running the entire restaurant by herself. I did vaguely remember her bringing me to the bathroom so I wouldn't vomit all over the restaurant, which went beyond her responsibilities for a customer. I owed her a good tip for that, at least. Sebastian flipped a page. The manager had her running around non-stop, give her a break. I felt tired just by watching her. If I were her, I would have walked out. I frowned, crossing my arms over my chest. She said she needed money. Why wouldn't she take me up on my offer then? Perhaps she didn't get fired like she expected she would, which reminded me. I had to call that restaurant and make sure her job was secure. She shouldn't lose her job because of one pervert. How could anyone blame her for her actions? The moment I'd noticed that immoral man's hand on her bottom, I'd been ready to sucker punch him in the gut. Fortunately, at the last second, I'd remember just exactly who I was and how I was expected to act. It was far worse for me to hit him than for her too. And I probably shouldn't have told her to punch him but I blamed that on my drunken state of mind. Admittedly, I had enjoyed the sight of those dainty fists landing a rough blow on that degenerate. For such a tiny girl, she had quite the hook. I'm going to find her, I decided. Waiting around for a call wasn't really my style, anyway. Don't you think you're taking this a little too far? Sebastian asked. You know I don't have much of a choice, Sebastian. She might think you're stalking her, unfazed. I pulled out my phone, ready to call for some assistance. Someone who looks like me would never be considered a stalker. You have heard of Ted Bundy. Right. I ignored him, dialing the number for Michelangelo's. 
After a five second long spiel by whoever answered the phone telling me they couldn't give out employee information, I gave them my name and they quickly changed their mind. Telling me she was most likely at her other job and easily gave me the name of the place. I was also informed of her month's suspension and she wouldn't be back at the restaurant until then. I hung up the phone, a little worried about the amount of information they had given out. Sure, I'd needed it, but it had been a bit too easy. A month suspension seems like a bit much. And why in the world does she have two jobs? I pondered out loud as I went over to my closet to pick out a nice suit. For some reason, I felt the need to look good. These days you need two jobs to live on minimum wage, Sebastian said. I decided against a suit and slipped into a navy button-up and threw on a mint-colored tie. If she's poor then that's even better why, she'll be interested in the money and I won't be interested in her. I said. She was the best possible candidate to be my fake girlfriend. I'd been worrying about finding someone and I'd found her on day one. It was perfect. The longer I pretended to be in a relationship with her, the more heartbreak I could pretend to feel. I stretched, smiling widely and feeling satisfied. Today was going to be a good day. You're so creepy, Sebastian commented, but his tone was amused. Are you sure this is a good idea? I only have good ideas, he chuckled, closing the newspaper and placing it on the side table. What are you going to do if you actually fall in love with this girl? Impossible, I answered immediately. The reasons for that were simple. A. She from a different lifestyle and therefore incompatible with me. B. It would be counterproductive to my plan on being allowed to be single. And C. I hadn't fallen in love with anyone for the past 25 years, so what were the odds of it happening now? All in all, there wasn't anything to be afraid of. When the contract was over I'd have no problem saying goodbye and never seeing the girl again. Maybe even down the line we could get coffee and laugh about our fake relationship. Sebastian scrutinized me for a few seconds, his lips pressed in a flat line. I didn't know why he was so worried. He was in the same boat as me. All the girls around us were the same they wanted our money or they wanted to say they slept with a millionaire. It was almost impossible to find someone genuine. All right, he finally said. I know nothing can keep you from what you want to do anyway. Go hunt her down. You coming with me? I asked. I wouldn't miss this for the world. My car? Do I have a choice? Not really the keys to my recently exchanged BMW were already in my hand. I wondered what kind of expression Henley would have on her face. One of the most elite men in America coming to look for her personally? With such a contract to offer. I could almost see those blue eyes widening, a little sparkle of awe glinting in them. Her cheeks becoming rosy at the prospect of dating me, even if just for a ruse. Her pink lips softly parting as she gasped. Suddenly I really, really wanted to see that expression. Henley, hey, does the last name Callaway ring any bells for you? I asked Ariana, exactly one week after the whole restaurant fiasco. We were currently at my other part-time job, a coffee shop aptly named Coffee House. Ariana was, decidedly, my best friend. She may have filled that role solely because I didn't have any other friends and we worked together a good portion of the week, but I was more than content with her. She was cute and friendly and an all-around good girl. The type of person everyone needed in his or her life. If I answer that will you fish tail my hair for me? She responded pointing at her dark hair tied up in a messy bun on the top of her head. I was already late for work and couldn't really do anything with it. Fine, fine, sit down. Ariana cheerfully took a seat on one of the stools lining the counter up. Fortunately, the coffee shop was pretty dead, as it usually was in the afternoon, so I had plenty of time to fix her hair up. I'm actually worried that you don't recognize the name, she said to me. Although, you do live under a rock most of the time. I tugged on her hair a little harder than I had to. Is he an actor? No, why would you think that? Uh, he kind of looks like one. She whipped her head around to face me. I quickly let go of her hair so I wouldn't pull it. You saw him, she exclaimed. Careful, and yeah, he was that guy I told you about at Michelangelo's the other night. Who is he? Think about his name carefully for a moment, 
she replied, looking forward again. She gestured for me to finish the braid. You haven't seen it anywhere. I pursed my lips, rolling a hair tie off my wrist so I could lock the braid in place. No, I can't remember. That's why I'm asking you, remember your 21st birthday, as it was a night to remember. I nodded. Do you remember where we stayed? That hotel near the casino, I answered. She turned around to look at me again and nodded. And what was that hotel called? Callaway Express. But why? The connection took a moment. My jaw nearly dropped. It explained so much. Me being supposed to know who he was, his attitude, the fanciness, the $10,000 tip. Oh man, seems like you recognize it, she giggled. Ah geez, no wonder why he knew so much about average customer times, I mumbled. The restaurants at the Callaway Hotels were a hell of a lot more extravagant than Michelangelo's. Bennett probably ran some of them too. But why had he been dining at Michelangelo's anyway? Surely he got free meals at his own restaurants. It's going to be hard to track him down. You want to find him? Why? Well, the thing is, I pulled out the receipt from that night and handed it to her. I'd kept it because I knew Bennett had been way drunk when he wrote it and it didn't feel right just taking the money. It sat in my bank account, untouched. I wanted to return it. Ariana's jaw dropped as she saw the tip amount. Wow, he must have really liked you. What's with the random 43 cents and that weird note? He wants you to be his girlfriend. You didn't say you two were flirty flirty. What exactly happened again? You should definitely call him. And you should get me a job at your work. I shook my head. No way. I couldn't let someone like you work there. You'd be eaten alive. What's that supposed to mean? You're too cute for your own good. I'd be afraid of you getting harassed. And besides, I'm returning the money. She handed me the receipt again. Why? That would really help you out, Henley. Yeah, but it's not right. He was really drunk. So? Drunk and rich. I doubt someone like him would even notice they were missing 10 grand. Ah, it's annoying to even think about. You should just keep it, she advised, poking at the finished braid. I slapped her hand away. You'll mess it up. And I'm not keeping it. It feels weird. Besides, the note had said the tip was an advance. An advance for what? I didn't know but an advance was something you had to pay back and I'd rather just avoid the whole thing altogether. Ariana turned to me, her brown eyes taking on a serious edge. All honest hearts aside, you should at least keep it for emergency money. What if something happens to you or your brother or your apartment? How much do you have saved up on your own? Not enough was the answer to that, and as much as I did want to keep the money for extremities, I couldn't bring myself to do it. It just didn't feel right. Taking money from drunken people was like taking candy from a baby. I just can't keep this money. I'd feel gross. I'm giving it back. Resigned, she sighed lightly. I know. I'd probably do the same in the end. It kinda sucks though. Ten grand to the rich is nothing. Ten grand to us is everything. Hey, at least we appreciate each dollar more than them, I responded brightly. Um, she responded, trailing off and gazing out the door. Then her eyes widened and she turned back to me. Oh my god, she pointed toward the door. It's... Callo. Look, just as the door jingled, signaling the arrival of a customer, I pivoted to see none other than Bennett Calloway coming through the doors. I felt like I could spot the confident gait and that trussed up hair from a mile away. I stood rooted to my spot in front of the counter. What in the world was he doing here? Henley, he greeted me, a handsome smile on his face. I wasn't sure if I was more weirded out by the fact that he was here, or that he remembered my name. I glanced at the young man he'd come in with and realized it was the same guy Bennett had been with at the restaurant a week prior. What was his name again? Bayats. Bastion. Like from The Little Mermaid. Crab, I said aloud, eyeing the light-haired man. His expression became confused and Bennett quickly put a hand to his mouth, disguising his laugh as a cough. Realizing what I said, I felt my face warm up. Wait, sorry. 
I didn't mean to say that. I meant to say Sebastian. I was just thinking of the little mermaid, it's okay, Sebastian said, smiling a little bit. I'm pleased that you remembered my name, actually, was it weird that I remembered his name? Probably. I was just as strange as Bennett now. I haven't met a Sebastian before, that's why. I covered. Bennett smirked. Have you met a Bennett before most likely? I answered, his smug look annoying me. He immediately dropped it and folded his arms over his chest. After brooding for about 0.5 seconds, he glanced around the shop, now seemingly interested in it. I followed him with my eyes as he walked over to the painted mural on the wall, then to one of the wooden tables, and then finally to the marble counter. Ariana stood behind it, near the register. She shot a bewildered look at me and I gave a slight shake to my head as if to say I have no idea what's happening. She brushed her bangs out of her face and smiled hesitantly. Um, would you like something, Mr. Calloway? I narrowed my eyes at her. Mr. Calloway? Why was she being so polite? This guy barely looked older than us. Your phone number? He responded smoothly. Ariana became flustered and I did my best not to roll my eyes. Sebastian shook his head a little bit, but he was smiling. I'll actually have an iced coffee. Black, please, Bennett said before turning slightly so that he could rest his back against the counter. I thought he kind of looked the type to drink black coffee. All businesslike and strict. Ariana went off to make his beverage and I walked over to him, my arms still in my apron. What are you doing here, anyway, I asked. How had he known I worked here? I came to see you, he answered. Why? He pushed himself off the counter, closing the distance between us. When he was about five inches away, he stopped. I caught my breath a little, uncomfortable with our proximity. The scent of his cologne wafted in the air between us. It smelled good. A very woodsy smell. You haven't called me, he stated simply. I looked into his dark eyes and swallowed nervously. His presence almost felt overbearing. Clearing my throat, I took a step back. Was I supposed to? I left you a note. Yeah, a weird note, I told him, pulling it out of my pocket and handing it to him. Don't you remember? Or were you too drunk? Brows furrowed. He smoothed out the wrinkled paper and skimmed over it. I waited for his reaction to the tip amount, but his face didn't change. I was worried that I didn't leave a tip but I see that I did. What's with the 43 cents? I asked because I couldn't help myself. I like for a flat dollar amount to be taken out of my bank account. Well, that kind of made sense. I didn't understand how he wasn't in shock over the total, though. Yeah, I've been meaning to return it to you, return it to me. You were drunk. You didn't know what you were doing. I haven't spent any of the money, I promised him. I'll return it to you right now. Let me grab my checkbook. I don't want it, he interrupted, shoving the receipt back at me. Do as I said and take it as an advance. I paused, staring at him like he was crazy. An advance? For what being my girlfriend? Obviously wait, he had been serious about that. It wasn't just a joke. Or part of his drunken stupor. Sorry, I have your coffee, Mr. Calloway, Ariana announced gaining the attention of the dark-haired man. He turned and gave her a handsome smile. Thank you, whoa, wait a second. I turned to Sebastian, who'd taken a seat at one of the wooden tables. His head rested against the wall and his hands were folded across his lap as he watched us amusedly. Is your friend crazy? I asked him. He chuckled a bit and shrugged. Maybe. I'm not crazy, Bennett said, taking a sip of his coffee. I didn't miss the slight grimace on his face. I'm only being sensible how is giving me $10,000 and asking me to be your girlfriend sensible I demanded. And like every typical girl being asked out by strangers I said, I don't even know you, Bennett seemed a little unsettled by my response. He pressed his lips into a flat line and asked, Well, this isn't what I'd expected. I really wanted to throw my hands up in the air and tell him he was out of it, but I refrained. Will you please just take back your money and leave? I won't leave until we have a deal, he told me, walking over to the table Sebastian was at and taking a seat opposite of him. 
Excuse me, Mutz. Do you have cheesecake? Ariana pointed at herself and Bennett nodded. We do. She responded immediately. I'll bring you over two slices. Um, would you like anything? She directed her question to Sebastian. Please. High coffee, regular cream, and extra sugar. I wanted to tell Ariana not to get them anything, but they had become paying customers, so I couldn't. I felt like I was the only one unnerved by the situation. Sighing lightly, I went behind the counter to get their pastries. What's going on? Ariana whispered to me as soon as I was close enough. No idea, I said. Her eyes were wide with excitement. How are you being so cool about this? If Bennett Calloway asked me out, I would faint. I wanted to say that there was no way he was just asking me out. There was a reason for it. On the strange note he'd left, he'd said we could help each other out. But with what, I wasn't sure. I decided that would be my first question for him. After plating two slices of cheesecake and covering them with strawberry, I returned to the two young men, placing the dishes in front of them. Then I dragged a chair from a different table over and took a seat. How did you know I work here? I asked. Why did you come? I'm here because you haven't called me back and I found you by calling your other job, Bennett answered easily. He picked up a fork and cut off a little bit of the cheesecake inspecting it for a moment before putting it into his mouth. It's been frozen, he said, making a face. We're a coffee shop, not a pastry shop, I told him, a little irritated by his reaction. Maybe he wasn't used to anything that didn't cost more than $20 a piece. I was going to have to say something to the employees at Michelangelo's though. You weren't supposed to give out information on any employee, and yet they'd given mine to Bennett. Sebastian tried to take Bennett's plate away, obviously fine with the pre-frozen cheesecake, but the latter pulled it out of reach. I'll still eat it. Better to not waste food. Henley, why didn't you call me? Why would I? He gave me a look as if to say who would it. We can help each other out. I've been telling you this for the past ten minutes, yeah, but how? I pressed. I had no idea what I could do for a man who had everything. You said you needed money. I have money. I need a girlfriend. You are a girl, he spelled out, pointing his fork at me. As I said, we'd make good business partners, I stared at him. I don't know what kind of person you are, or how you grew up, but you can't just buy me, Bennett frowned a little at me. I'm not buying you. I'm offering you money in exchange for services, like your own prostitute I exclaimed, eyes wide. Was this guy serious? Did he not see what was completely wrong with what he was asking? No, not a prostitute, just my girlfriend he amended. Just for six months. All you have to do is show up to a few parties with me, snap a few photos, and act the part. No need for any sexual favors, I stared at him and he stared back at me, unblinking. His face showed no hint of humor. He was serious about this. I couldn't believe it. Why? He sat a little straighter in his seat, smoothing out his shirt. Various reasons, but mainly so I'm not forced to marry a stranger of my mom's choosing, so you're going to fake that you have a girlfriend. What good will that do? Also, I was pretty sure you couldn't force someone to marry anyone else, but I didn't say anything. Who knew what went on in the Callaway family? She's given me six months to find someone I'm interested in. I figure if I find someone, pretend to date them, say I've fallen in love with them, and then have them break up with me. I can claim I'm too heartbroken to move on, he explained in a rush, not even pausing to take a breath. His lips curved up a little and I could tell he was proud of his plan. Speechless, I once again turned to Sebastian to gauge his reaction. His eyes were lit up with enjoyment, like this was the best thing he'd seen in a long time. He obviously knew how bizarre his friend was being, but wasn't saying anything to stop him. Er, okay, I finally said. Bennett's size never left my face and I bit my lip. So you want me to pretend to be your girlfriend so you don't have to get married? He nodded. And why me? Right place, right time, he tried, giving me a hopeful grin. You caught my interest and I feel slightly responsible for having you suspended from your job. I shouldn't have told you to punch Curtis, 
I grimaced at the memory. No, you did right there. That pig deserved it, still. The month of suspension was complete bullshit. I was lucky I had a second job to try and scrape by with. Bennett leaned toward me. Let me make it up to you. Be my girlfriend. It'll only be for six months. I'll pay you as I see fit. While the idea of being paid to date someone made my skin crawl, I was curious to know just how much money was involved. The coffee shop didn't give me many hours. I'd barely be able to make it by even with my savings. Okay, let's say I might do it, perfect. Let's start with the fine details, he cut in, searching for something in his pocket and pulling out his phone. Wait, I didn't say I agree yet, I said, holding up my hands. There's a lot to think about, he gave me an expressionless look. Is there? Why? I'm good looking. I'm successful. I'm wealthy. What more could you need? Well, he definitely had the confidence for his looks. Doesn't it sound weird to you at all? I'd feel cheap. Listen, Henley, he started seriously, his gaze piercing into mine. It's just for six months. Just think of it as two friends helping each other out. But, there was no way I could agree to this. No matter how much I thought about it, I couldn't stoop that low. I had to uphold some kind of dignity. I'll pay you 10000 per month, I blinked. Huh, not bad, right, he asked cheekily, Bennett, Hook, Line, and Sinker. Chapter 4, the moment I made my offer and saw Henley's face go blank I knew I'd won her over. Money could buy anything, after all. So what are the terms, she asked and I found myself grinning widely. Let's discuss them, shall we, I suggested. I unlocked my phone, pulling up the agreement I'd constructed over the week. Sebastian stood up from the table, deciding to give us some privacy. He went over to the counter to keep the other girl company as she stared wistfully over at us, obviously curious, but not wanting to invade our privacy. Henley watched me warily and I could almost see the inner struggle she was having. While I didn't blame her for having trouble agreeing to this, I didn't see as much wrong with it as she did. We were using each other. It's how all business deals worked. Don't you think ten grand is a bit much? She asked. Not at all, I responded truthfully. If I was completely honest, I doubt I'd even notice the money missing from my account. Not wanting to be too immodest, I kept that little tidbit to myself. Henley let out a little laugh that sounded more like a sigh. All right, I have the basics laid out here. I started, setting my phone down on the table and pushing it over to her. Read through it and let me know if you'd like to change something. She pushed the lock of her blonde hair out of her face, inspecting my phone. You wrote up an agreement. This is a business deal, I reiterated. We might as well do it the right way. I've outlined what we will have to do together. We'll be seeing each other multiple times per week. I want to be as convincing as possible. All monetary needs will be handled by me, that is meals, travel, attire. Her head snapped back up. Attire. I nodded. I will purchase the required attire for you. Um, what's wrong with my clothes if you have dresses? I'll check them out. But if I don't find them suitable I will buy you something else. Her expression became defensive and I fought a smile. I figured it would be like that. Why people had such a problem with other people buying them stuff. I had no idea. What? Do I not look rich enough to be with you? She said sarcastically. Yes, I answered because it was the truth. Then before she could speak I added, I'm not trying to offend you, but we need to fool my mother into thinking you're of a higher class. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with you, Henley. As you said I know nothing about you. However, I do know my mom and she won't hesitate to stick her nose into our business if she doesn't believe you make a good figure a year. Henley pursed her lips together looking a little embarrassed. I didn't know why she felt embarrassed. I don't know, was she planning on changing her mind again? We won't have to interact with my mother often, I plan to keep that very limited. Even I didn't want to interact with my mother often. If I have to, I'll buy my own things, she told me. I frowned a little. I'm sure you don't have the money to waste, so don't worry about it. Her cheeks became tinged with pink. 
If you're going to make comments about how poor I am, I'm not going to go through with this. It's not like I'm homeless and starving. You work two jobs though, I said. I sat back in my seat a little, watching her. She was quite the spirited girl. I liked it. How old are you? Her mouth almost dropped. That's right. You don't even know my age. What if I'm underaged? You didn't even think about that, did you? I know Michael Angelos doesn't hire anyone under age, so I know you're at least 21. She looked young, so I figured she couldn't be much older than 21. How old are you? I'm 25, turning 26 this year, I answered. On Christmas, she said. I was surprised she remembered. It sent a little bit of warmth through my body. Usually, the only person who remembered was my mother's secretary. At most our age gap is four years, which is a pretty common difference. She pressed her lips to one side of her face and looked away from me. I took a sip of my coffee, enjoying the acidic taste on my tongue. Do we have to kiss? She suddenly asked, turning back to me. As it's a common thing for couples to do, yes. Her eyes grew round. Maybe this isn't a good idea. Was she that worried about it? This? Kisses were nothing. I grabbed her hand noting how soft it was, and swiftly pressed a kiss to it. That wasn't so bad was it? I asked with a grin. She seemed to be in shock for a moment, her cheeks coloring slightly. She then wiped her hand off on her apron. I raised an eyebrow. Why did she need to go as far as wiping it off? Many people were dying for a kiss from me. I won't kiss you any more than what's necessary I promised. I wouldn't mind kissing her more though. She was cute and seemed hygienic enough. Mainly around my relatives if we happen across them, you've thought this out very precisely, she muttered. I don't want to marry someone I don't love, I said. Partial truth. I also didn't want to get married period, but might as well go for the romantic facet. Nodding slowly, she pushed my phone back at me. I knew she hadn't read all of it, but I didn't say anything. I don't know what your life is like, but I don't think anyone should be forced to marry someone else. I also need the money, so I'll help you. Perfect. I knew she wouldn't be able to resist for very long. My offer was more than gracious. I could have probably found someone else and paid them way less than what I offered her. But I didn't want anyone else. She was the perfect candidate. I didn't mind spending the extra money. On a condition though, this was unsurprising. There were always conditions. She leaned toward me a bit, a tactic I used to appeal to someone. When all this is said and done you tell everyone I broke up with you, not the other way around, she presented. I caught myself leaning toward her too, but quickly straightened my back. Why? Something about the poor girl breaking the rich man's heart appeals to me, she responded, a playful smile crossing her face. I nodded. I think I can agree to that term, it also would be easier to explain why I was so heartbroken to my mother if she was the one to break up with me. But you have to agree to one of my conditions, what's that? You most definitely cannot fall in love with me, I said, holding her gaze. Her pretty eyes widened slightly at my words but they quickly narrowed. Trust me, that won't be a problem. You're not my type. I should be the one telling you not to fall for me. She flipped her hair over her shoulder on the last word, holding her chin up high. I wasn't her type. I was everyone's type. Why was she getting so arrogant? I found myself folding my arms over my chest. You're not to my standards, she raised an eyebrow and smiled a little. Then good. There won't be any problems. Why did she sound so confident? She didn't find me charming at all. That's a good thing, I told myself. But still, I wanted her to find me a little bit charming. Sign the agreement, I said, pushing the phone back at her. Right at the bottom, is this really necessary she asked but swiped her finger across it anyway. Satisfied, I took my phone back. Only as a precaution. I doubt you'll back out anyway. Believe it or not, I make a pretty good boyfriend. Pretend or not, I'll be the judge of that, she replied. Put my number in your phone and save it. The number on the receipt is my cell phone and that's where I can be reached. 
I want you to send me your work schedule so I can work around it. I also want you to write down your address, bank account number, and your body measurements I listed, trying to remember everything important. She watched me with an apprehensive expression and I paused, waiting for her to comment. I knew she wanted to. Body measurements, she said slowly. So I can find the right size clothing for you, I replied. My eyes scanned over her body. She looked to be five feet and maybe four or five inches tall. Medium build and breasts that were perhaps a bit too ample for her form. I wouldn't be able to estimate her size. She shifted and my eyes snapped right back to her face. I don't want any clothes that are like, made for my exact size if that's what you mean. Clothing from Target is fine, clothing from a chain store. Is that what you wore? Maybe that was why her breasts pushed against her white button up so tightly. You cannot be seen with me in clothing from Target. And if you got your clothing tailored to your custom measurement, your breasts wouldn't be trying to escape your top like they are now. They are a bit larger than normal for your frame, I informed her wisely. Her mouth dropped and her cheeks turned red. She opened and closed her mouth for a moment as if she was at a loss for words. Get out, she finally said. Excuse me, get out, she repeated, her voice rising a few pitches. I winced a little. Why, leave, she interjected, standing up from the table and grabbing me by the collar of my shirt and pulling it. A little dumbfounded, I quickly grabbed my phone and allowed her to pull me out of my seat. Then I remembered how much the shirt I was wearing cost and I made her release it. She then decided to shove on my back, pushing me toward the door. What I asked, turning my head back to look at her. She was glaring at me. Just leave. We're done for today. Sebastian came up to us, looking just as confused as I felt. Henley blew out an angry half of air at me and pointed at the door. Out. Why? I repeated, a hint of indignity in my voice. Sebastian put a hand on my shoulder. Let's take our leave for today, but why? I tried again, but he was already pushing me out the door. It closed behind us with a slam and a tinkle of the bell. Once outside, I smoothed down my shirt, muttering under my breath. No one had ever pushed me around so much in my life. Where did Henley think she got off with the right to do so? What did you say to her? Sebastian asked. I turned to look at him. He thought this was my fault. I didn't say anything bad. I just said that she shouldn't shop at Target and that her breasts were too large for her shirt and it was too tight. He almost immediately burst out into laughter. What I asked. Shaking his head, he placed a hand over his mouth, trying to smother it. What I said again, now irritated. I knew there was a reason you were my best friend, he responded, clapping a hand onto my shoulder. Let's leave for today, still wondering what I did wrong. I walked to my car, the sound Sebastian's laughter following in my wake. Henley, my phone went off for the tenth time in twenty minutes. Annoyed, I pulled it out of my pocket to see the name Bennett Calloway flashing on the screen. Was he some kind of crazy stalker? I'd never met anyone who would call someone every two minutes if they didn't answer right away. Not wanting to give him the satisfaction of me answering it. I decided to just turn off my phone. Then it wouldn't be as distracting. Bennett again, Ariana called from the back room. Doesn't he know I'm at work? I wondered out loud. Like he'd asked, I'd send him my schedule at coffee house for the week. So if he'd got it, why was he trying to call me during the middle of my shift? I couldn't just answer my phone at work. Well, I actually could, but I wouldn't tell him that. Aren't you kind of excited, Ariana said as she returned with an armful of coffee bean bags. He's so handsome, he's cute, but his personality needs some work, I responded, thinking back to the comment about my breasts. Didn't he have any common courtesy? Didn't he know how mortifying that was? I looked down at my shirt, making sure nothing was popping out or straining. How was it my fault that my boobs were too big for my body? or that retailers I could afford didn't make small torso, big boob size. And he didn't need to mention it right off the bat. My cheeks were starting to warm up from just the memory and I shook my head furiously. Ariana watched me curiously. You know, about the boob thing, 
I'm sure he was just trying to give you some advice on it. Just don't talk about it. I cut her off, covering my ears. Ah, I'm so mortified she laughed, shoving the beans under one of the counters. You'll get over it. Plus, I want him to come back and bring that other guy with him. Sebastian. Yeah, Sebastian. I eyed her where Leanne began to grind some decaf coffee beans. Why, he's so cute and so nice. She gushed immediately. The whole time you guys were talking he was over here keeping me company. He's funny too. I didn't know much about Sebastian, but he seemed like an okay guy. Still, I didn't like the thought of him flirting with Ariana. If he was a friend of Bennett, then he could be just as strange as Bennett. Try not to get too involved with him, nodding, she let out a soft sigh. I'm no competition for any rich girls. Anyway, when it came to money, probably not, but if it came to looks, I'd say Ariana had the upper hand. She was a grade-A beauty, even if she didn't realize it herself. But that was part of her charm. At least I'm not crushing on your brother anymore she pointed out. I paused, the grinder coming to a stop. It'd be kind of weird to crush on someone in jail, she laughed, but it faded quickly. But he shouldn't be in there, clearing my throat. I continued grinding the beans. I know, how long does he have left? Uh, about six months, I replied hesitantly. I wasn't too sure. It already felt as though it had been forever since he'd been sentenced. A year didn't seem like much, and it was a light sentence, but it felt like forever to me. Especially since Brandon was the only family I had besides a grandfather in Canada who was too senile to remember either of us. Ariana raised her fist in the air. Just think about all the settlement money you guys will get when he gets proven innocent. Thousands of dollars, I couldn't help but smile at her spirit. That's if he gets proven innocent, the case was a tough one. Even now, I wasn't entirely sure what I believed. Yes, my brother had been drinking. Yes, he had stolen a car before. But I couldn't believe for a moment that he'd stolen a car while under the influence and crashed it. I'd known him my whole life. He wasn't the type of person to do that. But according to the CCTV at the bar, he was the type of person to do that. Worrying my lip, I ran a hand through my hair. It hurt my head to even think about. The shop phone started ringing and I jumped a bit, causing Ariana to snicker, shooting her a dirty look. I walked over to it and picked it up. Pick up C Coffee House, Henley speaking. How may I help you? Why aren't you answering your cell phone? It took me a moment to realize it wasn't a customer calling. It was Bennett. I hung up the phone. Three seconds later it started ringing again. Ariana gave me a questioning look. I debated not answering it, but I was too scared it might actually be a customer to ignore it. Coffee House, Henley speaking, how may I help you? Did you hang up on me? Uh, yes, I said. There was a second of silence. Don't hang up. Do you have two minutes? I warned him. Why aren't you answering your cell phone? I'm at work. So, should have figured he wouldn't see anything wrong with that. He was probably used to people answering his phone calls on the first train. It's pretty busy here so I can't talk long 11 it's not busy. He cut me off, speaking nonchalantly. I know the profit of the company and I know it's not nearly as high as other coffee shops around seeing as how there is a Dunkin Donuts down the street. Poor planning on the owner's side. Wow. Thanks for that very interesting bit of info. You're very welcome, he responded. He actually sounded a little pleased, so I guessed he missed my sarcasm. I leaned against the door frame. Are you going to tell me why you're calling? There was a brief moment of silence again. I have plans for us tonight. Plans? Yes. We'll be going on our first date. Date, I repeated. I'll meet you at your place so I can see your dresses and decide if you will need one or not. Dresses. Are you purposely trying to imitate a parent? I scowled a bit. No. Why do we have to go on a date? That's what couples do. But, I cupped my elbow, staring at the floor tiles. It had been a long time since I'd last been on a date. Or had a boyfriend, period. After Brandon went to jail, I'd had to pick up a second job and I never really had any free time to meet anyone or date anyone. 
Bennett chuckled on the other side of the line. Don't overthink it. Just play your part. It's your job. That's right. It was my job. Why was I getting so nervous? All I had to do was act. I did a bit of drama in high school. It shouldn't be a problem. Okay, meet at your place at 4. I got out of work at 3, which left me about an hour to shower. That's fine. See you then. Oh, wait. You should know that my apartment. I heard a click. Hello. Nothing. Scoffing. I hung up the phone. What a dick. Who was it? Ariana asked when I came back out onto the floor. One guess. Eleven knew. What did he want? I shrugged, feeling a little awkward. To go on a date. Her eyes widened. Really? How exciting. I, I wasn't sure exciting was the correct word. Nerve-wracking was more applicable. Hey. It'll be a free dinner at the very least. Right. Huh. It would be a free dinner. Not too bad. I grinned. Hello for a course meal. After we closed up the shop, I said goodbye to Ariana and hopped into my beat up Buick. My apartment was only a few minutes away and I made it there in record time. I jumped out of my car, making sure to lock it and made my way up the stairs to my apartment, keeping an eye on my surroundings. Last thing I wanted was to get mugged of all $25 in my wallet. Poughkeepsie was a weird place. One second you were in a clean cut, beautiful bustling area and the next you were basically on skid row. I used to live in the better part of Poughkeepsie, near the college, but after Brandon went to jail, I'd had to find a cheaper apartment. I didn't mind too much though. There were scarier places, and I didn't have many neighbors. Unless you counted the homeless people that sometimes squatted in the apartment below me. But they were generally pleasant whenever I came across them. The building I lived in was decrepit, I'd give it that. The paint was nearly non-existent. The stairs sounded like they'd given at any second. There were probably more weeds than grass on the lawn and the windows had bars over them. So may I look at it and think uninhabitable. I look at it and think affordable. I smirked at the memory of me bartering with the landlord. He'd originally wanted $400 a month, but I'd made him settle at $300 with the promise that I'd shovel the driveway myself when it snowed. The inside was a bit better than the outside but that was all thanks to me. There were two apartments in the building. I lived in the upstairs one and the downstairs one was currently unoccupied. When I'd moved in I'd scrubbed down the hallway and the stairs until the wooden floors were almost shining. I didn't touch the downstairs apartment, but I'd given my apartment the same treatment I'd given the hall. I mopped, swept, vacuumed, and bleached everything in sight. It still looked a little rundown, but it was livable and sanitary. I kicked my shoes off by the door and immediately went into the bathroom to shower. The bathroom was a little smaller than I liked, but since I was the only one living here, it wasn't too bad. The hot water and plumbing worked and that was all that mattered. After showering, I went into my bedroom to dry my hair and plan out an outfit. I knew nothing I owned could compete with what Bennett wore, but I had to try and find something. I dug through my closet clad in only my underwear, looking for any of my dresses, checking all the still packed boxes. Then I searched my dresser. Upon finding nothing, I felt dread run through me. None of my dresses were here. I must have got rid of them while I was moving. I groaned, putting my hands on my head. I'd gotten rid of a lot of my clothes when moving to make it easier on myself and because there wasn't really a lot of room in this place. But I didn't think I'd gotten rid of my dresses. Sure, I didn't really have any chances to wear them, but they were still cute. I went back to my closet. There had to be something nice I could wear. Most of my clothing was old and crummy. My cell phone started ringing and I walked over to my bed where I tossed it. The caller ID read Bennett Calloway. Hello, I answered. Did you give me a false address to deceive me? No. Why? I don't think I'm in the right place. Walking over to the one window in my bedroom that looked over the street, I peeked out of it, seeing a sporty black BMW idling in front of my apartment. Yeah, that was definitely him. I'll come outside. I told him and hung up, quickly pulling on a pair of jeans and throwing on the first shirt I came across. The stairs groaned as I descended them in my socks, 
feeling my heartbeat start to increase. I hadn't got to warn Bennett of just how crappy my apartment was. No wonder he thought he was in the wrong place. The squatter was entering the first floor apartment. I gave her a quick wave. Once outside, I hurried over to the B&W, tapping on the tinted window. It rolled down and Bennett appeared, looking apprehensive. This is a prank, right, what is, you live here. I gave an awkward laugh. Er, yeah, it's affordable. I'm almost ready. You can come up and wait if you want. His expression told me that he absolutely did not want to go up. Yeah, actually, stay here. I'll be right back down. Lock your doors. His eyebrows shot up but I turned my back on him and jogged back into my apartment. I hoped jeans and a t-shirt was acceptable for wherever we were going because I didn't really have anything else. I stepped into the bathroom to throw on some light makeup and fix my hair. I pursed my lips at my reflection. No matter how I looked at myself, I couldn't imagine standing next to Bennett. He was so proper and handsome, and I wasn't. Everything about me looked cheap. Even my hair. Sighing, I left the bathroom, trying to spare myself some self-confidence. I slipped into my vans and grabbed my purse, making sure to lock my door before I left. Unsure of when I'd return, I left the hallway light on. I returned to the BMW, walking over to the passenger side and paused. This would be the first time we'd be completely alone. I took a deep breath before sliding in, shutting the door after me. Hi, I said, turning to Bennett. Immediately I knew I was underdressed. He was wearing a navy blue button-up and a black tie with a dark gray vest. I followed his torso down until it met a shiny black belt holding up his dark wash jeans. Well, at least he's wearing jeans. He caught me staring and eyed me for a moment so I redirected my attention to the interior of his car. It was pretty impressive, albeit a little dark. The leather seats were black, the wood trim was black, even the floor mats were black. Do you happen to have a dress in that purse of yours? He asked me. I shook my head. Isn't what I'm wearing okay? He stared at me and I glanced down at my shirt, immediately seeing a hole in it big enough to show part of my bra. Sucking in a breath of surprise, I pulled my shirt up so the extra material would cover it. I figured we'd have to get you something, so I already made an appointment for you, he said, unfazed. An appointment, you'll see, he answered, shifting the car into drive and pulling onto the road. I was impressed at how smooth the movement was. The street wasn't in the best shape, but I didn't feel any of the bumps I was used to. I like your car, I told him. An arrogant smile crossed his face. Thank you. I just traded in my old one for this one, how much was it, I asked before I could help myself. A little over $80,000, my jaw almost dropped. How could he say that so casually? I could buy over five cars for the price of just this one. Don't give me that look, he said, keeping his eyes on the road. This is a very modest car for my family. There are more expensive BMWs. I just happen to like this one. I sunk into my seat a little bit. Must be nice, I grumbled. Bennett gave me a sidelong glance. Is that really your apartment? Yeah. Why? I feel like I could get asbestosis just by looking at it. I thinned my lips. It's affordable. Surely you can afford something better than that. Not really. I'm trying to save up for college. You're not in college. Somehow the question from him sounded way worse than anyone else asking. It made me feel embarrassed. Which pissed me off. Not until September because some of us actually have to work to pay off our education. This was the first year since I graduated high school that I'd actually managed to save up enough money to afford a year's tuition. And that was minus my loans and scholarships. Why doesn't your family help you? Not wanting to sound like the typical Oprah me my parents are dead girl, I kept my mouth shut. I didn't want nor need any pity or sympathy from him. Did you hear me? He asked after a moment. I sighed. It's not really any of your business nor do I want to talk about it. He stayed quiet for a moment. Fine, now it was awkward. But the last thing I wanted to say was hey. 
My mom passed away and my dad left us and my brothers in jail. How's your family? I cringe just thinking about it. Where are we going? Anyway, I figured I should have asked this in the first place. To the city, he said. City. There wasn't really anything city-like in Poughkeepsie. Like Arlington he shook his head. No, New York City, New York City, I repeated incredulously. That's almost two hours away. It'll be a quick drive. The car has Wi-Fi if you'd like to connect your phone to it. I stared at him for a moment, my mouth open. I had to be in the car with him for two hours straight. Was he planning on kidnapping me? Oh God. I shouldn't have been so quick to trust him. I was probably going to be sold into some human trafficking group. No, no, no. He was too important to kidnap someone. He'd probably hire someone else to do it if he really needed to. I was safe from that, at least. I just wasn't safe from an awkward car ride. Also, about the other day, he started, clearing his throat. Sebastian told me to or rather, I also, his voice became quieter. I didn't mean, what? I can't hear you. He gripped his hands on the steering wheel. I didn't mean to offend you the other day, remembering multiple times that he offended me unconsciously. I didn't exactly know which one he was referring to. About what he gave me an impatient look. Don't make me repeat it. I have no idea what you're talking about. Benedict straightened his back. I am sorry for making a comment about your breasts the other day he said quickly, then immediately looked relieved. I groaned. Why did he have to bring that up? While we were stuck in a car for two hours. While I was correct in what I was saying he tried to continue but I cut him off, reaching over and turning on the stereo. Let's listen to some music. Noticing he had Sirius XM, I turned it to the ALT Nation and turned the volume up so loud I wouldn't be able to hear him if he spoke again. It was going to be a long drive. Henley for the first half of the car ride, things went smoothly. The music stayed loud and Bennett kept his mouth shut. Then around the hour mark, he turned the volume down. I'll be parking my car right outside of the city and a driver will be picking us up to chauffeur us the rest of the way, he told me. Why don't we just stop at a station and ride in, he wrinkled his nose. Why would I ride in on dirty public transport when I have a driver who gets paid to drive these streets? While I wasn't the biggest fan of public transport either, I wouldn't have gone that far. The subways and trains were very useful in the crowded city. We'd probably be sitting in traffic longer than it would take to ride into the city. I didn't argue though. I figured my words would fall upon deaf ears. Bennett seemed the type to do whatever he wanted no matter what anyone else said. And I was getting paid to do this, so I didn't have much say anyway. Where are we going? I asked looking down at my beaten up sneakers. Hopefully wherever we were eating didn't have a dress code. I'd fail spectacularly. It's a surprise he responded. So I'm going to guess that what I'm wearing isn't going to cut it. Did you think it would? I closed my eyes for a moment, trying not to feel insulted. I couldn't find any of the dresses I own. Sorry, you don't have anything to apologize for, he said offhandedly. I most likely would have made you change anyway. Breathe, Henley, breathe. Do you have to sound so condescending when you talk to me? I asked, turning in my seat to give him a dirty look. He seemed surprised. Am I being condescending? He didn't even realize it. Oh man, I was dealing with a special kind of arrogance. Just what kind of mindset did this guy have? If I had to deal with this all night, I doubted I'd survive. As promised, Bennett parked his car in a parking garage and had us picked up by a man in a suit driving a more modest looking BMW. Both of us climbed into the back seat and when we were buckled in, the driver took off. The buildings around us got taller and the streets got narrower and I knew we were getting close to the heart of the city. Predictably, we hit traffic. I expected Bennett to complain, but he kept his mouth shut just staring out the window. I turned my attention out my own window, watching the crowds of people on the sidewalks coming in and out of businesses and apartments. Crowds usually bothered me, but they rather suited the city. In an aesthetically pleasing kind of way. Pull over here, Bennett suddenly ordered, startling me. Henley, we're getting out, 
The driver did as instructed and I immediately opened the door, wanting some fresh air. I looked around, not recognizing where we were. All I knew was that it wasn't Times Square. The older I got, the less I went into the city. The air felt stuffy and the temperature was at least 10 degrees higher than it had been in Poughkeepsie. This way, Bennett said and took my hand in his. I stared at our hands, wondering if I should pull mine away. He'd mentioned hand-holding would be part of the contract, though, so I decided not to. We walked down the street a little bit and I followed a few steps behind Bennett so we wouldn't crowd the sidewalk. He was pretty intent on not letting go of my hand. Eventually we came to a store on the corner of Grand Street with wide windows and the lettering Alexander Wong under them. There was a couple coming out of the store. The man wore a suit. The woman wore a tight black dress and the tallest heels I'd ever seen. I can't go in here, I immediately said to Bennett, pulling on his hand. He stopped, turning to me with a frown. Why not? They'll kick me out before I take two steps in. I told him and was afraid that my words might not actually be too far from the truth. They might think I was a homeless person or something. Bennett smiled a little bit. They know you're coming. As I said, I made an appointment for you. I raised an eyebrow, but before I could say anything else, he was already pulling me into the store. As I'd expected, the inside of the store was an incredible sight. Everything was so organized the presentation, the displays, the mannequins. Even the salespeople looked like they were prepositioned. The minute my foot landed on the hardwood floor, all eyes were on me. Then most of the eyes left me, probably deciding I looked too poor to be worth their time. One of the sales ladies made a contact with Bennett and her red lips curved up in a predatory way. M.R. Callaway. Bennett greeted her with a small wave. Diana, it's been a while. This is Henley, the girl I spoke to you about earlier Diana turned her attention back to me, her expression falling the slightest bit. I tried to offer her a smile, but I think it came out as more of a grimace. She looked intimidating. Fit, at least four inches taller than me, and straight hair. She must have been a model when she was younger. I don't want this to take up too much time, so please have her try on what you've selected, Bennett said, pushing me in front of him. I did my best not to let him move me. There was no way I was going with the woman alone. Diana looked a little disdainful, but she motioned for me to follow were her. Yes, well we'll see what we can do about her, I'm eager to see the results. Go along, Henley, I gave Bennett a quick glare before walking toward Diana. He made me sound like a dog or something. As I walked by the displays, I couldn't help but judge them. Half the things they were calling dresses just looked like black curtains wrapped around the mannequins. I peeked at one of the price tags and nearly gasped. It cost more than I could make in three weeks. Diana didn't say one word to me as we walked deeper into the store. I had to admit that despite the horrifying prices and weird designs, the minimalist design of the place really suited it. The floors were open and airy. It didn't feel as claustrophobic as most clothing stores did unless I thought about the many employees just standing around staring me down. It seemed Bennett and I were the only people in the store currently. We went into a back room that I assumed to be a fitting room, but it also felt more private than that. I wondered if it was open to the public. Diana turned around and gave my body a once-over, her lips pursed. Then she pulled out a measuring tape from God knows where and measured me. You have a nice body shape, she commented, her face expressionless. Oh, um, thanks, I responded. I know what style Bennett likes, so I'll go pull out a few dresses for you to try on. I will choose which one suits you the most and then we will find a pair of heels to match it. You may wait in the fitting room and I will bring them to you, she ordered, pointing to one of the stalls along the back edge of the room. I nodded mutely, unsure of how to respond. I didn't have any say in what I was going to wear. Something was a little wrong about that. But then again, judging by the pricing I saw on the displays, I wouldn't be offering to pay Bennett back for it. There was no way. It felt like at least 20 minutes passed before Diana returned to me with three different dresses. I didn't understand why it took so long because the store only looked to have only a few different designs. 
I shimmied out of my clothes and pulled on the first dress and turned to look in the mirror. I almost burst out laughing. Dress was kind of a stretch to call the material I was wearing. It looked like I'd thrown on a black sheet with a hole cut in it for my arms and head. I looked like a block. Still, I showed Diana. Hmm. That looks all right, she commented. I look like I'm wearing a trash bag, I said before I could stop myself. She narrowed her eyes at me like I'd offended her purposely. That's one of Mr. Wang's most popular designs. I wonder how, tasteless, she muttered. Then louder she said, go try on the next one. I rolled my eyes as I went back into the dressing room. I really couldn't understand people with money. I could make a dress that looked just like this for like five bucks. All I needed was some fabric from A.C. Moore. But just because it was a brand name, people would pay several hundred dollars for it. The second dress was almost as bad as the first one. It made my tits look huge. I'm not wearing this one, I announced as I came out of the dressing room. Diana raised an eyebrow at me. What is it this time? I turned to my side and gestured to my chest. The fabric was pulled way too tight against my skin and my boobs looked like small mountains from the side. Not to mention that if I raised one leg too high my ass would surely show. It was so short. I looked ready to work the street corner. Yes, that design is more for ladies with desirable body types, Diana responded, smirking a little. I refrained from saying anything back. It wasn't good to attack other ladies. Even if said other ladies were rude. Every size of body is desirable I said instead and marched back into the fitting room. I prayed for good things about the last dress. If it was awful, I didn't care about the job anymore, I wouldn't wear it. I wasn't going to parade myself around like an idiot in a sheet of black material. Like the first two, the third dress was black. Unlike the first two, this one was a long dress, reaching my ankles. There was a thigh high slit along the side though. Then it wrapped around my chest tightly, like a bust ear. Which was perfect because I didn't want my bra to show through. It also had a satin belt that rested a little higher than my hips. I looked in the mirror and while I wasn't too impressed, I found it acceptable. My boobs didn't look huge and I actually looked a little sexy when I pushed my leg out of the slit. I was very glad I shaved my legs five pages left I sauntered out of the dressing room, feeling more confident. The longer I was in the dress, the more I began to like it. Diana's expression told me she was impressed as well, but she quickly schooled it. Well, I knew that one would suit you, out of the three, this is my choice, that one is the most expensive. Of course, I'm sure Bennett is paying for all of this, she said, looking petty. I shrugged. Personally, I wouldn't waste my money on this crap. She scowled. Let's move on to shoes. I gathered up my old clothes and slipped on my sneakers before following her out of the back room. Bennett was in the main room, chatting to another one of the sales girls. He didn't notice me as we walked by and made our way downstairs. With that gown, you will want to go with a peep toe pump, Diana was saying as we made our way through a section that held only shoes. I have the perfect pair in mind. I nodded dumbly, because I had no idea what that meant. She instructed me to sit down on one of the leather sofas, so I did. After measuring my bare foot she took off to retrieve a pair of heels. I lifted my leg up in the air to watch the fabric of the dress fall back to reveal my skin. I liked how sexy it looked. I'd never owned anything with a slit in it. Try these on. A pair of 4-inch black heels dangled in front of my face. I took them and slipped my feet into them. My toes peeked out from the bottom of them and I understood why they were called peak toe pumps. Diana strapped them for me and then told me to walk around. I pushed myself off the couch and wobbled for a moment, unaccustomed to heels. She gave me a contemptuous look that I ignored. The chunky heels clacked loudly on the floor and I felt a little embarrassed. I couldn't even remember the last time I wore heels. Have you ever walked in heels before she snapped at me as I almost broke my ankle while turning? A couple of times. Where in the world did Bennett find you? She muttered to herself. I knew she wanted me to hear it though. Is that something you should be saying to a customer I asked? You're not the customer. Bennett is. 
I should have expected you'd be like this from what he'd said earlier we had a mini glaring match and eventually I looked away. I didn't care what she thought of me. I didn't care about whatever Bennett had said about me either. I was just doing this for money. I had to put up with it. I heard someone coming down the stairs and I turned to see Bennett. His eyes fell upon me and he stopped mid-step. Suddenly feeling self-conscious, I pulled my legs in tight so that no skin would show through the slit. Mr. Calloway. Diana started. I know she doesn't look her best. I started to make a face but Bennett's voice stopped me. Henley, you look stunning, he complimented, completely talking over her. My eyes snapped to him and I felt my mouth open a little. Had those words really come out of his mouth? Did he mean it? Bennett thought looks good? I wondered if it was the brand name. Fine clothing suits you well, he continued, coming up to me and totally checking me out. Diana watched us with her arms crossed. Feeling a little cheeky, I moved so that the slit would split and reveal my leg. Don't you think too much of my leg is showing, though. Bennett's eyes traveled from my ankle all the way up to the middle of my thigh where the slit ended and he made a non-committal noise. I almost rolled my eyes. Guys were so simple. Clearing his throat, Bennett turned his attention to Diana. We have to leave for her hair appointment. Can you bring us out? Of course. Let's head back upstairs, she answered, giving him a wide smile. I made sure to walk in front of the group knowing that the dress would sculpt my bottom. Flaunt what you got and all that. The total for the dress and heels almost made me want to cry. I'm assuming you're paying, Diana said, directing her question to the richer of us. Bennett put a hand on my shoulder. She would refuse it if I made her pay. Well, duh. Who pays a thousand dollars for a dress and a pair of shoes? Diana smirked a little and I crossed my arms. Was she expecting me to be embarrassed? If I worked here... I'd be embarrassed about the crap they were selling. Bennett had no problem swiping his card for over a grand. I just couldn't comprehend his mind. Even if I suddenly became a millionaire, I would still shop low price to high price. Sale rack first. You know, we could find this dress at Forever 21 for like $700 cheaper, I said to Bennett as Diana took my old clothes and put them in a bag for me. Both of them turned to me, Bennett smiling. Diana shaking her head. You and your chain store clothing, he took the bag with my clothes and said goodbye to Diana as he led me out of the store. Next we are going to a friend of mine to have your hair and makeup done, he told me, looking around for his driver. The wind blew and the dress shifted, revealing my leg. Now that we were out in public and I wasn't trying to show off, I felt self-conscious. I moved so that the slit wouldn't open. Why do I have to do that? What's wrong with my hair now? He glanced over his shoulder at me. It could use improvement. I grit my teeth together. Gee, thanks. There is always room for improvement. Henley, I tugged at my blonde locks. Usually, I try to straighten my hair to make it look more presentable. But during the summer it was usually too hot, so I skipped it. I didn't think it looked that bad though. And as for my makeup, who cared? My skin wasn't that bad in the first place. After finding his driver, we got back into the car. Walking would have made more sense, but I kept my mouth shut because walking in these heels wouldn't be very fun. For the first time I was glad Bennett had a weird thing against the public. My appointment at the salon went more or less like the one at Alexander whatever. We got there, they'd ruled over Bennett, I got weird looks, and they dolled me up. My stylist was pretty pleasant though. She was a cute girl with curly brown hair. She worked on me for what felt like forever, snipping off dead ends and using every kind of spray in existence on me, but after it was all done, I couldn't believe my eyes. It had been a while since I'd put any effort into looking good, so getting it professionally done was something else. I hate to say I barely recognized myself, but it was true. Simply put, I looked amazing. You performed a miracle I said to my stylist. I think she said her name was Carly. She smiled down at me. I'm just bringing out what's already there. See? Always room for improvement, Bennett said from above me. I turned to scowl at him. He just smiled back at me pleasantly. 
I really couldn't tell if he was trying to be an asshole or was just really ignorant. She's just as beautiful as she was when she came in, Carly said, shooting Bennett a dirty look. I decided I like Carly. I'm sorry you have to deal with him, she said to me. He really doesn't know how to interact with people well unless it's business. He's been that way his whole life, he's something else. All right, don't be afraid to tell it to him as it is. He probably doesn't even realize he's being rude, telling off Bennett sounded nice, but I was also trying to just deal with it. I wasn't a very confrontational person. You're all set to go, she told me, taking the smock off of me. I stood up and gently prodded at my hair. She curled it better than I could even dream of doing to myself. Thank you, I said as I followed her back to the front of the store where the register was. Bennett kept staring at me, but I pretended not to notice. You're very welcome. It'll be $150 for the hair and makeup, $150 for hair and makeup. That was crazy. Or maybe it was average. I didn't ever go to a salon. Begrudgingly, I pulled out my wallet to pay, but Bennett stopped me. I'll pay, he said. I was tempted to let him, but I still had the 10 grand he tipped me. No, I'll pay, 11 I'll pay. No need for you to spend unnecessary money. You should keep it, he interjected, pushing my hand down and pulling out his card. Carly raised an eyebrow but took the card and swiped it. I turned my gaze to the floor, unable to respond. He was partially right. I'd rather save the money he'd given me, but it was the way he'd said it that irritated me. I got it I was poor. There wasn't a need to remind me every five seconds. Have a great night, Carly called to us as we exited the salon. And Bennett, please try and act a little bit more like a proper gentleman. Bennett glanced back at her in confusion and then to me. What? I'm being a gentleman, aren't I? I scoffed and turned it into a cough. Aren't I? He repeated, sounding more unsure this time. I didn't answer. Best to let him wallow in that for the moment, Henley. Bennett kept staring at me as we made our way down the street, trying to hunt down his driver. I tried not to feel self-conscious, but it was hard not to. I wasn't used to being so decked out. And it also kind of irritated me that he hadn't stared at me before I'd gotten all dolled up. But even I could begrudgingly admit that I'd gone from a solid 6 to a 10 with my new makeover. Why don't we just take the subway I suggested, turning back to frown at him and catching him ugling me again. He coughed a bit and placed a hand over his eyes to shade them from the sun as he looked around for his driver. Were you aware that about 15% of the air you breathe in on the subway is actually skin particles? And not just from exposed skin. From the whole body, how in the world do you know that? I like to read, he answered. It was in a study of the Metro back in 2008. He didn't seem like the type of person to read. But it kind of explained how he knew such random facts. Isn't there human matter in all air? Especially in New York City. Yes, but not as bad as on the subway. Not to mention the grimy seats. I just spent a grand on that dress and you want to tarnish it already? I scowled at him. But my attempt at looking menacing was foiled by my ankle giving out from under me as my heel landed on a crack in the sidewalk. Just as I was losing balance, Bennett wrapped an arm around my waist and pulled me against his body to keep me upright. Henley, what did I just say? Embarrassed, I pushed myself away from him and stood up straight, trying not to think of just how firm his chest was. Sorry, I'm not used to heels, I mumbled. That's unsurprising, he said. I turned up to glare at him and he stared back at me for a moment, an amused smile on his face. Knowing it would be useless to say anything, I did the other most mature thing. I crossed my arms. Should we hold hands? He suggested. I gave him a wary look. Uh, why? So you don't fall again? Rolling my eyes, I started down the sidewalk, this time taking extra care not to slip. He easily kept up with me and from the corner of my eye, I saw him smiling a bit. We finally found the driver and I gratefully slid into the air-conditioned B&W. Where are we going next? I asked as the car pulled back into the taxi-filled streets. My stomach rumbled a little and I placed a hand over it, hoping to keep it quiet. 
We are going to go eat, he told me, crossing his leg and letting his ankle rest on his other leg's knee. I was about to mimic his gesture before I realized I was wearing a dress and could not do so. Smoothing down the fabric, I crossed my legs at the ankle. What kind of place is it? Bennett smirked a bit. You'll see. We moved slowly through the crowded streets and about 20 minutes later we pulled up to a sleek, multi-story building that could almost rival the Trump Tower. The polished panels reflected the streets and lights below, including the waterfall that I switched my gaze to that stood in front of what I assumed to be the entrance. The fountain was a little over 10 feet tall and was lit up by colored lights. Above the gigantic front doors was the word Callaway in giant, bold lettering. Are we eating at your hotel? I asked, shocked. The car came to a stop and then it turned to me, giving me a short nod. We are. Don't worry though. My mother isn't here. This will be your first time at one of our flagship hotels, correct? I felt my heart thudding in my chest and I tried to calm it. Why was I so nervous? It was just a hotel. Anyone could rent a hotel room here. You didn't have to be rich and there wasn't a dress code to do so. I wouldn't stick out. But this was Bennett's hotel. He actually owned the place. Why would we go here of all places on our first date? Was he not trying to ease into this? Would I be thrown in the spotlight already? Henley, I pulled myself out of my thoughts. Oh, oh, sorry. What did you say? Yeah, this is my first time here. I've stayed at the Express before, though. The Express doesn't have our restaurant. There may be a few of our business partners here and I will have to introduce you to them to make our relationship seem more believable. Go along with what I say and there shouldn't be a problem. I'll try to answer any questions that might arise so you won't embarrass us. Hopefully, we can just be seen and not be spoken to. I was going to start keeping track of the time between his oblivious insults and set records. Are you going to tell me what to order, too? I said snidely. Once again, he seemed to miss my sarcasm, because he tilted his head to the side a little and gave me a confused look. You can't do so yourself, sighing, I reached for my door handle. Forget it, wait, Bennett demanded, unbuckling his seatbelt. I'll get your door for you, I wanted to say I was fine but figured I should let him do his thing. I guess it was the polite thing to do. He probably wanted to look as chivalrous as he could. My door opened a moment later and he offered his hand out to me. I gripped it and he easily pulled me out of the car and wrapped an arm around my waist. Let me know if I make you uncomfortable he murmured into my ear, his hand squeezing my hip. I felt shivers go down my spine and I took a small breath. His hand was by no means uncomfortable. Pushing me forward lightly, we made our way up to the glass doors of the entrance. A few men in suits lingered around the entrance, chatting and taking drags from cigarettes. Even from where I was I could see the no smoking signs posted. The smoke wafted in the air and I coughed a little. I heard Bennett laugh under his breath as we walked up to the group. They stood directly in our way and didn't move when we approached them. Bennett cleared his throat. Excuse me, gentlemen. This is a no smoking area, only one of the men turned to us, his face annoyed. Upon seeing Bennett, his expression turned to horror and he quickly threw down his cigarette and ground it into the pavement. M.R. Calloway, I'm so sorry, he bent down to retrieve the butt and bowed his head. The other three men looked over and quickly caught on, taking the cigarettes from their mouths and spitting out apologies. I was a little impressed. Bennett had these guys walking on glass with just one glance. I didn't see what was so intimidating about Bennett but after inspecting the men I realized they were all wearing name tags. We didn't know you were stopping by, the first guy spoke, his eyes wide. While your mother is out of town, we implemented the no smoking rule to keep our guests with respiration problems safe. It's not a suggestion, it's a rule. I expect my employees to follow the rules of the establishment at the very least, Bennett said, speaking with a tone of authority. We are sorry, Another guy spoke up. I looked up at Bennett and almost didn't recognize him. His stern expression made him look older in a way. Was this how he was with all his employees? Was he about to fire these guys? 
I know our customers are stressful, but if you need a cigarette that badly please use the employee courtyard and not stand in front of the entrance. Use your heads. His words were harsh, but his expression finally softened. I'm assuming you four are on your break. Please continue it in the courtyard. If I catch you doing this again, I won't just warn you. The men nodded and quickly disappeared into the building and we followed in after them, the door being held open by another hotel attendant who greeted Bennett by name. Those guys are lucky I caught them and not my mother, Bennett said as we strolled through the lobby. I only half focused on his words, too distracted by the interior design of the hotel. It was beautiful. Everything was sleek and modern. The floors were made out of white marble, with some patterns made with brown tiles mixed in. The walls were a deep brown with white trimming and the ceiling was high. They seemed to have fearful respect of you, I said. Serious Bennett was kind of hot. I wagered most of the female employees fawned over him. That's how all good boss-employee relationships work. I thought of my boss at Coffee House and could have disagreed, but I didn't. He wasn't like most bosses. Anyway, we were more like good buddies. Most places were more professional. Let's head to the elevator, Bennett said and guided me to the far back corner of the lobby. You don't have to announce that you're here or anything. It wouldn't have surprised me if he did. He probably loved everyone knowing who he was and hanging all over him. I'm not here for work today, he answered with a smile. I'm here on a date. Kind of a cheesy answer, but I started to smile back at him before quickly looking away. It wasn't even a real date. I couldn't get too carried away. Where's the restaurant? It? Upstairs. It's on the roof top the roof. I repeated. That was like 20 stories up. Bennett laughed at my reaction. It's not all the way at the top. We have a couple of spots where there are rooftop patios. The middle one holds the restaurant dome. All right, what a world this must be to you. I gave him a dirty look. It's just a hotel. His smile faded and I stepped away from him a bit. The record so far was three minutes. The ride up in the elevator was tense. I wondered if I had offended Bennett with my comment, but I didn't really care. He offended me almost every time he opened his mouth. When the elevator dinged signaling our arrival on the 10th floor, he moved closer to me again, placing his hand on my waist. I'm counting on you, he said. I hooked my arm through his in response. As much as I'd like to do something embarrassing to him on purpose, I would it. This was my job. I would do my utmost to act as a perfect girlfriend. The elevator opened and we walked down a dimly lit hall, my heels clicking on the hardwood floors. I tried to walk lighter, but the sound was still deafening in my ears. I swallowed nervously as we passed a pair of stumbling women who were giggling loudly. They had been it and whispered to each other. I tightened my grasp on him. We pushed through a set of glass doors and stepped outside and suddenly my ears were blasted with the sound of laughter and music. A gust of warm air brushed my bare skin and my mouth fell a little. The lights from the city twinkled all around us only blocked by one side of the hotel towering above us. There were pillars put up sporadically with little lantern lights hanging from them, emitting a soft glow. It was beautiful. The sun was setting now and I could only imagine what the view would be like when it was completely dark. Wooden tables were set up on the floor, many of them right along the edge of the roof to give the customers the best view. On the side where the wall of the hotel stood was a brightly lit bar with well-dressed men and women mingling in front of it, drinks in their hands. Wow, I breathed. Come on, I reserved us the best table, he said, pushing on my back a little. I almost stumbled forward but managed to catch myself. I couldn't embarrass myself now, although with the dim setting I doubted anyone would notice. Still, I had to be careful. As we passed the bar, the bartender called out to Bennett and a couple of other people turned their heads. I straightened my back, preparing myself for human interaction. Who's the foxy lady? The bartender asked cheekily, raising his eyebrows at me. He bared his white teeth at me with a wide grin, contrasting against his golden complexion. His black hair was styled high. He was very attractive. This is my girlfriend, Henley, Bennett said not even with slight hesitation. He must be a good liar. Henley, 
This is our bartender Eugene. You're Bennett's girlfriend Eugene repeated, his eyebrows going up even further, if possible. I smiled bashfully, avoiding his gaze. Why yeah, smooth, Henley. Smooth. Wow, he said. Wow, wow, wow. Never thought this day would come. How did you guys meet? The bar? Through a business partner. Don't tell me a book club then it cleared his throat, looking a little uncomfortable. Eugene. Eugene laughed and then spread his arms. All right, all right. I'll stop. What would you like to drink, Miss Henley? It's on me since you have to put up with this guy all night, a drink. Oh, wine is fine, I answered immediately. Alcohol would definitely help me get through the night and wine was the classiest thing I could think of. Bring her our best bottle, Bennett ordered. I want her to try something she's never dreamed of drinking before Eugene nodded while I tried not to let the smile slip off my face. Yes, alcohol was a very good idea. Mr. Calloway, what in the world are you doing here? A new voice spoke up. Bennett and I turned to see a balding man in a business suit beaming at us. I'm on a date, Bennett informed the man. He chuckled. Ah, it must be nice to be young. I wasn't aware you were dating anyone. Your mother hasn't mentioned anything. It's new. Don't let him bully you. Okay, the man said to me. I faked to laugh and tightened my grasp on Bennett. It was already too late for that. Henley, this is one of the managers of our hotel, Mr. Salen, Bennett said and I got the hint to offer him my hand. Pleased to meet you, I said. I'm Henley, a cute name for a cute girl, Mr. Salen responded grasping my hand firmly. Treat her good, Bennett Bennett chuckled and nodded. I plan to. Suddenly a new person appeared beside Bennett, eyes wide and amazed. Mr. Calloway. It's so good to see you, Robert, Bennett greeted him. How are you? I'm great, thanks for asking. Did you happen to have time to take a peek at the blueprints I emailed you? I've got some ideas. Ah, I'm not here on business right now. Bennett cut him off, smiling suavely. My apologies. I would chat but it would be rude to my guest, he gestured to me. Robert finally seemed to notice me. I hadn't realized how unremarkable I was until then. Oh. I'm sorry for bothering you too, it's fine, I said quickly. Feel free to talk she's hungry so I'm going to feed her before she bites my head off, Bennett interjected, giving me a stern look. I shut my mouth and managed not to glare at him. What was I? A dog. Did he not want to talk with this guy? Let's go have a seat, Henley. Before anyone else stops me, he then led me away from the bar and to the other side of the restaurant and up a few steps to a few tables that sat above the rest. No one was seated in this section except for a man at a table in the far corner that sat along the ledge. As we drew closer to him, I realized it was Bennett's friend Sebastian. Henley, it's good to see you, Sebastian greeted as we approached the table. He stood up and held out a hand to me. I placed my hand in his, a little surprised to see him. He looked just as good as Bennett, a fresh press suit on his body. Hi again, do you remember my name? He asked, eyes crinkling at the edges. Crab, I responded, grinning at him. He laughed. Apparently so, Bennett pulled out a chair, letting the legs scrape along the floor. I turned toward him at the loud noise and he gestured for me to sit, his face straight. I did so, making sure the skirt of my dress didn't right up. Sebastian sat back down after I did and then Bennett took a seat opposite of him and next to me. What are you doing here? I asked Sebastian. I thought Bennett and I were on a date. Bennett was scared of being alone with you so he made me tag along. That's not it at all, Bennett snapped, leaning back in his seat a little. I thought you would feel more comfortable if it wasn't just the two of us. I wondered why he thought inviting a third person who was also a stranger to me would make it any less awkward. But Sebastian did have this calming roar around him. I already felt more comfortable. Is it cheesy to say that you look beautiful, Sebastian said, smiling at me a little. I touched my hair and grinned back at him. Maybe a bit. Of course, she's beautiful. Would you expect anything less from those whom I employ? 
Bennett said haughtily and thank God a waiter appeared with our wine just then. Sassashaya read, Mom, he asked, the words foreign to my ears. I took a glass and let him fill it out, immediately taking a sip when he pulled away. The taste of it made my face scrunch up and Sebastian laughed as he raised his own glass to his lips. Not fond of wine, no, I admitted, thinking about putting down and never touching it again for the rest of the night. Maybe this is too refined for her taste, Bennett commented. That plan went out the window. I needed to get drunk. Fast? Bracing myself, I brought the glass back to my lips and took a huge gulp. How much does this wine cost? I figured Bennett would say over a thousand. Two hundred fifty dollars, he said instead. I looked at him. What? Really our hotel has to be affordable to lower classes, he told me, swirling the wine in his glass. Anyone can stay here so we need to make our prices a little affordable. Many of our guests view this as a once in a blue moon visit and will spend a little extra money on dinner and drinks, but if we raise it too high they won't come back, it made sense, but still. I wouldn't spend that much on a bottle of wine, then it patted my thigh, making me jump. Wouldn't, or couldn't. Ignoring him, I downed the rest of my wine. Sebastian grinned and eagerly filled it. Our waiter then brought over menus, but both Bennett and Sebastian already knew what they wanted. Feeling a little pressured, I pointed to the first thing that had chicken in the name. After he left I copied the other two men and placed my napkin on my lap. You must be really serious about fooling your mother, Sebastian started, leaning back in his seat. Your own restaurant for the first date, best way to get the word out there. Someone will mention this to my mother. Why don't you just tell her you're dating someone, because then she'll ask to meet the girl right away," Bennett replied, suddenly looking weary. If she met Henley now, she'd know immediately that Henley isn't to her standards. I narrowed my eyes at him. What's that supposed to mean? You're poor and have no college education, he told me. Just by your clothing, she'd know that. Sebastian grimaced a little and I forced a smile while gripping my wine glass tightly. Oh. Silly me. I should have known my poor would show through. The plan would fall through before I could even have the chance to claim that I was in love. That's why she absolutely could not meet Henley before that. We'll have to fabricate some sort of backstory for you. I looked past Bennett and at the bright lights of the city. How in the world was I going to pretend to be someone I wasn't? I wasn't particularly good at lying. I'd have to just stay silent most of the time or I could just pretend I was mute. That would work too. I could leave all the talking to Bennett. You're not in college, Sebastian said, directing the question to me. Sheepishly, I shrugged. I hated the way people said that. Teach their own. Some people were meant for school, some weren't. Oh, I haven't started yet, but I'm taking some classes in September. It'll be my first year since it's the first year I can afford it. He frowned. I see. Do you have any siblings? I nodded. My brother, where is he? I felt my throat close up and I almost choked. Bennett's eyes widened and he made a move to help me, but I managed to catch my breath. I'm fine. Oh, sorry. I don't really want to talk about him. That makes two of you. This time Bennett was the one to tense up. I looked at him to see him glaring at Sebastian. Don't start. Sorry, sorry, you have a brother, I asked Bennett. I didn't know anything about his family. I didn't even know anything about him. His jaw was clenched so hard I could see his muscles. And as much as I wanted to pry, I knew what it was like to not want to be prodded about something. Even though I was curious, was it an elder brother? A younger? Ah, let's change the topic, I said quickly. Anyone watch any good TV shows? Both Sebastian and Bennett blinked at me. Well, Bennett said slowly after a moment. I guess you would have the time to watch TV. I ignored him and gulped my wine, deciding not to try and start a conversation. The two men veered the conversation into business dealings and I zoned out, drinking my wine absent-mindedly. This didn't really feel like a date. Did it look that way to other people? Was someone really going to care enough and spread a rumor? 
I suddenly felt kind of stupid sitting there in an expensive dress sipping wine I'd never buy. Is this what Bennett thought of me all the time? I couldn't blame him. I wasn't like him or Sebastian. I'd rank the wine faster. As the sun went down, I got a little tipsy, and by the time we finished eating and it was pitch black out, I was pretty drunk. It didn't help that Bennett kept pointing out the proper way to eat chicken. Why was there even a proper way to eat chicken? I didn't understand. Henley, are you ready to go? Bennett asked. Nodding, I tried to push myself up and stumbled a bit. Maybe I was drunker than I thought. Maybe you should drink some water before we leave, Sebastian advised, standing from his seat as well. I waved him off. I'm fine. My head whirled and I closed my eyes for a second. Henley, please keep yourself together until we were out of the public eye, Bennett muttered to me, grabbing my wrist. I tried to yank myself out of his grasp. Well don't embarrass me, now, had I been sober, I would have just taken this hit like I'd been taking hits all night from him. But because I was drunk and I was a bit irrational and a bit braver when I was drunk, I didn't let this one slide. Screw. You, Bennett's mouth dropped open a little. What I yanked my hand to the side, escaping his grasp on me. I'm so sick of you talking down on me. All night. Ever since I met you. I'm doing you a favor. You realize that. I'm paying you, he retorted. I stepped backward, my ankle almost giving out. I reached around wildly to help balance myself and Sebastian appeared by my side to help me. I latched onto him. Paying me? Right, I'm your employee. Do you treat all your employees like this? I get it. I'm poor. You get all of your amusement from making fun of other people, I continued. Henley, stop. No. I was going to let out what I'd been holding in since I met him. I held up my pointer finger and walked toward him. Screw. You, with each word, I jammed my finger into his chest. All day I've been listening to your insults. Why should I bother listening to you? You're just a knockoff of Paris Hilton, but more arrogant Sebastian snorted, but quickly recomposed himself. Bennett took a deep breath and crossed his arms and I think he finally got a little mad. Henley, you're making a fool out of yourself, I laughed. After everything I said, that was his response. I'm done, good, he responded. I'll have my driver pick us up out front. I shook my head. No. I'm done with you. I'm not going with you and you can have your money back. Find someone else to pretend to date your luxurious ass, because I'm out. With as much dignity as I could muster, I turned on my heel and strutted down the steps of the platform we were on. I kept myself focused, determined not to fall and ruin my dramatic exit. Henley, I heard Sebastian call after me. Wait, I didn't stop and I didn't turn around as I stepped out of the cool air and back into the dimly lit hallway of the hotel. As the door was closing, I made sure to flip my hair in hopes that Bennett saw. Be sure to check the webcomic out on top is. Bennett. Bennett, what are you waiting for? I stared at the door Henley had just exited through, my mouth hanging a bit. For the first time in a while, I was left speechless. Not only from the insult in her words, but also from her fierceness. No one had ever spoken to me like that. Not even my best friend. And the hair flip. Was it necessary? Bennett Sebastian repeated, a hard edge in his voice. Turning to him, I cleared my throat and sat up in my seat a little straighter. W what? His eyebrows lifted a little but he quickly schooled his featured into a disapproving look. Why are you just sitting there? Go after her, go after her. Why would I do that? You heard what she just said to me. Have you even been listening to yourself all night? He interjected. Seriously, Ben. I knew you were ignorant but I didn't know it was this bad. I tried to think back and remember what I said. None of it seemed outrageously offensive to me. Maybe I could have worded a few things better, but I didn't mean to sound cruel. I was just being honest. How is it my issue if she gets offended by the truth? Sebastian let out a small sigh. Bennett, I know you're not used to being around people like Henley and I know you take pride in your honesty, but you need to think more before you speak, around her at the least. 
Yes, she is poor, but she's working hard and I'm sure that she doesn't like that fact to be rubbed in her face. Especially by people like us. Every time you opened your mouth tonight you mentioned it. She's a kind girl and you've been an asshole to her all night, whether or not you realized it. Go apologize to her. Seeing as Sebastian never swore, it made me think maybe I had been a little too rude to her. But if she hadn't cared about my words the last couple times we were together, why did she care now? Or maybe it was that she'd managed to keep it to herself and she thought I was rude all along. Maybe the alcohol influenced her decision to finally snap. I stared down at her empty plate. A few choice comments of mine to her floated around my head and I felt the unfamiliar feeling of guilt. I didn't like it. Sebastian started to stand up and I looked at him. What are you doing? There's an attractive drunk girl in a dress and heels she's not used to wobbling around New York right now with no way home. Where do you think I'm going? Throwing my napkin off me. I stood as well. I'll go find her. I'm coming with you. He insisted. I found myself starting to say no before I realized it. He gave me a funny look and I avoided his gaze. Why did it matter if Sebastian came or not? It wasn't like I wanted to be alone with Henley. If she disliked me this much already, I didn't want to impose on her anymore. I'd been right in inviting Sebastian along tonight. Maybe he could help calm her down. Even if I suddenly wanted to be able to do that by myself. But even I knew I lacked the skill and compassion to do so easily. I couldn't even remember the last time a girl was mad at me. I didn't usually talk to them long enough for that to happen. Let's go, I said, tossing down some bills to cover the check. She couldn't have gotten far. She's like Bambi in those heels. While I'm at it, you should seriously reconsider what you think a date means, Sebastian said as we passed by the other patrons. Eugene waved at us and I gave him a quick wave back. His words surprised me. Most of the other women I'd brought up like this had thoroughly enjoyed it. What do you mean, forcing your taste of clothing on her? Inviting your best friend? I know you two are only pretending to date, but she's still a girl and you should at least treat her right. The other women I've dated you didn't date those girls, Bennett. You spent one night with the man moved on. This is different. He cut me off, grinning a bit. You've got a lot to learn about the dating world. Especially since it's Henley. She's not like anyone you've ever met. I flattened my lips, choosing not to respond. Why did Sebastian think Henley was so special? Why was he on her side so quickly? Was he attracted to her? Was it because she was so different than me? Anyone with eyes could see she was attractive, but there were many attractive women. Sebastian and I met them on the daily. But not many attractive women who would speak like that to you. I tried to quiet the voice in my head even though it was right. I had to admire her courage. There was no trace of Henley in the building as we hurried down the stairs and stepped into the street. The temperature had dropped considerably since we'd entered the city and I momentarily wished I'd bought her a jacket. Even if the city stayed warm at night due to the constant bustle, eventually it would cool down. And when we returned to pick up see it would be quite a bit cooler. We should split up, Sebastian suggested as he looked both ways down the street. Right. I agreed, rolling my sleeves up to my elbows. I'll head this way. Call me if you find her, same to you, Sebastian replied and quickly hurried away in the opposite direction. I set off at a quick pace, taking a look at my watch. It was almost midnight. I passed another restaurant that had a group of drunken men in front of it and a feeling of unease washed over me. Henley was so tiny. She'd be easy to overcome. Would she be able to fight off someone if they tried to abduct her? I pulled out my phone and found her contact and pressed the call button. She didn't answer and I called her again. Nothing. I was caught between being annoyed and worried. Was she not answering on purpose? Or was she unable to answer because she was in danger? I ran a hand through my hair, pausing to peer into the CVS on the corner of the street. It was empty. Maybe she'd already called a cab. Would she be able to afford a cab all the way back? I pulled out my phone again and decided that even if she didn't want to answer my calls, she would at least read my text message. Don't spend money on a cab. You can't afford the whole drive home. 
Where are you? Call me. From the corner of my eye I caught the glimpse of a long black dress and I jerked my head around, only to see a young woman with short, cropped hair and said dress. Not Henley. I sighed, putting a hand over the crick in my neck my sudden action had just caused. It would be pointless to walk around the city to try and find her, especially because she could have already left or ducked into another restaurant or bar. I started back toward my hotel. Why was I going through the trouble and wasting my time? She'd left on her own. She was an adult woman, who was only five foot three and could easily be hoisted over the shoulder. Who was also wearing a dress that would be easy access to whatever scum who might come across her. And judging from what happened between her and Curtis at Michelangelo's, I pulled out my phone again and jammed my finger on the call button. It rang twice and then I caught the sound of a standard ringtone. When my call went to voicemail, the ringing stopped. I hit call again and it started. My eyes shot to the ground and I saw a phone screen lighting up a little bit up the sidewalk. I quickly grabbed it and saw my own name flashing on the screen. It was Henley's phone. My heart skipped a beat and I found myself frozen. Henley couldn't have gotten into trouble in this short span of time. That was impossible. But why was her phone on the ground and her nowhere to be seen? Hey, a sharp, very high and very familiar voice cried. I clenched the phone in my hand and turned. That was definitely Henley's voice. And she was close. I looked around how had I missed her walking by. The group of businessmen were still standing on the sidewalk as I passed them again and I slowed my pace, listening hard for her voice again. Don't touch me, I'm fine. I stopped that in my tracks. Her voice had come from the middle of the group. We are just trying to help, one of the men said. He was bald and I couldn't see his face because his back was to me. He bent down and as he straightened up Henley appeared in front of him, her hair disheveled. Let go, she demanded again, her voice as small as her. What did they think they were doing? My jaw clenched and I stepped forward. Excuse me, Henley's wide eyes shot to me. The guy holding her arm also turned to me and I stood my ground keeping my lips pressed and my eyebrows narrowed. I noticed he was wearing a name tag. Kevin see what he said. I pointed to Henley. She's mine, the bald guy Kevin. I had to remember his name. Opened his mouth to say something, but Henley beat him to it. Wait, what? What am I? Your property now. Her attitude caught me off guard. Didn't she see that I was rescuing her? Deciding it was best to ignore her and not argue back, I stepped closer to the bald man. Let her go. Don't let me go. That one's out to get me. Henley said quickly. My mouth fell open. She was making me into the bad guy. I wasn't the one who had her surrounded. Don't listen to her Kevin pushed Henley behind him. She stumbled to the side, her face twisting in pain. Ow. I moved forward. Acting out or not. I wouldn't let this guy hurt her. I'm not a patient person. Let her go. Who are you? He shot back at me, making sure to stay between Henley and myself. I'm her boyfriend and I'll call the cops if you don't let go of her. I warned him, trying to keep my voice even. He was larger than me in every way and I knew I couldn't take him in a fight if it came down to that. She doesn't seem to think you know her, he responded, squaring his shoulders. Henley smirked at me from behind him. For a split second I thought about walking away, but knew I couldn't. She was drunk and upset with me and apparently that made her immature a good combination for reasoning her actions. However annoying they were. You be on your way, we'll take care of this young lady, Kevin said in a sugar sweet voice which immediately pissed me off. Can I see your name tag? I asked. Why I stepped closer to him, peering at it. Ah. Do you work at this restaurant? What's your position? Manager. Certainly nothing higher, judging by your attire. The four other men who had been watching silently all became stony-faced. What are you getting at? Kevin demanded. Just needed to double-check your position and name for when I go to your boss. I'm sure he'll be interested in his employee harassing a woman, I said casually, tucking my hands into my pockets. What I couldn't do with my hands, I could do with my words. Kevin scoffed. Who do you think you are? Good friend of his. 
I searched my memory. The restaurant name rang a bell in my head. They tried to become part of our hotel. What was the owner's name? Daniel. Right. He's not a very patient person either. His face paling was my answer and he lost his defensive stance. I'm not doing anything wrong. I smirked a little. If you aren't, why are you getting so nervous? I'll ask you once more. Hand her over and leave. Kevin hesitated for one moment before reaching behind him and grabbing Henley. He shoved her toward me and she gasped and tripped and I moved forward to catch her before she could fall. I looked up to snap at the asshole because that was not how you treated a woman but he was already walking away, swearing under his breath. Let me go, Henley muttered but made no move to pull away from my chest as I set her on her feet again. I pinned you as the clumsy type and I guess I was right, I said, a frown settling on my face. She winced as she stood on her own. Ow, did they hurt you? I asked, the sudden rush of anger coming over me. No. I tripped and twisted my ankle, she complained, shifting all her weight onto her right side. Then she started hobbling away from me. Where are you going, away from you? Leave me alone. I'm still mad, I easily kept up with her. How did that work for you last time? You got caught by a bunch of perverts, they weren't perverts, she told me. I tripped in front of the man they helped me up and you took things the wrong way. I stopped. What you were pretty intimidating though, I'll give you that, I felt a muscle twitch in my jaw. So I would just made a fool of myself. I found your cell phone on the ground though, I dropped it when I fell. Obviously I grabbed her arm, forcing her to stop and pulled her back to me. Stop walking away from me when I'm talking to you, she gave me a snotty look and shook her arm back and forth until I let go. I don't feel like talking to you right now. Stop ordering me to do stuff. I'm not yours, I admit my comment was out of line. You're no one's possession. But Sebastian and I have been looking for you, I said and then remembered I needed to text him and let him know I found her. Henley started walking away again as I did so. Henley. I won't let you walk around alone while you're inebriated have Sebastian come find me then. I'll go with him, she said. He at least treats me like a human, I tense. You're my date. Not anymore. I'll refund your money. Don't worry. I know you're very concerned about that. You're coming with me. I told her and reached for her again. She moved away from my hand and finally turned to face me again. Her eyebrows raised. Do you manhandle every girl? You're so annoying. You're like a fly. I pursed my lips together. What? Are you going to say something about me being poor again? Go ahead. It's not like I haven't been dealing with it since I met you, she taunted me. I'm not going to, I snapped at her. Unlikely I won't, I said. I understand that I've offended you. I suppose I could have been kinder with my words, she snorted. You suppose? I didn't realize the truth would offend you so much. The truth isn't what pissed me off, she told me, putting her hands on her hips. I know I don't have a lot of money. That's nothing new. Believe it or not. I'm okay with it. I'm only 21. We don't all get handed hotels from birth. That comment irked me. But I knew she wasn't finished so I let her continue. I deserve this at the very least. It's the way you were saying it. Like you're looking down on me for being poor. Like you're a better person than me. Like that's the only thing about me that's interesting. Like I can't do or be anything else besides poor. I'm more than my income. Aren't I technically your employee? Do you treat all your employees like this? I need some respect for this to work, dude. I watched her as she spoke. Her cheeks were flushed and her eyes were narrowed, shining under the light of the restaurant. She shook a little and I wondered if it was from the cold or from speaking to me like that. Was she scared of me? Or just not used to speaking up for herself? When she didn't speak again, I cleared my throat shifting on my feet. I understand, do you? She challenged. I admit I can be a little ignorant as Sebastian has pointed out many times. I usually speak before I think. Hearing you, I know I've misspoken multiple times, and, and I shouldn't speak to you or about you the way I have been. You're correct. You are more than your income. You're also an employee of mine. 
The respect should be mutual. I continued and I could feel my palms becoming sweaty. Why was she staring at me so hard? It took a lot to make me uncomfortable but she was having no trouble. Do you understand you hurt my feelings? She asked. I nodded, feeling much like a child being scolded. So, she hedged. I'm sorry, I said, lowering my head. I apologize for offending you and hurting your feelings. Fine, I straightened back out, looking at her a bit startled. Fine? That was all I got. After I apologized to her and admitted my mistakes, she stared back at me, a bored expression on her face. What? You want to be forgiven that would be nice, I responded. Wasn't that a given? It was the reason I'd apologized in the first place. Well, you'll have to earn that, she said. Earn it, I echoed. She should be happy I even apologized. I rarely did. She nodded. I can't forgive you for being a dick to me just because you said you're sorry. Who knows you won't go back to making the same comments as soon as we get into your car, I pulled at the tie around my neck. What else do you want me to do? Figure it out, she retorted. And while you're at it, refigure your idea of a date. Fake or not, this sucked. I felt like I was intruding on you and Sebastian. I invited Sebastian so you'd feel more comfortable, I told her. Because being around two strange men is better than being around one. I'm going to give you a second chance, Bennett, she said, hobbling toward me. She stopped right in front of me and jammed a finger into my chest. Mainly because I need the money you're offering. But keep this up and find yourself a new girl. I held up my hands defensively. Okay, I understand. It's never my intention to hurt someone's feelings. I'll be more aware, she squinted at me a bit bringing her face closer to mine. I held my ground, resisting the urge to pull away. All right, she began, I believe you. Don't test me though. I can't always get back at you, was she trying to threaten me? Her. I began to smile. It was kind of cute. Little Henley trying to be threatening all the while reminding me of a lion cub trying to roar for the first time. Don't smile with your stupid handsome face, she mumbled. You think I'm handsome, don't you own a lawyer? Let's go home. I might be sick, she said, backing away from me. I eyed her warily as she winced while testing out her heel. She bent down and began prodding at it. I did my best not to look at the sudden expanse of skin she was showing me. She seemed to notice my gaze and stuck her leg out a little more. If anything, Henley was definitely interesting. I admired her audacity. Just then a man walking by Wolf whistled at Henley's bent over form and I whipped around to glare at him while Henley straightened, a blush crossing her face. Let's go, I said. No one needed to be checking her out but me. I grabbed her hand and pulled her back towards my hotel. Ow, ow, hold on. My ankle, pausing, I debated for a moment. I really didn't want to stand here and wait for the cab, but I didn't want to hurt Henley by forcing her to walk. I could carry her, but that was below me. Ow, she complained, wrinkling her face. I sighed and squatted down. Get on, what I motioned for her to get on my back. Get on before I change my mind. Yeah, I'll pass, Henley, don't feel me up. She warned and I felt her climb onto my back and wrap her arms around my neck. I pushed myself up with surprising ease. I knew she was a small girl but I hadn't expected her to be so light. Her thighs were warm on my forearms and I tried really hard not to think about them. She struggled for a moment to rearrange her dress so it wouldn't write up. I could feel her heart beating frantically against my back. I let out a small breath and hoped she couldn't feel mine beating just as hard. Henley's POV. Oh, I groaned, pressing on my temple and trying to ease the pounding of my headache. I really hadn't thought it through when I decided to get drunk the night before. Not to mention the fact that I hadn't even gotten home until 2 in the morning and then had to wake up at 8 to get ready for my 9 to 5 shift. All in all, I felt like crap. Ariana smirked at me from the other side of the store, where she was currently wiping down tables. I'd volunteered to do it initially, but the smell of bleach made me want to puke. I glanced at my phone, expecting to see a missed call from Bennett but there was nothing. Had I scared him away last night? 
He definitely deserved my attitude, but I wondered if I was too harsh. I snorted. I wasn't even going to entertain that thought for a moment. He totally deserved it. Hopefully, he'd learn something from it. Admittedly, I was still a little worried. What if he didn't want to use me as his pretend girlfriend anymore? That was a lot of money to give up just for a little dignity. Any texts from Rich Ben? Ariana asked, leaning over the counter to look at my phone. Surprisingly, no, disappointed. Not really, I said, opening the cash register and straightening out the money. There wasn't much to do today at work. It was rainy and dismal outside and no customers were coming in. I figured they were beelining for the Duncans down the street with the drive through Ariana nodded a few times even though there was nothing to agree to. When do you go back to work at Michelangelo's? I paused, losing count of the ones in my hand. I hadn't even thought about going back to Michelangelo's. Thinking about it, my suspension was almost over. Did I even want to go back? With the money Bennett gave me, I really didn't have to. But if things didn't work out, I'd be screwed. Coffee House didn't pay me enough to support myself, let alone any college bills that may come in the fall. I have a couple more days. Thinking about going back makes me want to cry though, but your tips are so good. Ten grand good, she added with a grin. I laughed. Not everyone is as special as Benetton. I wonder if he has a brother. Oh, actually, Sebastian, that guy he was with the other day, said that Bennett had a brother. Ariana's brown eyes lit up. Oh yeah, I may be in luck after all. I shoved the money back in the register and closed the dryer. If he's anything like Bennett, you probably don't want to go for it. I'm up for a challenge, was her response. It's about time for me to get over your brother. Anyway, I tensed at the mention of my brother. Yeah, Ariana gave me a sympathetic look. He'll be out soon. Henley. He's made it this long so I'm sure these six months will fly by. Are you still mad at him? I was never mad at him. I told her, putting my arms into my apron and leaning against the counter. I'll be happy when he's out. Less stress off me if he can even find a job. Jail doesn't look too good on a resume. He's so stupid. That's if he even did it. She pointed out. If you guys can somehow prove he didn't, doesn't matter since he still went to jail for it. I cut her off. Maybe he did do it. I don't know. He does like to drink. I was tired of having that argument with myself. Did Brandon do it? Or did he not do it? Was he innocent? Or had he actually stolen the car and put multiple lives in danger? Either way, it made my head hurt. And either way, He'd been gone for the last half year and I'd been left by myself. Ariana placed her hands on her hips. When he gets out he's going to want to fight this. He's going to need a new lawyer first, I said. His current lawyer didn't seem to be on our side at all. Maybe Bennett knows someone who can help. You should ask him, Bennett probably did know someone who could help us out, but I didn't think I wanted to ask him for help. What was I supposed to say? Please help my brother, who may be guilty, out of the crime we're not sure he committed. It didn't sound too good. Don't bring it up to Bennett, please. Don't even mention Brandon's name. And while I'm at it, don't tell him I mentioned him having a brother. It kind of seemed like he didn't want to talk about it, I told her, thinking back. His expression had mimicked my own when someone asked me about my brother. That kind of stopped talking now look. Ariana tapped her chin. I won't say anything. But do you think it's like all those TV shows where the brothers have to fight for the family business? Because that would be pretty intense. I hadn't thought about that. It would definitely make sense. Especially if there was only to be one CEO of the hotel. A family torn up by money. It would explain why Bennett was so dramatic. Huh. Maybe. Then maybe the other brother will meet you and fall in love with you and they'll be fighting over you and the right to the hotel. I grinned and shook my head. Okay, Ariana, leave your crazy ideas to your books. She rubbed her hands together, grinning evilly. A writer does need to get her inspiration from somewhere. Just then my phone vibrated and Ariana let out an aha and snapped her fingers. I flipped her off and picked my phone up from off the counter and looked at it. 
Bennett Calloway flashed on my screen. I'm sensing a trend here, I said as answered it. You picked up. He sounded surprised. That's what you're supposed to do when your phone rings, I retorted, even though I usually ignored the phone call and texted the person instead. But Bennett deserved my sarcasm. You're at work though, he pointed out. If you knew that then why did you call? How are you feeling? Oh, um, I'm fine. His question threw me off guard and suddenly I felt like a jerk. Here I was being bitchy while he was actually being considerate for once. How are you? I left some aspirin in the bag with your clothing, did you see it? I figured you'd have a headache this morning, he'd left me aspirin? That was surprisingly sweet. I'd been in such a rush to get to bed I hadn't even emptied out that bag though. I missed it. Did you go out to bite it? You didn't have to. It was my choice to drink and I'll deal with the consequences. I carry it around with me, he told me and I imagined him shrugging. I get headaches often. Oh. Well still. Thank you, I said awkwardly. He sounded weird today. Meek, almost. Maybe I had been a little too rude to him. I couldn't remember my exact words, so I wasn't sure. But it was definitely weird to have Bennett acting this way. Creepy, almost. Listen, Bennett, about last night, it's okay, he said immediately. I've been, for lack of better words, an asshole. Don't apologize because you haven't been doing anything wrong. It was me, just what exactly had I said the night before. Whatever it was, it worked. I was impressed. Okay, can we move past this? I want this to work and not be awkward between us. I will do my best not to let a repeat happen. Yeah, sure, get past me being completely plastered in front of him. No problem. Gladly. There was a moment of silence after that. I was beginning to think this was a habit of his. Ariana stared at me hard, obviously listening to our conversation. I shooed her away. Ah, that's right. Last night when I was leaving your apartment, I noticed that your lock on the front door was going. He started again. My heart skipped a beat. Had he entered my apartment? I didn't remember that. You went into my place, I asked, trying to sound casual. No, I just walked you to your door. I'm talking about the main entrance. You should call your landlord to have it fixed. The area you live in is unsettling I relaxed a little bit. It wasn't like I was embarrassed about my apartment okay maybe a little, but in Bennett's eyes, it would probably look like trash. I definitely didn't want him entering it or making any comments about its state. I think she changed her number. Your landlord. Yeah, she doesn't really act like one. Hence the squatter living below me, Bennett hummed. Maybe I can contact her. No thank you, I said quickly. I had the feeling Bennett contacting my landlord would most likely end up with me being kicked out. I don't mind, anyway. The squatter isn't bothering me, sweater aside, shouldn't your landlord be making sure the upkeep of the apartment is good? It wouldn't be a problem for me to contact her, it's my problem and my place so I'll fix it myself, I told him. Ariana raised her eyebrows and mouthed the bitch at me. He sighed. Why are you like that? Like what why do you refuse my help? Most people would gladly accept it, I shrugged and then realized he couldn't see me. I've been on my own for a while so I'm used to doing things for myself and by myself. It's better than relying on other people for everything. Sorry if I sound rude. You sound lonely, I really wanted to say what do you know, but I refrained from it. He probably didn't know. He was rich. He had a family. It was better just to steer the direction of the conversation away from myself. The less he knew the better. The last thing I wanted was any more pity from him. Is there any other reason you're calling? Ariana shook her head at me and I raised an eyebrow in a questioning way. You're so rude, she whispered. Her comment distracted me and I only caught the end of Bennett's next sentence. I figured it would be the fastest way. I will come to pick you up and drop you off, of course. He finished. For what? Sorry, Ariana was talking, despite not thinking I was being rude. I lightened my tone to sound more polite. I said that you should come to my house because no one mentioned seeing us last night to my mother, his house. 
Oh man, I did not want to see what type of mansion he lived in. He probably had security at the front gate. But it was part of my job so it wasn't like I could say no to him. Especially after last night. Maybe he lived more modestly and I wouldn't feel too out of place. Or, even better, maybe he had a jacuzzi. A jacuzzi would be worth it. I'll come over. But if you want your mom to know so bad why don't you just tell her? Because she won't believe me if I tell her I have a girlfriend right now. And even if she did, she'd want to meet you and then she'd know something was up immediately. As I've said, he explained then he sucked in her quick breath of air. That wasn't meant to be condescending. I nodded my head appreciatively. So, he was taking my words to heart. Good. It doesn't really make sense to me. But sure, I know what I'm doing doesn't make very much sense to you. But I know what I'm doing. We have to put off meeting my mom until she genuinely thinks I'm interested in you and that's when we'll go and meet her. And going over to your house helps this how. I don't let people over to my house. He told me. Aside from Sebastian. If I have you over, she will definitely think something is serious between us. That sounded sketchy. Why doesn't anyone go to your house? That's, he trailed off, leaving the sentence unfinished. I wondered if it was something private I shouldn't have asked about. Well, actually I feel that way about my house too. So, I guess I should feel honored to be allowed to visit your mansion house. I mean, I will see you at 6 then, I'll drive there. What's the address? I'll pick you up. He responded. I pursed my lips. I was a capable person. Why? I can drive there. Don't waste your gas. Your car will give away your social status. I narrowed my eyes but couldn't say anything. He was right my car was pretty darn beat up, but I still couldn't help feeling a bit insulted. No offense, he added after a moment. He was learning, albeit slowly. Fine, I agreed in a mumble. See you then, he said and promptly hung up. I shoved my phone back into my pocket and scowled. Dude sucks at goodbyes. Ariana patted my shoulder. Sounds rough. So what did he want? A hot hookup. I'm going over to his house. I guess. Her eyes grew wide. Wait, it is a hookup. I was just joking. No, I said, waving my hand. He's weird. I don't really know. I feel like he's afraid of his mom or something. But isn't he kind of old for that? I wonder what kind of person she is. I wondered if I should be afraid of the kind of person she is. Anyone who looked down on the lesser fortunate couldn't really receive any respect from me and judging by Bennett, his mom couldn't be too different about it. She was probably worse. You think he has a jacuzzi? Ariana asked. I broke out of my reverie and grinned. I knew there was a reason for Ariana being my best friend aside from the fact I didn't have any other friends. I guess we'll find out, back at home and after showering, I was once again facing the dilemma that all my clothing was old and baggy. I debated wearing the dress I'd worn last night but didn't want to wear dirty clothing. Which left me with a pair of jeans and a long sleeve shirt, my usual attire. I didn't think it mattered this time since I was just going to his house it wasn't like I was meeting anyone. Hopefully. The minute I saw a car pull down my street I rushed out of my apartment and locked it behind me. As I hurried down the stairs I looked at the apartment below me and was surprised to see a couple of sweaters hanging out instead of the usual woman. A couple of them stared at me and a couple waved and I waved back a little awkwardly. One squatter was fine but five. Our landlord was going to notice eventually. And I wasn't sure how comfortable I felt with all the locks in this place being shoddy. Shaking my head, I exited the main door. I'd figure that out later. I headed over to Bennett's black BMW and slipped into the passenger side. Hi, I greeted him. I noticed that once again he was dressed in dark jeans and a button-up. Must be his favorite type of outfit. He turned to me, frowning. Aren't you afraid of what diseases? I resisted the urge to roll my eyes. I've been living here for a while and I'm okay so I'm sure I'll be fine, Then it seemed disturbed. If you say so, where do you live? I need an address to give Ariana in case you decide to kidnap and rob me, cute, he said and pulled into the street. I live close by, close by. 
What was his idea of close by? Because he seemed to think NYC was also close by. Hopefully, I wouldn't be in the car with him for a long period of time again. Don't get offended, Bennett started and I braced myself. But do you not have a sense of style or can you just not afford one? I shrugged. He got me there. My clothing sucked. Even I knew that. A little of both. But in my defense my sense of style is expensive if I give you extra money would you consider it charity most likely? I wouldn't accept it. He nodded. I figured you wouldn't. Even though you're working for me so I'm just paying you for services. I cringed. Can you not say it like that? You make me sound like a prostitute. Being paid to date you is bad enough. If it's benefiting both of us, I don't see the problem. If you don't like the business comparison I could compare it to a father giving his child money. Please don't. I interjected. I did not want that picture in my head. I can buy some stuff with the money you already gave me. Don't worry. I won't buy it from Target either. Maybe I'd check out New York and Company or Express. I usually like their clothing but I couldn't afford it. To Bennett, they were probably like Target, though. But whatever. He didn't have to know where I bought it from as long as it looked good. My mom will most likely call if she sees us on the camera entering my house. So don't enter right away. I waited for him to elaborate, and when he didn't, I turned toward him and furrowed my eyebrows. Okay and that's not supposed to sound weird. Why is she watching the cameras at your house? Is it your house or her house? It's my house, he said, sounding a little offended. I paid for it myself. She can get into the security, why is she invading your privacy like that? She's done it my whole life. That's why I need you. She controls so much of my life I don't want her to control my love life too. I nodded because that was understandable. You know you have to sign something to get legally married, right? Just don't sign it. Bennett's lips curved up a little as if he found what I said funny. She has ways of making me do what she wants. Right now, it's taking away my house and my car. You said that your house and your car is yours. She can't take them. If she does, call the cops and report to robbery out. You haven't met my mom. He responded, letting out a dry chuckle. She can and will do whatever she wants. She still owns the hotel. I could be cut off and kicked ya and then you'd have to do what everyone else has to do and work their way into a good position in the world. I retorted. Bennett's face fell flat and I grimaced inwardly. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. He shook his head. No worries. I say many things I shouldn't to you as well. We'll both try our best. I just can't comprehend it. I told him. How old are you again? 30. I'm 25. He muttered. I don't even look close to 30. I shrugged and he narrowed his eyes. Still. You're a young adult. She shouldn't be interfering, that's what I'm saying. You're scared shitless of her, aren't you? Either that or of becoming penniless. Actually, I'm going to go for both. Bennett glanced at me, his expression a little taken aback. Are you still getting back at me from last night? I smiled a little. No, I'm just being blunt this time. Well, I'm not afraid of becoming poor. I've been working since I was 15 and I know how to save and invest money. I raised my eyebrows in disbelief. You've worked at the hotel since you were 15. He nodded. My mother made me do odd jobs to learn the hotel better. Although to this day I don't understand how washing dishes could make me a better CEO understanding the workers, I guessed. It was weird to imagine Bennett doing menial jobs like washing dishes. I figured he just graduated college and got whatever position he wanted. But maybe I was just as bad as assumptions as he was. Bennett made a non-committal noise and pulled down a side street that led to a small cul-de-sac surrounded by trees. I turned my attention out the window and thought it was odd that there weren't any houses on the street until my eyes fell across the house at the furthest edge of the cul-de-sac. I immediately knew it was Bennett's house. He seemed the type to want to be the only house on the street. Amazingly though, it wasn't some gigantic mansion. It wasn't small by any means and it definitely looked like someone who had money owned it, but it actually did seem modest. Most of the house stood two stories tall with the exception of one side that was only one story, 
with dark brown paneling complemented by a deep jade gable roof. With the surrounding woods, it gave off a picturesque feel. The one thing I'd had that I was expecting was an iron gate surrounding the property. Bennett hit a button on the roof of his car and the gates opened allowing us entrance. He drove down his driveway that was lined with cute little shrubs and then came to a stop right in front of the house and shut off the engine. Unpretentious, isn't it? He commented. If you overlook the fact that a 25-year-old bought this, then yes, I answered. The house was beautiful, but I couldn't say much until I saw the inside. He could still have a gold bathtub. Built, actually, he said and opened his door. Stay seated, I'll get your door for you, Mom. My eyes widened. What? You built it? I asked as soon as he pulled open my door. I allowed him to help me out of the car. I figured he was putting on the show for his nap by myself. I hired contractors, of course. But the design is my own. Wait until you see the inside, he responded, sounding proud of himself and a little excited. The whole back wall of the side split is glass and overlooks the lake. Ah, I knew there had to be something else. A lake. That probably upped the property price by 10% alone. Do you have a boat? I asked. He looked at me like I was crazy. Of course. Come here and pretend to look at these flowers. I rolled up my sleeves and followed him to a few bushes of roses and other flowers I couldn't recognize. A few droplets of rain fell on my face and I wiped them off. It's starting to rain again. When can we go inside? Just a few more moments. I have a feeling she checks in periodically that's creepy. Inside the house too. No. No cameras inside. Just outside. But she can pull up all of our surveillance on her phone, he told me. I can too, but I don't like how she has access to my house security. Doesn't she have other things to do? Today it will benefit me though. Sorry for making you stand outside in the rain. It's fine as long as it doesn't start downpouring. Are you the only one who lives here? I asked, touching the soft petals of one of the roses. Yes, he answered, but it sounded stiff. Let's go inside now, after unlocking the door, he gestured for me to go first. I did and my mouth opened a little in awe. The first thing I noticed was the high ceilings and I realized that the second story I could see from the driveway wasn't even another floor it was just the ceilings. Currently, I was standing on the first level and there was a cut out in the middle of the room and you could see the floor below which meant the house was on an incline and technically this was the second level. A wide, metal, twisting staircase led down to the floor below where a vast living room was set up. As Bennett had said, the wall that bordered the lake was made completely of glass. From where I was standing, I could partially see the water rippling in the rain. I like the airy feel of high ceilings, Bennett said as he gently pushed me further inside the house so he could close the door. I also always wanted a place where you could see the floor below from the floor above. The bedrooms, as well as the bathroom, are on this floor if you follow the hall down. How many rooms does this house have? I asked, looking at the polished wooden floors. I figured they weren't the usual oak because the color was a little off rooms. That staircase there leads to the living room, which is the biggest room. There's also a second bathroom and the kitchen on the floor below us. So that makes six I nodded, trying to take in the place. We were standing on what seemed to be a wraparound balcony. There was a place to hang coats and what I assumed to be a small closet. Then you could walk down the hall to the other rooms while looking down at the living room. It was pretty awesome. Do you want to see my bedroom Bennett asked with a sly smirk. Not necessary I answered as I started toward the staircase. I wanted to go to the glass wall and look at the lake. Hey. Take your shoes off. I paused, looking down at my shoes. Oops. I removed my shoes and brought them back over and he placed them on a shoe rack. I couldn't help but smile at his organization. He also removed his shoes and then escorted me back to the stairs. Your place is awesome. I told him as I scurried down the stairs in my socks. I nearly slipped because they were so smooth. I peeked behind me to see Bennett smiling to himself and I found myself smiling too. He was pretty cute when he was proud. I'm glad you like it. I don't get to show it off to people often, 
he told me. The living room was furnished beautifully. It seemed the house had a theme of being open. It almost resembled the forest around it. The floor was made of white tile and the furnishings were all in neutral colors, but instead of it feeling empty as I thought it would, it felt very warm and cozy. There were multiple plants scattered around the room, some bigger than me. Your TV is so big. I cried as I walked over to where it was posted on the wall connecting to the glass. It was almost as tall as me. Do you have surround sound? He nodded. Can you watch Netflix on it? He nodded again. Sweet. There were definitely enough seats around it to watch the television. He had a fancy looking leather sofa as well as a few love seats scattered around. There was a small section of couches around a coffee table that looked set up for business meetings. I noticed every game system known to man tucked away in the TV stand. Moving on, I could see he had a dartboard and lots of art on the walls and that the living room doubled as the dining room with the dining table settled along the glass wall. Wow, I breathed as I walked up to it. Even in the dreary weather, the view was incredible. The forest broke at the edge of the lake, revealing the huge body of water. There was a dock floating by the shore and a couple of kayaks propped up by the trees. You really designed this place. That's really amazing. I'm impressed, I can tell, Bennett said, coming to stand beside me. He grinned. You're cute when you're excited I felt myself blush before I could stop it. Did he have to smile so handsomely while saying that? Shut up, but thank you. I don't show off my place to many so I appreciate the compliment he continued, getting more serious. Why don't you invite people over? I'd be showing it off to everyone, this is the only place I have left, he said, gazing out at the lake, his jaw tightening. He stayed quiet for a moment and I stayed silent beside him. Something told me not to push it. He suddenly cleared his throat and looked at me nervously. I'll go make some coffee, I wanted to tell him that I'd just come from working eight hours at a coffee shop and coffee was the last thing I wanted, but as with many things I wanted to say to him. I didn't. Sounds good. The master bathroom on the floor above us has a jacuzzi tub if you want to check that out. I clenched my fist and let out a silent cheer. An inside jacuzzi was just as good as an outside one. I had to see how deep it was. Don't mind if I do. I hurried back up the steps and opened the door at the end of the hallway. It definitely wasn't the bathroom and it was definitely Bennett's bedroom. A huge ass four poster bed was centered along the furthest wall, with a giant glass window behind it letting in light. I itched to jump on the bed, it was huge, like two king sizes together huge, but I refrained. I couldn't be lying on some strange guy's bed in his house. There was a laptop on his bed and a desk in the corner of his room. A TV was screwed to the wall in front of the bed and a huge bookcase lined the wall next to me. The wall opposite of his bed was completely made out of mirrors, with black imprints of trees over it. Next to that, he had a huge wardrobe and then a smaller dresser. As with the downstairs, he had few plants in his room. His room wasn't what I was expecting at all. It was kind of mysterious and dark. There was a door by the desk in the corner and I went over to it wondering if it led to the bathroom. It didn't. It led to a huge walk-in closet. My mouth dropped at the sheer amount of suits and button-ups this dude had. There was a display with a bunch of watches and cufflinks and so many ties I didn't even want to begin counting them. Did he really need the dressers and this closet for all his clothing? I'm so jealous, I huffed, walking out the closet and out of the room, pausing to shut the door behind me. I didn't want him to find me in there. I moved on to the next door and pushed it open to find the bathroom. I was more curious about the last room, so I closed it for the moment and headed to the last door. As soon as I opened it the smell of mothballs met my nose and I wrinkled it. Was it a storage area? The shades were down and they blacked out the room entirely. I searched for the light switch along the wall and before I could find it, a hand gripped my shoulder and yanked me out of the room. I let out a surprised yelp, nearly losing my balance. The door slammed shut as soon as I was out and I looked up at Bennett in surprise. Don't go in there, he said, his voice hard. I blinked at him. S sorry, his expression didn't lighten and his words were tense. I didn't tell you. 
It was my fault. Please don't go in there again. I won't. I'm sorry, Benita took him a second but he managed to school his features. He rubbed his forehead. I didn't mean to pull you so hard. It's just that no one is allowed in that room, it's not your room. Does someone else stay here? I asked cautiously. Not anymore, Bennett murmured, eyes on the ground. Forget about it. Just don't go in there. All right, got it. Sorry again, Bennett stared at me for a moment and then forcibly smiled. The bathroom is right here, he said. He opened the bathroom door again and any thoughts of his strange attitude were momentarily lost when I caught sight of his jacuzzi tub. It was big enough to swim in. It's like a pool. It's so deep, if you're lucky, I'll let you take a bath with me, Bennett said with a wink, lightheartedness returning to his voice. He seemed much more at ease now that we were away from the other room. I shot him a dirty look. Nice try, why not? We're dating, aren't we? You're a pig, I said, shoving him in the shoulder. Although to be honest, I considered it for one teensy moment because I really wanted to use it. Het let out a quiet chuckle. I'm kidding. Feel free to come back and use it whenever you'd like. I wouldn't suggest using it during the day because there's no air conditioning in the bathroom and it will get hot, but at night it's nice. Do you plan on having me over again? I thought you said you don't like people here. I responded. I figured today was a special case. Especially since I'd obviously invaded his privacy that he wanted to keep to himself. If it's you, I don't think I'll mind. He answered, shoving his hands into his pocket. You can feel free to come over whenever you want. This is the most lively my house has been in a long time. I think I like it. I suddenly felt a little shy. Oh, um, thanks. Don't tell Sebastian I told you that though, Bennett added. Why not? A forlorn look came to Bennett's eyes. I'd never hear the end of it. A ringing noise met my ears and Bennett's hand shot to his pocket. After looking at the screen he grinned triumphantly. It's my mom. My heart skipped a beat. His plan had worked it quickly. That was crazy. Hi mother, Bennett greeted as he swiped to answer the call. Oh, you saw. He gave me a thumbs up. Yes, she's a girl I'm seeing. Her name is Henley. I stood silently, wondering what his mother was saying. Judging by Bennett's expression, she was saying exactly what he wanted her to say. You'll eventually meet her, he said, leaning against the sink. I know. Yeah. No, you can't talk to her. No mom. You'll scare her off. He was silent for a moment. Don't even joke about that, he cried and I jumped. Stop trying to take away my car for every little thing, he snapped. I rolled my eyes. Of course. Mom, I'm making her dinner. I have to go. Goodbye. With that, he hit the end call and stuck his chin up. Perfect. That's all you wanted, I asked him. A phone call. Really, it's the start we need, he told me. You coming over is the best sign of seriousness we can give. The fact that she called proves it. I still didn't understand but I didn't think I ever would. So I just nodded. Well, I'm happy it worked out. Does this mean I can go home now? He shook his head. No, she'll probably be all over the cameras to see when you leave. You don't mind staying a while, do you? I'll make you dinner. It's my job so you can make me stay as late as you want. I told him, exiting the bathroom. I was pretty hungry, so dinner sounded like a good idea. You wouldn't want to stay if you didn't have to. I didn't mean, do you feel pressure to do as I say? He asked, moving around me so that he was in front of me. He frowned deeply. Henley, you don't have to do something I ask of you if really don't want to. I know you don't think too highly of me, but please don't think that badly of me. I cupped my elbow and dropped my gaze. The seriousness of the look he was giving me made me uncomfortable. I didn't mean it like that. I just think it's better if we don't get too close. That way this is easier. How does it make it easier? We'll just continue to be delicate around each other. Then we'll always be uncomfortable. Shouldn't we be friends at the very least? We might as well have some fun with this. Our gazes met again and I swallowed nervously. You sure you want a friend as poor as me? 
My sad attempt at humor worked and his solemn expression broke into an eye roll. It's an experience I'd like to have at least once. Hey! He smirked at me. Just kidding. I watched him warily. He wanted to be friends? Maybe it wouldn't be so bad after all. When Bennett was alone he seemed like a completely different person. I could see myself being friends with him in his relaxed state. It was worth a try. Alright, just don't embarrass me, he said. I pressed my lips together. Something told me it was going to be a very trying friendship. Bennett, my fingers twitched at my side as I watched Henley examine every inch of my house. As much as I loved watching her expressions of awe, I felt nervous. The initial high of having someone over had worn off and I felt antsy. It had been a long time since I'd let someone over. Even longer since I had a woman over. I didn't know why I was so nervous. She seemed perfectly at ease. Shouldn't she be the one feeling anxious? Especially after the incident with my brother's room. I left the door unlocked so it was really my fault. But my rash actions didn't seem to have bothered her at all. The woman in question pressed her face against the glass while that overlooked the lake and I wanted to tell her not to smudge it but managed to keep my mouth shut. She moved into the kitchen, trailing a hand across the marble countertops and stopping by the spice rack to inspect the contents. I stayed rooted to the spot, unsure whether to go after her or not. It kind of annoyed me that I felt uncomfortable in my own house, but I had expected it when I decided to let her over. No one had been in here for a long time. I wasn't even sure why I thought I'd let her over. Yes. It was the easiest way to trick my mom into thinking we were serious, but there were other ways too. Wow. You have one of those refrigerators that dispense crushed ice, she commented excitedly. I quirked an eyebrow. Out of everything in my place, she was most impressed by that. You don't have one of those, she shook her head and moved on, leaving the kitchen area and returning back to the main part of the living room. I stood above her on the elevated portion. Are you really going to cook me dinner? She asked, looking at me expectantly. Her sudden stare surprised me a little and I felt my body tense up. Do you not want me to? Don't you have cooks for that? I frowned. There are some things I do for myself, you know. I wouldn't have guessed, she responded. There was a teasing smile on her face, so I knew not to be offended. In my free time, I like to cook. I find it relaxing I told her and I didn't know why I was trying to explain myself. You must have a lot of free time. I mean, you've been stealing all my free time this whole week pretty much. Aren't you the CEO of your hotel? Don't you have to work? I'd been stealing her free time. What did she mean by that? Wasn't I paying her for this? And that aside, did she dislike spending time with me that badly? I'm not the CEO yet. I muttered and didn't like how meek my voice sounded. You're not. Is your mom the CEO? Your dad? You're just full of questions today, I said, shoving my hands into my jean pockets. She shrugged and pushed her long hair behind her ears. I liked the way it framed her face like that. You said we should be friends, right? So we should start with the basics. Like family what about your family I countered. Ah. She trailed off, suddenly looking anywhere but at me. My family is kind of messed up. I'm not sure you want to hear it, the corners of my lips twitched. For her to be living alone so young, I figured something was amiss. Hmm. That's funny, because I was about to say the same thing. She looked back up and raised an eyebrow. Oh yeah. Should we bet on whose family is more whacked? Bet. I repeated, shocked. Did she want to make a game of it? A hand shot to her mouth to cover the laughter that spilled from her lips. I'm just kidding. Don't look so taken aback, I cleared my throat, feeling slightly embarrassed. Of course, I do have a kind of personal question. So if I can ask you it, you can ask me one, she continued, walking a little closer to me. My eyes focused on a rip in her jeans just above the knee. Had she bought them like that? Or were they just old? You could see a bit of the skin on her thigh and, um, Bennett I shot my gaze back to her face and realized she was only about a foot away now. Yes, I said automatically. Okay, why don't you let people into your house? 
What did you mean that it was your only place left? I can tell you're uncomfortable right now. If it makes you that uncomfortable for me to be here, I can leave. I don't want to be interfering, she said and shifted on her feet a little. I held in a lie that jumped to the tip of my tongue. It was an automatic response lie and move on. You shouldn't let anyone know too much. They could use it against you. That's how I usually felt. But I didn't want to lie to Henley. I was wrong when I thought she was at ease. She was just better at hiding it than me. Henley, I'm really sorry for my earlier actions. I started. It's not that you're making me uncomfortable. I'm just not used to anyone being here. My home is very personal. That's why I don't let people in here. When you're in a certain position like I am, it's better to keep your life private. If people find out the wrong thing, they can use it against you, she nodded as I spoke. It felt awkward explaining it to her. It seemed like such a foolish reason. I took a slow breath. And the room you tried to enter is another reason why I don't want anyone over. That's actually my... Ah. You don't have to tell me that, she interrupted, holding up her hands. I mean I am really curious about it, but that's completely your business. She turned a little pink and her eyes darted back to upstairs. I had a gross feeling about her thoughts and snapped my fingers to get her attention. It's not something from Fifty Shades of Grey you pervert. She turned a little darker and laughed a little. Haha, I wasn't thinking that. I am slightly offended you think I would have a room like that. You kind of fit the role. Are you purposely insulting me? I accused. She bit her lip to keep from grinning too widely and I found myself focusing on it much more than I'd like to admit. I hadn't noticed how perfectly her lips suited her face. She was so small and cute. If it's not something like that, could it be that you're actually a mass murderer and... No, I snapped, cutting her off. It's my older brother's room. She snapped her mouth shut, her eyes widening. Oh, I forgot you had a brother. I pressed my lips together grimacing inwardly. I didn't want to talk about this. I'd been caught off guard and had let it slip. I don't like to talk about him, I said tensely. We don't have to talk about him. I feel that same way about my brother, she replied easily. I stayed silent because no one ever let the subject of my brother go without me snapping. However, a few moments of silence passed and Henley stayed quiet. Then something clicked. You have a brother. Is that the one personal question you're asking me? I hesitated and then nodded. I was a bit curious about her family life, but I'd be a hypocrite if I wanted to pry too deeply. Yep, I do. He's older than me but he acts much younger than me. And he acts really dumb, but he's actually really smart, she said, scrunching up her forehead. Thinking about it now, he's actually kind of annoying, he doesn't live with you. Usually he does. Why doesn't he now? Why doesn't your brother live with you? She countered. I paused. Touché, if I tell you, don't give me any pitying looks and or any words of sympathy. She warned me, giving me what appeared to be the stink eye, but just kind of looked like something was wrong in her eye and she was trying to get it out. I kept that comment to myself. I won't, I promised her because I knew that feeling all too well myself. He's been in jail. She said in a tone of voice someone might comment about the weather in. I stared at her, wondering if I'd misheard her. Her brother was in jail. He was a criminal. Wasn't that a little too intense to say so casually? Why didn't she seem more upset? Don't tell me your brother is a mass murderer. No, she cried. So you've been living alone because your brother went to jail? I asked, jokes aside. She nodded. What for? It's nothing horrible, she informed me. He'll be out soon. She didn't want to tell me why he was in jail. I was intrigued, but I knew not to push. Can I ask about your parents, eh? You might as well know what you're getting into if we're going to be friends, she sighed. Long story short, my mother died of cancer a couple of years ago, and my father left us after that so I also consider him dead. Her mother was dead and her father abandoned her. No wonder she had it so rough. How long had she been living on her own income? And her mother had had cancer. Did she have to pay her mother's leftover hospital bills? 
is that why she hadn't gone to college straight out of high school. There was no way she could save any money if she was handling everything alone. She didn't have anyone to rely on. Bennett, you're thinking about this too much. She chided me. I see that look on your face. How can you say all this so casually I managed to get out? My thoughts whirling in my head. It happened a while ago and I already got the hint life's not on my side. So what can you do? She responded with a dry laugh. It's honestly not that bad, so don't overthink it. I had to look away from her, afraid the sympathy I was feeling might show on my face. I'd known something had to be going on no one would willingly live in that apartment she rented but it was worse than I'd imagined. Her only family left was her brother who was in jail. My family was distorted, but at least we had money. Even if my mother died and everyone left me, I could live comfortably. Yet, here she was, with no one to support her but herself. And as far as I was aware, you couldn't make too much money working the jobs she worked. And yet I'd criticize the place she lived, the car she drove, the clothes she wore, how she styled her hair. I felt the world slow as the realization crashed down on me. Just how badly had I treated Henley? I had thought I'd understood, but I really hadn't until now. My brother's last words to me suddenly echoed in my head. You'll never understand just how hard life can be, Bennett. Um, sorry, maybe I shouldn't have told you that. You probably have to watch you interact with, Henley began again, sounding self-conscious. I totally understand if you want to find someone else to help you out, though. I don't want that, I said immediately and without thinking. I turned back to her, catching her gaze. She blinked at me, her mouth open. Oh no, okay. My body suddenly felt hot and I pulled at my collar, trying to get some air. What was she insinuating? That I would think she was repulsive after telling me that? Did I come off like that to her? Was it because of all the rude remarks I'd been making? It had to be. How could I have been so cruel? How could I have not realized? Henley, tell me, how shallow do you think I am? I don't really think you're. it doesn't matter to me where you live or what your family background is. I said, clenching and unclenching my fists. Please don't think what you just told me would affect how I think about you. It makes me feel bad. I understand why you could think that. Though. I've been rubbing my life in your face. I didn't even realize it. She shrunk back a little, her breathing increasing. It's okay, Bennett. I brought my hands up to my forehead. You've been doing a favor for me and I've been treating you like a rich man would treat a poor woman. I owe you so much more respect than that, Bennett. I didn't tell you that to get anything from you, she said and I could see her hands shaking a little. Was I scaring her? That's not what I wanted. I felt so guilty. I moved toward her, which must have startled her because she jolted backward. A small gasp escaped her mouth as she lost her footing, forgetting that the living area sat higher than the rest of the floor. I reached out immediately, managing to snag her by the arm and pull her back into me so she wouldn't fall. Thanks, she breathed and I could feel her heart stuttering in her chest. She tried to pull away, but I held her firm. Bennett, I'm sorry. I'm ashamed of myself right now. Henley breathed out a slow breath and after a moment I felt her arms wrap around my shoulders. Don't worry about it, Bennett I've been awful to you. It's fine, so stop. You're making me feel bad for telling you. Didn't I say not to pity me, she argued. I pulled away from her a bit. I'm not. I just truly feel bad for the way I've treated you. As long as you know what you've done wrong, it's fine. Don't beat yourself up about it. I'm a tough girl, I can handle it. She replied cheekily, giving me a tiny smirk. My heart skipped a beat and I pushed her away from me, suddenly wary of just how fast my heart was going. Had she felt it? What was I doing? I needed to calm down. Henley shouldn't be the one soothing me in this situation. It was supposed to be the other way around. I had to make this less awkward. I'll help you with dinner. So let's get started, she insisted, breaking out of my arms, and stealing my plan away from me. You said you find it relaxing, so let's do that. We both need to relax, I think. Let's do that, I agreed quickly. Um, thank you though, 
Bennett for what she poked her head into my field of vision and gave me a bright smile. The first smile from her I truly believed. For caring, I knew it was coming. I couldn't stop it. I couldn't hide it. All I could do was stand there stock still as a hot, red blush spread across my cheeks. Henley, Bennett was staring at me. I tried really hard not to notice, but it was pretty much impossible. His eyes followed me everywhere I went. He was so busy watching me that he almost caught the meatballs he was making on fire, his idea of a great dinner with spaghetti and meatballs made from scratch. That aside, his constant gaze was making me uncomfortable. Even while we were eating dinner he was staring and he missed his mouth at least five times, leaving a trail of tomato sauce down his chin, which he didn't wipe away in time, so it left a stain on his pale skin. I ate with my head down so I didn't have to make eye contact with him. Why was he acting so weird? Was it because I told him about my family? If I'd known he was going to react like this, I wouldn't have mentioned it. His change in demeanor and attitude was so drastic and sudden it creeped me out. Did he really feel that badly for treating me the way he had been? I appreciated it, but maybe he was taking it too far. Suddenly my mind flashed back to him hugging me his embrace was tighter than I thought it would be. Maybe he worked out. He felt nice. I shook my head. No Henley. I couldn't think like that. Just because I was a little attention deprived and craved human contact didn't mean I should have thoughts about Bennett. He was my employer. I peeked back up at him and he jumped a little as if surprised to be caught staring. His food once again missed his mouth and he didn't make any move to wipe it away. Sighing, I picked up my napkin and soaked it in my water before reaching over to wipe his face for him. What are you doing? He said, snatching my wrist into his hand and holding it away from him. You have sauce on your mouth. It's kind of gross. His cheeks tinted pink and let go of me, grabbing the napkin out of my hand and wiping around his mouth. Sorry about that, he was apologizing again. What is up with you? I demanded. With me? Yes. You keep staring at me. And apologizing. It's weird, he frowned. I'm not staring at you. I gave him a flat look. Really I'm just not sure how I should treat you now, he admitted. I've never met someone in your situation. Ugh, maybe treat me like you would treat any other human being, I shot back at him. I'm poor. I'm not dying or anything, he made a no-shit expression. That came out wrong, I bet it did, I just mean that now I'm more aware of how I've been mistreating you, he clarified. Now I don't know what to say as to not offend you, I shifted in my seat a little. I mean, I already said it's okay. You're forgiven. Let's just put it in the past, he shook his head. I'm going to try to be less rude to the lesser fortunate what you said right there. Yeah, that's kind of offensive, I said, smiling a little bit. It was almost cute. Almost. If you put aside the whole insulting bit. At least he was trying. His eyes widened. It is. Don't overwork yourself. I know this will be difficult for you, I told him, leaning across the table again to pat his hand. When I tried to pull away, he grasped my hand in his again. Don't you resent me? He asked. I tried to free my hand but he held it tight. No. Why? I basically bribed you into being my pretend girlfriend. I knew you needed money and I could give you a lot. I knew you wouldn't say no, dude, Bennett, chill. I responded, so not wanting to listen to his lamenting. As I said, as long as you understand what you've done wrong, that's fine. Stop thinking about it. You're just going to make things awkward. He frowned for a little while longer and it reminded me of a puppy being scolded and for the second time, I thought Bennett looked cute. Maybe it was because he lost his cocky attitude for the time being. You're not eating your meatballs, he finally commented. Oh, I don't actually like spaghetti and meatballs, I said sheepishly. Why didn't you say so, he demanded. You seem so excited. I didn't want to ruin it, I told him, shrugging. It's fine though. The noodles aren't bad. What do you usually eat? He asked, leaning forward in his seat a little. Whatever doesn't need to be cooked. I really don't have time to eat during the day. 
Sometimes I like to treat myself to Taco Bell though. He regarded me like an alien specimen for a moment and then I saw his eyes do a once over on my body and I felt the urge to flip him off. You can eat that plastic wrap garbage. Now it was my turn to frown. Have you ever tried it? Have you ever read the ingredients? Everyone knows how bad it is for you. You don't need to lecture me. I cut him off, rolling my eyes. It's a slow, delicious death. He eyed me warily. That doesn't sound pleasant. I'll bring you to Taco Bell sometime. It's the only date I can take you on that I can afford, I said jokingly. Unfortunately, he must have thought I was serious because that pity look returned to his eye. I'm worried about your health, and I'm worried about your non-existent enthusiasm to try new things, I countered. Wouldn't it be better to learn about my life so it can help you to not offend me? He considered this for a moment. I guess you're right. I'll show you the poor side of life, I told him brightly. Right. There was a moment of silence and then my phone buzzed and I reached for it, seeing my boss from coffee house had texted me. Can you open for me tomorrow? I'm sick. Oh, uh, I groaned. What my boss is sick and wants me to cover him. That means I have to go in at 4 a.m. 4 in the morning, Bennett repeated. I checked the clock. It was already almost 9. I've got to head home after we finish eating. Why are you going in so early? Just say no. Nah, I want the money. I responded, knowing I'd get overtime if I went in early. It would make it worth it. For a moment it seemed as though Bennett was going to argue with me, but he just sighed lightly. Are you done? We can leave now. I'll finish eating later. You're barely going to get any sleep. You need at least eight hours of sleep each a night. I usually survive on five, I told him, standing from the table. Do you need help cleaning up? No, I'm not paying you to clean up. I can do it after. Let's go. As we left his house, I caught myself glancing back at the room he'd scolded me for almost entering earlier. Seeing how it was his brother's room, I get that he didn't want me going in there. But did his brother still live here or not? Why would Bennett leave his room set up if he didn't? Maybe his family was just as messed up as mine. Bennett held the door open for me and we headed for his fancy BMW. I turned the radio on as soon as the car started, enjoying the rare moments of serious XM. Surprisingly, Bennett didn't start talking immediately. Even when we were halfway to my house he hadn't spoken. I really began to think he was taking what I said way too seriously. So what's the next step of your plan? I asked, deciding to break the silence. Of what tricking your mom? I clarified. Bennett drummed his fingers on his steering wheel. I do believe she'll be coming to talk to me tomorrow at work. So I can really pretend I'm falling for you hard. I nodded. I guess that would be the next step. What are you going to say? You should say that I've got the best personality in the world and I'm as cute as a button. I wouldn't be pretending if I said that, he responded and I caught my breath. He'd agreed with me. He seemed to realize what he said, too, because he quickly coughed. Well, I mean, I've seen girls cuter than you. Well hey, I snapped. I will say something along the lines of that though, he continued ignoring my indignant puff of air. I crossed my arms. I bet you won't believe you. Why do you think that? No one could fall for you with your attitude I remarked offhandedly. Bennett whipped his head toward me. What? I have a very charming, tactful personality. I've closed many deals and solved many issues with my personality. I can't believe you just described yourself as tactful. Do you even know what that means? Just because I'm poor doesn't mean I'm illiterate that was not what I was. Insinuating at all, what does insinuate mean? I can't help not understanding. I'm just a poor girl. Nobody loves me. She's such a poor girl, from a poor family. Spare her this life of monstrosity sang, putting my hand to my heart. Henley, he said, sounding exasperating. You know I didn't mean it like that. And why did you just start singing? I squinted my eyes at him. Their lyrics, what are, Bohemian Rhapsody, I said. But what? I put a hand to my forehead. And I thought I've had a rough life. No wonder your radio is never on. I'm not a fan of music, Bennett defended himself.
coming to a stop at a red light. What's your street address again? I told him while pulling out my phone to show him one of the greatest songs in musical history. I can't believe you don't know it, music distracts me. I really think we were destined to meet Bennett I told him solemnly. You obviously need a positive influence in your life and that influences me. He turned to me with the most apprehensive expression on his face. I'm starting to feel our age difference. When you get older you don't have much time for. Don't act like you're 30, I interjected. Who really grows up? Anyway, the light changed to green and he hit the gas just as I figured out how to sync my Bluetooth to his car. Making sure the volume was a notch louder than he was comfortable with, I began playing the song. Bennett's face was expressionless for the intro to the song. I bit my tongue to keep from singing so he could just enjoy it. Mama, just killed a man, I sang quietly, unable to resist any longer. That's disturbing, Bennett commented. I turned down the volume and scowled. Just be quiet and enjoy it, Bennett nodded and I turned the volume back up. As we were pulling onto my street, the song was ending, and I didn't get out of the car until the last note finished. I pushed on the overhead light so that I could see Bennett's reaction. Amazing, right? His face still held that unsure look. It's different, eleven but amazing. I liked your singing, he said. I blushed immediately. That wasn't why were you listening to me sing. You missed the point, but no buts. I'm leaving. Buy that song and listen to it until you know the lyrics by heart, I said quickly, reaching for the door. He liked my singing? I sounded like a dying whale. I'd gotten too into the song. How embarrassing. Henley, Bennett responded, chuckling a bit. I turned to give him a dirty look, but froze when I caught sight of light in my room in my apartment. Wait, what I felt dread run through my chest. I didn't leave my light on when I left. Bennett looked up at my apartment too. Are you sure? Positive my mind flashed back to the multiple sweaters I'd seen earlier. Oh no, I gasped, ripping my seatbelt off. What no, 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 I chanted, shoving the door open and scrambling out of it. I raced around the car, only to have Bennett open his door and grab me by the arm. Wait, he demanded. I stared at him with wide eyes. I think someone might have broken in. Then don't go in there alone, he said, all of the early lightheartedness between us gone. My heart beat against my chest almost painfully. I took a couple breaths to calm myself. It's fine. I might have actually just left the light on. You should go home. I know being around this part of town makes you nervous. Right now, I'm more nervous to leave you alone, I waved him off, jerking my hand more than I should have. I'm fine. Go home. Let me come in with you now, I responded immediately. He let go of my arm and I felt guilty for being so harsh. I mean, it's probably nothing. You were right when you said you'd get asbestos in there, he didn't look convinced. I glanced back up at my apartment. If I were honest, I was a little scared to go up there alone. I knew for sure I did not leave that light on. Fine, I mumbled. Come to the door. But don't go in, I can't accept those terms, he agreed. Let me text my assistant first. Why? In case someone is in there and something happens, he replied and pulled out his phone. I gave him a wry look. I doubt it'll be that bad, I'm an important person, he answered me and then slid his phone back into his pocket. All right, let's head in. Everything was eerily quiet when I entered the building. The lights were off and the door was shut. Usually, the hallway light would be on and the first floor room's door would be open to crack to let the light filter in. I ignored it and headed up the steps. The first obvious sign of something being wrong was my door being open. My heart skipped a beat and a thousand thoughts ran through my head. Who was it? What did they take? Maybe they just wanted some food. Bennett brushed past me and I opened my mouth to tell him not to open it but he pushed the door all the way open before I could. The sight before me was enough to shut me up. Anyway, all my belongings were strewn across the floor. It looked like someone had looked through everything of mine and ripped open whatever looked like something could be hidden inside. All the books on my bookshelf were on the ground and open, meaning the spines were now all screwed up. 
my crappy, five-year-old TV was gone, as well as my DVD player. A lamp was missing. A fleece blanket that my father had given me was gone as well. I'm going to call the cops, Bennett announced, his face impassive. I couldn't tell what he was thinking at all. I didn't care at the moment either. It was tough to take in the scene. My place was completely trashed. My home was ruined, Henley's POV. I stumbled my way into my bedroom and almost gasped. My bed was torn to shreds, my pillows were in pieces. My closet was practically empty. Who steals shitty clothes I yelled into the destroyed room, kicking at one of the pillows strewn on the ground. I couldn't believe it. I should have known those hobos were up to something. I shouldn't have let them stay as long as I had. I should have done something about them in the very beginning. This was what I got for my kindness. Bennett appeared in my bedroom doorway, frowning deeply. The police are on their way. You should take some pictures. I get it, I muttered. Excuse me, I totally get homeless people wanting things. I ground out, but did they have to steal from someone who barely has anything? I mean, come on. Just ask for some hand-me-downs. Don't wreck my entire place. What the hell? What the hell? I ran my hands through my hair, letting out a frustrated sigh. I was so dumb. I should have foreseen this. You should make a list of what's missing, Bennett suggested, folding his arms over his chest. I rubbed my forehead. There's no point. I didn't have anything worth much. Anyway, the only thing that even meant something to me was the blanket, but I knew there was no chance of seeing that again. Whoever stole it probably just thought it was something that could keep them warm. Never mind any sentimental value. But couldn't they have just stolen my comforter? Surely that was better than a battered old fleece throw. I bit my lip hard when I felt my eyes starting to water. I wasn't going to cry over this. Especially not in front of Bennett. Surely you can get some money from insurance, he argued. Who in their right mind would pay for insurance for a crappy place like this? I countered. And even if I did have Renner's insurance, I'd only get like 20 bucks. It looked like Bennett wanted to say something back, but he held his tongue. Instead, he just pursed his lips. I wasn't trying to be snippy with him, but the whole situation was irritating and embarrassing me. The fact that I was robbed. The fact that Bennett was around when it happened. The fact that he was seeing this already shitty apartment in an even worse state. Sirens cut the silence that had settled in and I sighed. I didn't really want to deal with cops. You should go, I said to Bennett. He looked surprised. What we'll go home? I'll handle it from here. As soon as the cops leave, I have to start cleaning anyway. They'll want to do a report. I can go to the station with you. You can do those online these days, I said, heading out of my room and back into the living room, careful not to disrupt any of the evidence. If I even make a report, Bennett seemed flabbergasted. You have to make a report. You were robbed, Henley, I rounded on him, fingers twitching. Listen, Bennett. Me being robbed is a lot different than you being robbed. Your belongings are probably worth over a million dollars. Mine aren't even worth 100. It's not a big deal. Please just go home. You can't stay here alone. What if they come back? If they came back? They already took what they wanted. I doubted they'd be back. Unless they told their friends about how easy it was to get in here and that the locks were broken. I heard banging on the front door to the building and as I moved to answer it, I almost slipped on some paper on the ground. Frustrated, I kicked a few things out of the way and groaned. It was such a mess. I wouldn't even be able to sleep in my bed. There was basically nothing left to it. There was basically nothing left to the whole place. Not like there was much to begin with anyway. Henley, Bennett started. I could feel my eyes beginning to burn. No Henley. Not in front of Bennett. The cops are here. Bennett, just leave. Please. Interfering in my personal life isn't part of our contract, so you can go. Fine. He responded quietly after a moment. I didn't turn around to see his expression and he didn't say anything more. My gaze stayed on the floor as he moved around the mess and then I watched his back as he exited through the front door. 
He greeted the police and explained that I was the renter of the apartment and then he left with one of the cops. I swallowed nervously as the other female officer approaching me. After what happened with my brother, I started feeling anxious when the police were around. Even though I knew I never did anything wrong. After explaining what I'd come home to and describing what the hobos looked like, I told her that I'd file a report online to finish up. She told me not to stay in the apartment tonight and to call if anything happened or if I had any questions. I nodded, glad to keep the conversation short. Chances were, I wasn't going to make a report because there was no point since I didn't have insurance, but I kept that to myself. I didn't want to tell her flat out that I was wasting her time. Once the front door shut, I heaved a heavy sigh, staring dismally at the mess before me. I didn't even know where to start. The living room. What was left of my bedroom? Did I even want to go through what ratty clothes were left? It seemed that they'd mostly been interested in my clothing. I could only imagine what Bennett would say about my wardrobe. My eyes widened and I walked back into my bedroom with my heart in my throat. I scanned the articles of clothing scattered all over to the floor, tensing when I couldn't spot the right thing. Moving forward, I ripped the closet doors open all the way coming face to face with the Baron inside. There were a few stretched out shirts still on hangers, but that was all. The thousand dollar dress Bennett had bought me was missing. With shaking hands, I kneeled down to check the shoe boxes on the floor, finding them empty as well. They'd even stolen those heels that I could barely walk in. I crouched down, suddenly losing the power to hold myself up. Of course, they would take the dress. It was the only nice article of clothing that I owned. Why had I expected them to leave it? They didn't know it had any sentimental value. They didn't know how good I'd look in it and for once I'd actually felt that way. I'd have to tell Bennett. He was the one that bought it and technically it was his. I pulled out my phone and dialed his number. He answered right away. Henley? What's wrong, um? I started, hating how my voice was shaking. The dress you bought me is gone. They stole it, the one from the other night. Yeah. I'm really sorry. I know it was a lot of money, I said, staring at the empty shoe box. The heels are gone too. Then I took a sharp breath of air and I prepared myself to be narrated. I'm really sorry, I said quickly, feeling horribly embarrassed. Tears were starting to form again. I'll pay you back for them. I really like them. I really wanted another chance to wear the dress. I'm really sorry you had to waste your money. I'm really sorry my shitty luck caused you to lose money Henley, Bennett interjected when I paused to take a breath. Calm down, I shut up because a few tears rolled down my face and I knew if I spoke at this point my voice would crack. Don't worry about the dress. That much money doesn't know, I mean, I don't want you to pay me back for it, he told me, his voice low and serious. That's the last thing you should be worrying about right now. You shouldn't stay in your apartment tonight. I don't have anywhere else to go, I whispered, brushing the tears off my face. It was already late I didn't want to bother Ariana. There was a moment of silence and then he said, come to my place, when I responded dumbly. You can stay at my house. It's not good for your psychological well-being to stay in your apartment after you've been robbed, he told me and I could hear the nerves in his voice. Then I heard what sounded like a car door closing and I figured he just arrived home. You don't like people at your house, I pointed out. How can I leave you alone as things are, he returned. I rubbed my eyes, taking a deep breath. I'm okay. Sorry I freaked out a bit right there. I guess maybe shock finally got to me. You just got home. Don't worry about me, I never left. A voice said from behind me and I gasped in shock, pushing myself to my feet and turning to see Bennett at my bedroom door, his phone still up to his ear. I froze, mortified at being caught crying, and mortified that he was in the room with me after I'd had a slight breakdown. H how'd you get back in? He pulled his phone away from his face, frowning deeply. The lock is broken, remember? Your door doesn't shut completely. Another reason you can't stay here. If there's anything valuable still left, grab it. I don't need to go to your house. I am fine, I insisted, wiping around my eyes in case my makeup was smudged. 
I know it might not be in our contract, but I'm not doing this because of our work relationship. He shot back at me. I stared at him, surprised. Had my earlier comment offended him? Maybe I'd been a little harsh. Well, not maybe. It had been really harsh. Especially to a guy who apparently had waited outside my apartment building because he didn't want to leave me alone. Are you sure? I finally asked. He folded his arms over his chest. Hurry up and gather your things. I'll wait by the door. I followed right after him because there was nothing left that I cared too much about. I hated thinking of the money I'd have to spend to replace all my clothing, but thanks to Bennett's payment it wouldn't be a problem. I really only cared about the outfit he'd bought me and my father's blanket everything else could be replaced. What should I do about my car? I asked him. He hesitated for a second before answering. You can bring it to my house, but what about your mom? You said she'd figure everything out. Don't worry about it, he said, hunching his shoulders. I bit my lip. He'd been so adamant about not bringing my car over earlier. Was he saying it was okay now because he felt too bad to say no? Why don't you follow me to the coffee shop and I'll drop my car off there? Then you can just bring me back to it. You're going to go to work tomorrow, he asked, rounding on me. You should take a sick day. I'm sure they'd understand. I don't think, Henley, he said so disapprovingly that I felt it weigh on my shoulders. I'll text my boss, I responded, pulling out my phone. It was probably for the best. Tomorrow I'd have to come back and clean up and deal with the landlord. Hopefully, the police had gotten in contact with her already. Half an hour later Bennett and I were in his car again, heading back to his house. I felt jittery in the passenger seat. It was going to be weird staying at his place. Where would I sleep? The couch. He wasn't expecting us to share a bed, was he? What about in the morning? What time did he wake up? Would he get up before me? He was definitely going to see my just woke up no makeup look. When we arrived, we went straight in and I stiffly followed after him. I'm going to clean up first, he told me as we went downstairs. I helped as best as I could, but he pretty much just shooed me away. So instead I wandered back to the living room and stared out the wall window at the lake. Bennett joined me there a few moments later, his hands in his pocket. If the dark makes you uncomfortable, I can shut the shades, you can do whatever you want. I don't mind, I told him. Well I want you to feel comfortable he mumbled. It's your place, I argued. He turned to me, a sheepish expression on his face. I'm not so ignorant as to not know that you might be finding it strange to be staying at the house of a man you barely know. You're making it more weird by saying that. I haven't had anyone stay over in a very long time. I'm not sure what I should do, he confessed, looking apologetic. Pretend I'm not here, I said immediately. I can occupy myself. I'll read or something, he shook his head. That's not what I meant. Don't feel as though you're imposing on me. I'm the one who offered, but I know you don't like people over I already told you you're different, he said, cutting me off. Forget I said that. You're a comfortable person, I blinked. Oh, oh, thanks. He seemingly became embarrassed because he turned away from me and cleared his throat. You're welcome to take a bath, if you'd like. I have some stress-soothing bath salts. Somehow that didn't suit his image and I found myself smiling. Bath salts. Really they do work, he responded, offended. Are you telling me to take a bath just so you can accidentally walk in on me while I'm naked? I inquired. He turned back to me with his jaw dropped. Just how badly do you think of me? I'm not a pervert, I laughed and it felt nice. I'm just kidding. A bath doesn't sound too bad. Thank you Benedict cocked his head to the side, his green eyes piercing into me. For what letting me stay here? I'm guessing you're just as nervous as I am. I hate to intrude in your space, but I appreciate it, I answered, suddenly feeling shy under his gaze. It's the least I can do. I know you don't have money to stay at a hotel, he responded. I narrowed my eyes slightly but decided to let that one go. He could get away with it for just tonight. Bennett's POV, 
Rain pattered against the wall window in my living room and I tried hard to focus on it and not the young woman who was currently soaking in the jacuzzi tub in the room above. I sat on the couch with one leg crossed over my other, drumming my fingers on my knee. After so many years of solitude in my house, it felt strange to have another presence around. Sebastian usually only stayed for a couple hours when he came over, but Henley was staying the whole night. I looked down at the couch where she'd probably be sleeping. Henley was small, but I didn't think she'd be able to lie down comfortably on it. I'd mostly bought it for the sake of the design in my living room and the fact that it was a good brand. It wasn't meant for sleeping on, but what was I supposed to do? Offer for her to sleep in my bed with me. I'd most likely get slapped and I definitely wasn't going to be the one sleeping on the couch. She's been through a stressful situation, I scolded myself. I couldn't be selfish at a time like this. I wasn't sure what drove me to invite her over, but I knew I couldn't leave her alone. She seemed to be handling it well, but she also seemed like the person to not show it if she wasn't handling it well. The only glimpse I got was when she found out the dress I'd bought her had gone missing. It wasn't even a big deal, I muttered to myself, resting my elbow on the armrest of the couch and plopping my chin onto my hand. She'd cried over it. A silly dress. Had she cared about it that much? Was it because I'd bought it for her? Or was it because she thought that it was a waste of money to have it stolen? I couldn't figure her out. What I did know, though, was that she didn't rely on me at all. I thought I was a rather reliable person and yet she didn't want my help. I didn't understand. Were all girls this hard to understand? Or was I too used to the girls who wanted any attention from me because of my status and wealth? Henley didn't care about that at all. A sharp pain throbbed behind my eye and I winced, bringing a hand to it. Tonight was not the night for one of my migraines to make an appearance. I debated about waiting it out. Then I felt that dull pulse of pain and decided it'd just be better to take some pills. Sighing, I pushed myself up from the couch and headed to the master bathroom. It had almost been a week since my last headache. Why return now? The last thing I wanted was to be throwing up all night when Henley was here. I pushed open the bathroom door, my hand still over my forehead. There was a small gasp and then a splash of water and I stopped dead. I turned before I even realized what I was doing and came face to face with a wide-eyed Henley, who had sunk down to her chin in the water. My mouth went dry and I tried to utter an apology but all that came out was, UMF, W Y, she said, her eyes never leaving my face. My gaze traveled down to the cloudy water that hit her body then it snapped back up and I felt my cheeks warm. Sorry, I'm not used to it's okay, she interjected her voice a couple pitches higher than normal. It's your house. Do what you need to. I swallowed, not sure where to look. There was something sexy about Henley when her hair was wet and I didn't want to be having those thoughts about her while she was staying at my house. Or in general. I had to act confident. I just have to grab something. Sure, she answered as I forced myself over to the medicine cabinet. I hunched my shoulders as I searched for the right bottle. My head didn't feel too bad, so I didn't want to use any of the more expensive prescription pills. However, I also didn't want to be in here any longer so I grabbed the Excedrin bottle and made a beeline for the door. And you said you wouldn't walk in on me, Henley taunted as I stepped out. I closed the door maybe a little harder than I should have and took a deep breath, trying to calm myself. In this situation, shouldn't she have been the one more embarrassed than me? Just what kind of girl was she? My head throbbed again so I returned to the kitchen and got a glass of water, downing two of the pills. Hopefully, they would be enough. I'd been doing well with keeping my headaches at bay. Maybe it was because Henley was over. I didn't feel stressed by her though. Well, that was wrong. I was a little on edge. I fell back onto the couch and closed my eyes, trying to rest. That lasted about three seconds because my phone started ringing. Groaning, I pulled it out of my pocket and noticed the screen read Henry. What? I answered flatly. Mr. Callaway. He cried in such a dramatic manner I winced. What? I repeated. This is bad. Really bad. 
I could pretty much imagine him biting his nails as he spoke. Our construction team for the Hawaii Resort have announced they are canceling our contract. I sat up straighter in my seat. What? I contacted your mother, but she said this is your responsibility. You need to talk them back into it. How did this happen? I demanded. Hadn't things been going fine? Construction was supposed to start next week. I'm not sure. I received the call today and I've been trying to solve any issues, but they aren't agreeing to anything. You need to speak to them. You're going to have to come to the office tomorrow, go to the office. I can't, I told him, thinking about Henley. I couldn't let her return to her apartment alone tomorrow. I didn't even want her going back there period. It was too dangerous. Mr. Callaway, I don't mean to be rude, but you've been away almost all week. I've been doing what I can in your absence, but I need you to sign some paperwork. And remember our accountant started her vacation, so payroll needs to be done, have my mother handle it. I told him. Your mother has made it clear that you are in charge. He paused. As she told me to tell you that your brother would have do not start, I snapped, my whole body tensing. Haven't I told you not to mention him? How can you use that against me? Henry sucked in a deep breath of air and tried to recollect himself. I'm just repeating what your mother said to tell you, don't associate with her. I'm the one who pays you so don't worry about losing your job if you don't listen to her. I told him, trying to lighten my tone, even though my skin was crawling. It wasn't Henry's fault. My mother was an intimidating person, she could make almost anyone bow down to her. What kind of mother would use that against her own son? I didn't want to repeat it, Henry said apologetically. Your mother is just very serious about this and has noticed your absence this week. This is a crucial moment in your career, Mr. Calloway, I clenched my jaw. Unfortunately, he had a point. The Hawaii project was my project. I couldn't try to pass it on to anyone else. What kind of example of my leadership would that be? My employees were supposed to respect me, but who could respect a lazy employer? I really wish I could do more to help you, he added quietly. His words pacified me and I let out a quiet sigh. He was a good worker and a better person and I probably didn't deserve him. It wasn't right to take my frustrations about my mother out on him. I'll come in tomorrow. How long do you think I'll have to be at the office for? I would request you stay for a couple hours to satisfy Ms. Calloway, but I hope that everything will be settled quickly. I'll be in, I promised reluctantly. Thank you for all your help. It's no problem. I have a feeling you're going to make this group be even greater than it already is. Mm, -hmm. that's some pressure there. I returned lightheartedly. Have a good night. Come in late tomorrow. He gave a slight chuckle. Even if I come in late, I'll still be in the office before you. I pursed my lips. You should treat me with more respect than that. Oh, sorry. I'll be in before you tomorrow, sure. He corrected himself and then there was a click as he hung up on me. I shook my head. He was something else. It took guts to tease your boss like that, but I appreciated it. No one would be brave enough to speak like that to my mother. She would fire them. I never would. I was different than her. For example, I would never use my brother's name to force her into doing something. It was cruel. How could she bring him up? Did she want to lose two sons instead of just one? It was like she didn't care. I smiled dryly, putting my head in my hands. She probably didn't care. She cared much more about the hotel than her own sons. Her sons who were too stressed out to handle so much at once. Which was Wiley? Bennett, I straightened back up quickly in surprise, turning to see Henley coming down the stairs. There was a frown on her face as she hiked up the pajama bottoms I'd given her in order to not trip as she descended. The shirt I lent her was also too large, so the sleeves flapping as she walked. My current thoughts dispersed, being replaced by just one, cued down. Thanks for letting me borrow your clothing, she said as she grew closer, shoving the sleeves of the shirt up to her elbow. After a couple seconds, they rolled back I was never one to be at a loss for words. Yet around Henley, I found it happening quite often, especially when she was wearing my clothes. Problem not, I said after a moment, 
tripping over my words. Okay, Yuda, she responded with a little laugh. I pressed my lips together tightly and grimaced inwardly. Smooth. She dawdled by the side of the couch as if unsure if she should sit or not. Her hair dripped at the ends, sending droplets of water onto the expensive leather. I immediately stood up and reached for her, thinking of tucking her hair into the towel around her neck. But then yanked my hand back when an overwhelming feeling of shyness came over me as I took in the exposed parts of her throat and her collarbones. Her eyes widened slightly and she shifted. What? The water. I started, but stopped myself. Was I really going to complain over a few drops of water? It would only make her more uncomfortable than she probably already was. Dry your hair properly, I said instead. She pulled at the wet strands. I prefer not to towel dry my hair if I don't have to. It makes it more frizzy, an awkward silence settled in when I didn't respond. I wasn't sure what to say. You might ruin the weather. What if you get a cold? It seemed a little cliche. So I cleared my throat and slid over on the couch, gesturing for her to sit next to me. She did so cautiously and I noticed how much space she put between us. The quiet continued as neither of us spoke. I thought about putting on the TV, but wondered if it would offend her. Would she think I was ignoring her? Was this a common thing hosts felt when they had people over? I could hear the clock ticking in the kitchen. I bet I could hear a needle drop. Sorry about today, Henley spoke, scaring me. I tried to cover it by stretching out. You don't have to apologize, I'll be out of here tomorrow, she continued, staring at her lap. Henley, I don't think you should go back to that apartment, I told her, frowning. You should find a new place, she lifted her head back up, her expression shocked. What? Why, it's almost uninhabitable. If it can be broken into once, who says it won't be broken into again, but it's the most affordable place, she argued. I don't want to give it up because of a minor problem, minor. She considered that a minor problem. I'll find you a better place. I'm sure I know someone who could offer you a good deal. I don't mind giving you some money to pay for it either, no. She cut me off in a hard tone. I'm not a charity case, Bennett. If you want to give out money, give it to the orphanage. I do give money to the orphanage, I said, insulted. I don't aid and fundraise multiple times a year. I'm not considering you as a charity case. I'm offering because I... Why was I offering? Normally I wouldn't bother with someone else's personal affairs, but I couldn't leave Henley alone. She appraised me for a moment, biting her lower lip. I hesitated, unsure how I should finish. Friends helped each other right. I'd help out Sebastian in a heartbeat. Henley was the same way. We're friends, right, I said cautiously. She considered this for a moment and finally nodded. You're right. If I could help you out the same way, I would. But I'm not going to accept any more money from you. I have enough to find myself a new place, so you will find yourself a new place. I didn't say that, she responded, but I could see that she was thinking about something. Maybe I'll look around. But in the meantime, I still have to stay there. So maybe the landlord will fix it up. You can stay here. I found myself saying before I realized what exactly I just offered. Her eyes grew wide again. What? Stay here. I repeated, more confidently. I don't know think of it as part of our contract, I suggested. If my mother finds out we're living together, maybe she'll get off my back. Henley started playing with the ends of her hair, avoiding my gaze. I don't want to intrude just until you find another place. I won't mind at all. Your couch might get my imprint, so she was aware of the worth of the couch. That aside, I figured that was her giving up and agreeing to stay. It's fine. I can easily replace it. She gave me a dry smile and I felt instantly relieved. Okay, I'll stay here for a little. One week tops. If I don't find a cheap place, I'm going back to my apartment though. I still have the rest of the month paid for, a week. That didn't seem like enough time. Isn't it better to start looking for two bedrooms? I asked. Your brother will be getting out of jail. Realization came across her face and she grinned. Oh, that's right. 
That's a good point actually. I found myself smirking a bit. Convincing people to do things was always one of my strong points. I'll ask around. I appreciate it, Bennett, she said, offering me a shy smile. It's been a while since anyone has helped me out like this. I don't exactly know how to feel and I'm not sure what to say. It's nothing, I responded, holding up my hand. I didn't want the awkwardness of trying to explain my actions again. If you need anything done around the place, leave it to me. Cooking or cleaning or anything really, she continued, more enthusiastic now. To be honest, I was a little scared of going back to my apartment. You're a surprisingly good guy. I nodded and then narrowed my eyes at her. What? Surprisingly? What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. Was that an indirect insult? Hmm, maybe. My mouth fell open a little. After I have so gratefully she burst out laughing, effectively silencing me. I'm just kidding, Bennett. You're pretty easy to tease. The I folded my arms over my chest. You think you're funny? I'll be here all week, she retorted with a wink. That's right. She would be here all week. A week with Henley. In my house. Living with me. Having wet hair. I gave her a half smile half grimace, suddenly unconfident with the situation. Henley's pie, insisting on sleeping on Bennett's couch had seemed like a good idea the night before, seeing as how I was a guest and all but by six in the morning, I'd decided it was probably the worst idea. I felt like I hadn't slept at all. The cushions weren't comfortable and my body was too long so I had to curl up to keep my feet from dangling off the edge of the arm supports. I briefly considered getting up just so I didn't have to try getting comfortable again. Just as I was shifting, a light from the hallway above me turned on. I turned my head up to the balcony and saw Bennett stumbling toward the stairs his head bowed. He was dressed in a navy blue suit and his hair was wet, as if he'd just gotten out of the shower. As he came up to the couch, he seemed to have noticed me and I froze with my eyes half closed, hoping he wouldn't notice I was awake. After a minute he started moving again, this time more slowly as if he was trying not to wake me up. It was ruined, however, when his phone started ringing. He quickly searched his pockets and pulled out his phone, trying to cover it with his hand. It's 6 a.m., he answered the caller in frantic whisper. I stretched out and yawned loudly, letting him know I was awake. I wanted to know if he was leaving. Why else would he be up and dressed already? Was I supposed to leave as well? I pushed myself into a sitting position, keeping the blanket wrapped around me. I'll be there shortly, I've got to go. Bennett said sleepily into the phone and then pulled it away from his ear. After a second he finally turned to face me, rubbing a hand across his eyes. Sorry, I didn't mean to wake you. I was kind of up anyway, I told him. It seemed like he was more sorry to be awake than I was. I could tell he wasn't a morning person. There was a moment of silence and he shifted his weight. Did you sleep okay? He asked. Did he think I was done sleeping? It was 6 in the morning and I called out of work. If I didn't have to leave the house, I was going back to bed. Are you leaving? I asked instead. He frowned a little. There is a problem with one of our projected resorts, so I have to go and... Are you going to drop me off at my place? No. You can stay. He told me, noticing his tie was crooked and adjusting it. I don't mind. I hope to be back sooner rather than later. You sure? I chewed on my bottom lip little. Was it really okay for me to stay at his place alone? It was weird enough with him here. How would it feel without him around? Or you won't steal anything, will you? No, then I trust you to stay here, he stated, yawning again. You can take another bath, if you'd like. I had to admit, that jacuzzi was a deal maker. Plus, even if I went back to my apartment, my bed wasn't in good shape. Okay, his phone went off signaling a text message and he scowled a bit. Ugh, he muttered and went into the kitchen. I followed him with my gaze, pulling the comforter up to my chin. Maybe when he was gone I could use his bed instead of the couch. I shook my head, throwing myself back down into a lying position. That would be way weird. 
I could deal with the couch. At least until I found another place to stay. Feel free to use anything while I'm gone, Bennett said as he passed by me again, this time with a water bottle in hand. I'll lock it, so don't let anyone in, I nodded, feeling shy. He stared at me for a moment and then cleared his throat. Well? Bye. Then, bye. I mumbled and he nodded and headed back toward the stairs. I settled back down and closed my eyes. Bennett was so different than how he was when I'd met him. I really did wonder if it was because of the night I snapped at him. I shoved a pillow over my head and groaned. No matter how I thought about it, it was mortifying. How could I get drunk in front of strangers like that? Especially on one? Eventually, I fell back asleep and when I woke up it was around 10 a.m. The house was silent and the sun was shining through the glass wall, lighting up the room. Beyond the wall I could see the lake, sparkling under the morning sun. It was beautiful and I understood why Bennett had designed it like that. After forcing myself off of the couch, I chose to head straight for the jacuzzi tub. I wasn't sure when Bennett would be back and I didn't want him walking in on me again. Thinking about it made my cheeks warm and this time I made sure to lock the door. Fortunately, the bubbles had pretty much covered my body, but who knew what he'd seen? It wasn't like I was ashamed of my body. It was more like I didn't like being caught off guard while naked. I slipped into the bath and immediately turned on the jets, letting them massage my sore back. Thinking about sleeping on that couch again made me cringe. My torn up bed back at my apartment probably would have been more comfortable. I had to start looking for a place right away. A two bedroom would cost a lot more than my last apartment had, but I did have to think about my brother coming back. It was still a few months away but I wanted everything to be ready for him. My phone suddenly started ringing and I considered ignoring it. It might be the police though, I thought to myself. Sighing, I shut the jets off and slid to the edge of the tub, drying my hands off with a towel before reaching for my phone on the counter. When I caught sight of the caller ID I slipped, just barely managing to keep my hand with the phone out of the water. H hello, I greeted leaning back against the edge of the tub for balance. Henley, Brandon, I cried, my eyes widening. How are you? Are you okay? Do you need anything? What's going on? A chuckle came in response to my questions. What are you? An interrogator, I scowled a bit. No, I'm okay, don't worry. I actually have some good news. I sat up a little straighter in the tub. What's that? I might be getting out earlier than expected, he said, trying to play it off as cool, but failing pretty badly. His voice was higher than normal. Good behavior and I guess my lawyer has been hounding them to spring me early. He might not be good for much, but at least he's trying to do something finally. Seriously? That's awesome, I know. The sooner I get out, the sooner I can out for sure what really happened that night. I definitely didn't crash that car, Henley, Brandon, I'm almost positive. Even drunk I wouldn't be that dumb, he argued. I wouldn't do anything to leave you alone. You know that, I sighed lightly. I know. We'll talk when you get out. Trust me, I don't want anyone thinking I have an ex-convict for a brother, is that all you care about, I grinned a bit. Mm, maybe, you still living in that one bedroom in Poughkeepsie, he asked. Are those homeless people still hanging around? I paused. I really didn't want him to worry about the fact that I'd been robbed and I also didn't want him to know I was currently staying with a guy who just so happened to be the heir to Callaway Hotels. He was still my big maybe a bit too overprotective brother. I couldn't imagine what he would do to Bennett if he knew. I'm actually starting to look at two bedrooms, I finally said. Good idea. I just hope I can find a job when I get out. We'll be okay for a while, I have money, I assured him. Especially with the money Bennett would be giving me over the next few months. Don't overwork yourself, he chided me. You're doing great, Henley. I'm sorry for being a shitty big bro, gross. Don't get sappy, I hate you. I stretched out my legs, pressing my toes to the other side of the tub. I know, as much as I love listening to your sarcastic responses, I've got to go. I have another call to make, you do, 
I said doubtfully. Who? First off, don't act like I don't have friends. And second, I've finally gotten in contact with a different lawyer who's willing to check out my case again. There has to be something we're missing. Brandon's voice got lower and he let out a frustrated noise. There's something weird. I know it. Why would I steal a car? I have my own. It doesn't make sense. I frowned, hating to think about the memory. But you were drunk I know, but still. You have some hope in me, right? Of course I do, I responded, feeling a little guilty. He was my family, how could I doubt him? I just don't know how you'll prove it. Let me know if you find anything new out if you get this new lawyer. I have some money if he or she wants any up front. Okay. Love you, sis. Love you too. Good luck. I responded, pulling my phone away and ending the call. After placing it back on the safety of the counter, I slipped deeper into the water and put the jets back on and closed my eyes. I wasn't sure how possible it would be to clear Brandon's name. He seemed dead set on it, but a long time had passed already since the accident had happened. Would a new lawyer really help this situation? His current one bore a competent name but still had landed him in jail and turned out to be a waste of money. But honestly, there really wasn't much evidence to support it wasn't Brandon who had stolen the car and crashed it. Any lawyer would have a tough time trying to prove his innocence. Just saying I believed in him because he was my brother wouldn't do anything in a court case. Dad would know what to do, I mumbled, pulling my legs against my chest. He always had the answer to everything. No matter how much trouble Brandon or I got into, he would always bail us out and only scold us a little. Now, without him, life was more difficult. Being an adult was way harder than it had seemed when I was younger. I was barely even an adult. If it was this demanding at 21, I could only imagine what was in store for the rest of my life. Helping my brother, graduating college, finding a real job, being an adult. I could feel the nightmares coming, one step at a time. Henley, I advised myself. And step one was finding a new apartment. When my skin was all pruned and gross, I hoisted myself out of the bathtub and stepped into the stall shower next to it to quickly wash my hair and rinse myself. I thought about getting back into my dirty clothes but then remembered Bennett's room was right next door and if he let me borrow pajamas, would it matter if I borrowed a shirt, too? Wrapped in only a towel, I tiptoed out of the bathroom, being cautious even though I knew no one was home. I made a move to open Bennett's bedroom door when I remembered the spare room that he'd warned me not to go into. My feet started moving to the other door before my mind could process it. He said not to go in there. I tried it myself. But he also wasn't here. Would one look really hurt anything? Even though he said it was his brother's room, for all I knew it could be a torture chamber. Wouldn't it be safer to make sure it wasn't? Deciding that was a reasonable thought. I turned the knob and pushed it open a little. The scent of mothballs engulfed me once again and I wrinkled my nose. I took a step into the room, my hands searching the wall for the light switch. Eventually, I hit it and light filled the stale room. It was clearly a bedroom and that's a medieval torture chamber. It was a little smaller than Bennett's room, but not by much. In a word, the room looked lonely. There was a complete lack of personal items. There was only a bed with sheets that looked like they hadn't been cleaned in ages. A bookcase that was half full. A desk with a computer that was coated in dust and a chair with broken wheel. Dust filled the air, making my throat dry. I swallowed, glued to the spot. I couldn't look away. The room looked so desolate. Just what had happened to Bennett's brother. Was he dead? Was that why Bennett didn't want anyone coming to his house? So they wouldn't see this room? Is this what he meant by it was all he had left? The lingering sense of sadness in the room was enough to explain everything to me. To lose someone you care about. I knew it all too well. Hey! The sudden sound of a voice behind me made me gasp and I screamed as a hand grabbed my shoulder, forcing me to turn around. The feeling of being caught sent a hard jolt of self-reproach into my gut. Why had I given in so easily to myself and snuck in? When I finally registered the person before me, my eyes widened in surprise. S. Sebastian, 
I cried at the same time he said, Henley, what are you doing here? I demanded, once again speaking simultaneously as he said, Why are you here? We both stared at each other suspiciously. You first, we chorused. I moved to close the door to the spare bedroom and felt my towel slip off my body. I seized it with fall, feeling my cheeks flame. In two days, two guys had seen me basically naked. What had my life come to? Sorry, Sebastian apologized, adverting his gaze. Hold on, let me get dressed, I squeaked, making sure my towel was around me securely and hobbling off to Bennett's room. I went over to his dresser and basically tore it apart looking for something to wear. Fortunately for me, the closet was loaded, so I grabbed the random shirt and threw on my jeans. By the time I was dressed, Sebastian had moved down to the living room. I slowly went down the stairs, my cheeks still warm. I cleared my throat as I approached him. Sorry about that, I'm sorry too. We startled each other pretty good, he responded his gaze anywhere but my face. What a decent guy. I thought you might have been a robber, and a towel I said skeptically. His cheeks tinted pink. I wasn't expecting anyone to be here. Does Bennett know you're here? No, I sometimes come here to escape my family he told me sheepishly. Strange, I know. Was the door locked? I know where the spare key is. I do this a couple times a week. And this isn't meant to be rude. But why are you here? Why were you in Lee's room? Now it was my turn to be self-conscious. I pushed my hair behind my ears and grimaced a bit. I needed a place to stay last night. And that was, um, I was just being nosy. Please don't say anything to Bennett. Sebastian frowned at me. Bennett doesn't let anyone in there, I know. I feel bad now, really since you got caught. Ooh, a stab right to my ear. I sagged my shoulders. Yes? Sorry. Does it help to say I just wanted to make sure it wasn't a torture chamber? He told me it was his brother's room, but you never know. Right. Sebastian seemed to debate this for a moment and then he slowly nodded. I guess that excuse is reasonable. Then it is kind of strange. Honestly though, I occasionally go in there just to see if Bennett's cleaned it up yet. Cleaned it up. I echoed him still. Yeah. It's really depressing to see how he keeps it exactly the way it was when Lee lived here. I'm sure if he cleaned it up and moved on it wouldn't be so painful to as he did. Sebastian suddenly looked apprehensive and he shifted his body weight, like he was suddenly uncomfortable. You don't know what happened to Lee. I shook my head. It's really personal for Bennett, so I won't talk behind his back about it. Sebastian said shortly and I wondered if I'd asked something I shouldn't have. Just what exactly had happened to Bennett's brother. I wouldn't suggest going in there again and don't talk about Lee in front of Bennett either. Henley, Sebastian added, narrowing his eyes at me. I'm warning you in advance. I couldn't help but smile a bit at his defensiveness. He caught this and gave me a doubtful look. I was just thinking that you're a good friend, I explained before he could comment. He smiled a bit and shrugged. It's for your own good too. It really messes with Bennett still. Oh, I said, unsure of how to react to that. The death of a family member would take its toll on anyone. Some people could just cope better. Some people took longer to come to terms. Some never did. But which one was Bennett? I'm really curious though, about what I asked. You being here. I never thought I'd see the day Bennett brought a girl home, let alone letting her stay while he was gone. What's going on between you two? Are you really dating? The quick intake of breath I took to deny the fact caused me to choke and I turned away from Sebastian, covering my mouth. What gave him that idea? Was it really that weird for people to be at Bennett's house? We're not in a relationship, I promise, I finally muttered. Sebastian didn't seem satisfied with my answer. Is that so? You should be careful then. Henley, careful, Bennett doesn't realize it, but I think he is scared to get close to people, he told me, his eyes soft. If he lets you stay here, it means he trusts you. I'm worried that when you're together time is up he might not want to let you go and you'll want to leave. I don't want him to lose someone he cares about again. I took his words in carefully, cupping my right elbow with my left hand. 
Sebastian was overthinking this. Bennett was helping me out because we were friends. There was no way he had any ulterior motives. There was no way he liked me. He'd made it clear on multiple occasions that I wasn't his type. Instead of worrying about Bennett not wanting to leave, I was more worried about myself not wanting to leave thing. I didn't mean to bring the mood down. Henley, Sebastian spoke, pulling me from my thoughts. He offered me a kind smile. I'm just doing the whole best friend uh. No, it's fine. I get it. Should I show you something nice in return? I tilted my head to the side. What's that? I know where Bennett keeps his photo albums. You wouldn't believe how big his head was when he was little. I bet it was smaller than it is now. I commented wryly, causing Sebastian to chuckle. He then gestured for me to follow him back upstairs. Come on, Bennett might show up at any time so let's take a look while we can. I nodded, following behind him. Maybe if I were lucky there would be an embarrassing photo that might come in handy if he ever felt the need to blackmail him. Sometimes it'd be nice to have the upper hand. Henley's POV. How's this one look? Sebastian asked, sliding his phone across the table and over to me. Three bedrooms, two bath. Only two thousand per month. I gave him the flattest look I could muster and he laughed in return. We were currently seated in Bennett's kitchen, scrolling through online ads for apartments. After explaining what had happened the night before, Sebastian had offered his help in finding a new place for me. He'd also brewed us a pot of coffee and stolen a few of the best photos from Bennett's albums so we could get copies. I smirked at my phone a little. There had been more than enough embarrassing photos to use as blackmail, including one little, naked Bennett face down and butt up. Dude, I don't even make 2000 a month, I sighed, pushing Sebastian's phone back at him. Let's keep it under a thousand, you're not going to get anything good under a thousand, should we clarify both our definitions of good? He appeared to be a little offended by my response and he flattened his lips. I'm not saying to look for an elaborate multi-story place. I'm saying you shouldn't settle for a place solely based on the cheap price. Look at the apartment you have now. I'm not being rude when I say I am a little pricier. I'm being honest because anything that isn't completely run down is going to be close to a grand. Especially around here. I knew he was right, but it was frustrating. A grand was about the average for a decent apartment. With the money from Bennett, it wasn't unfeasible, but the idea was a little daunting. What if something went wrong and the contract ended? That was a lot of money every month. According to statistics, one third of your income should be the price you pay for a living space, Sebastian continued, sitting up straighter on his chair so that he could take off his suit vest. He then rolled the sleeves of his button up to his elbows and I watched him distractedly. He was a very handsome man. He caught me staring and I quickly averted my gaze. Tea that makes sense. The rest for food and gas or whatever. How do you know that? Do you rent? I have a house. Of course. He did. However, I've recently purchased some properties I'm planning to rent out, he continued, turning his attention back to his phone. It's a great investment, but I'd like to keep them affordable to all classes so I have to know what the general rule of thumb is. How many places do you have? I have ten. My jaw almost dropped. Ten. He was basically saying was that he owned ten houses. Plus his own. I let my head drop onto the cold table suddenly weary. Oh, how different the ways of lives were between classes. Sebastian reached over and put a hand on my shoulder. Sorry. It sounds like I'm gloating. It's okay, I muttered, muffled by the table. I've found a couple relatively nice houses around here that are below market value, though. I wanted to bang my head against the table. I can't buy a house. Not for you, he clarified. I've been meaning to purchase a few places here in Poughkeepsie and maybe in Arlington well. I'm glad to be of help, I said, putting out a thumbs up. He chuckled. If they turn out to be profitable, I'll let you know. I wouldn't mind cutting a deal for you. My ears perked up and I slowly raised my head. Deal. As long as you told everyone you knew about how amazing of a landlord I am. Do you really think you might buy a place in Poughkeepsie? I asked a little more enthusiastic now. Sebastian seemed trustworthy enough. 
Unlike my last landlord. Maybe if he rented a place out to me it wouldn't be so bad. He nodded. I would still try to find a temporary place. Maybe a month to month lease. Okay, I agreed quickly. What do you do, anyway? You know, to be able to afford this. I work for my family he told me, his smile fading a little. For now, at least. I plan to leave them when I have more of a steady income with my properties. Don't you make a lot of money with them though? I do, he said slowly, but not in a way I agree with. My father runs a law office. He takes on the clients that offer him the most money whether or not the client should be defended or not. What do you mean? My father is a great lawyer he started off. He wins over 90% of his cases. Last year he defended a client who'd molested multiple women and managed to give him a clear name by lack of evidence. I'm aware it's a lawyer's job to defend the client no matter if it's right or wrong, but he also has the right to refuse a case. He knows how influential he is, but he just wants money. I wrinkled my face in disgust. Gross, Sebastian nodded. I could never become the lawyer he wants me to become. He doesn't know that I don't plan on running the office yet. Does your mother know? No. She would have a panic attack if she knew. He let out a long sigh, leaning back in his chair a bit. She has hopes that if I don't follow in my dad's steps, I'll follow in her own. What does she do? She runs some resorts. Ever heard of Paradiso? That's hers. My mom and Bennett's mom went to Harvard together and both ended up running hotels. She thinks one day Bennett and I will be the next generation I smiled a bit at this. Is that how you two became friends? That in our mutual annoyance of our family Sebastian joked, grinning. We somehow managed to schedule all our classes together in college too. Sometimes we cheated off each other's tests. Where did you two go to college? Here in New York? At Columbia University I processed the information slowly. That was an Ivy League school. So along with being rich and handsome, Bennett was also smart. What the heck was he? The protagonist of a romance novel. Somehow it irritated me. I see, Bennett's a good man, Sebastian said, his voice warm. I know it's hard to see given the way he's spoken to you, but he's got a good heart. I'm not excusing him of his ignorance, but I think he needs some time to learn about different things in the world. He's been pretty sheltered. I don't think he's a bad person, I responded. I didn't think he was a pristine little angel either, but recently I was starting to see the good side of him. Sort of. Why are you talking him up? Anyway, Sebastian paused a bit looking a little sheepish. Well, Bennett only has one real friend in this world and that's me and if possible, I'd like to make that number into two. I feel like you might have the patience needed to befriend him. Ha ha, does Bennett really not have friends? I asked. I was slowly realizing I didn't know anything about Bennett. Not that I expected to know everything about him after only knowing each other for a little over a week, but I knew basically nothing about his life. I knew he had a mother and maybe a dead or missing brother and he would inherit Callaway Hotels. That was pretty much it though. If you consider people that like to use him for his money as friends, then he's got many, Sebastian commented offhandedly. Yikes! Bennett falls for it every time, too. I think that's why he doesn't understand you. You're not begging him to spend money on you, I scrunched up my face. I mean, are a lot of people really like that? That would be embarrassing to do. You would be surprised, he told me solemnly. I'm sure everyone has been in a relationship where they spend way too much money on their partner and their partner just keeps taking. Usually, you finally realize how much money you're wasting on someone so ungrateful. Ben is completely blind to it. He likes the attention, huh? I wouldn't have guessed. You're pretty sarcastic, aren't you? I gave him a sheepish smile. Sorry. It's kind of natural. My brother is the same way. I didn't say it's a bad thing. I propped my elbow up onto the table and placed my chin on my hand, staring at Sebastian quizzically. Has Bennett dated a lot of girls? He pursed his lips to the side, thinking, Not really. Bennett's not that great at talking to girls. Usually, they just cling to him until they get bored because he won't make a move on them. 
There's only one person he's ever dated seriously. Really? What was she like? Sebastian leaned forward a little, a grin on his face. You want to know? I nodded. Just what kind of girl could put up with Bennett for more than a few hours? You'll have to ask him, I groaned, falling back. Why can't you just tell me? Why do you want to know? Do you like him? No, I denied immediately. Me? Like Bennett? What a laughable thought. Sure, he could be kind of cute, but no. He wasn't even cute. I don't like him. I mean I do like him, as a friend. Kind of. As a friend, I said again firmly. Sebastian raised his eyebrows. I see, I didn't like the expression on his face. I narrowed my eyes. What? What's that look for? Nothing, that's not a nothing look. He held up his hands. It's really nothing. Why do you think it's something? Are you trying to use some kind of weird lawyer trick on me right now? This caused him to chuckle. No, I'm just... He was caught off by the sound of a door slamming shut. I jumped, turning my head up to the balcony. Was Bennett home already? Did he normally slam the doors in his house? I heard the unmistakable sound of high heels and froze because as far as I was aware, Bennett did not wear high heels to work. Sebastian and I exchanged bewildered looks before I turned back to the balcony where an older woman appeared, hands crossed over her chest, staring down at us. It only took me three seconds to figure out it was Bennett's mother. Just by her demeanor, Henley, play along with me, Sebastian murmured. We are so screwed, I whispered back at him, completely frozen. Why was Bennett's mother here? Why didn't Bennett call to warn us? What was I supposed to do? Hello, Mrs. Calloway, Sebastian called, standing up from the table. He kicked my foot and I got the hint to do the same. She didn't respond as she made her way down the stairway and through the living room, her eyes on me the entire time. Her entire appearance screamed affluence from her three-inch heels to her black pencil skirt and to her bright red blazer. Her lips were a deep red, complementing her olive skin. Her hair was long and black and perfectly curled, not a strand out of place. As intimidated by her as I was, I couldn't help but think she was gorgeous. She came to a stop in front of me, green eyes and slits. Bennett definitely had her eyes, except without the look of a predator ready to decimate her prey. You, I straightened my back, doing my best to keep eye contact. H hello, who are you? I glanced at Sebastian who cleared his throat. MRS. Calloway, this is Henley. He trailed off, grimacing a bit. I realized he didn't know my last name. Fortunately, Mrs. Calloway's eyes were still on me and she didn't seem to notice his hesitance. Henley Linden, I announced, holding out my hand. She didn't take it. I awkwardly lowered it back to my side. Why are you at my son's house while he's at work? she demanded. Straight to the point, huh? Uh, MRS. Calloway, you can't just start interrogating someone as soon as you meet them, Sebastian spoke up. She turned to him and placed a hand on her hip. MR. James, are you here because you're running away from your mother again? Will you ever stop disappointing her? My mouth fell open in shock and I immediately went to jump to his defense but a slight shake of his head silenced me. I bit my tongue, feeling my skin crawl. This was Bennett's mother. No wonder Bennett didn't understand why I'd gotten offended by his words. He thought it was normal. Haha, <laughs> I'm actually here just to keep Henley company, Sebastian said lightheartedly. Bennett doesn't let anyone stay over. Why in the world are you still here? Mrs. Calloway asked, stern-faced. That's, um, damn it Henley, say something. What was I supposed to say though? Was I supposed to lie directly to her face? Even then, what would I tell her? Bennett and I hadn't gone over this. How much did I need to lie about? There was no way I would pretend to be someone like her. Sebastian sighed loudly, coming over and putting an arm around my shoulder. His touch felt relaxing and some of the tension left my body. You're scaring her. This is why Bennett can never keep a girlfriend girlfriend Mrs. Calloway repeated. Then her eyes widened a bit. 
You are Bennett's girlfriend. Her eyes scanned my body, and with a jolt, I realized I was wearing Bennett's t-shirt and a ratty pair of jeans. Crap, crap, crap. Hadn't Bennett said she'd be able to realize my social status by my clothing? I've never heard of you. Who introduced you to him? That would be me. Sebastian answered before I could. I was grateful he was here with me. Lying while under pressure wasn't my best point. Especially when it came to lying about myself to make myself seem better than I was. She gave Sebastian a harsh look. Why? I have a list of candidates for Bennett to meet. Her family was also looking for a suitable partner for Bennett, so I suggested her. Her family and mine go way back. How come you've never mentioned her before she just got back from France after living there for a few years? He lied smoothly. Dang, he was good. Must be the lawyer in him. But couldn't he have picked a country that spoke English as their main language? Mrs. Calloway looked at me expectantly. France. You say? Did you study there? Uh, we. Oui. I responded and cringed inwardly. That sounded so lame. What did you study? Business. Sebastian shot me a look at my questioning tone. Her family has a chain of hotels across France. She's the next heir so she's come back to rekindle connections in the US and I thought it might be a good idea for the two of them to meet. They hit it off instantly and impressed look across Mrs. Calloway's face and she appraised me yet again, this time with more interest. You don't say. Perhaps a hotel I've stayed at while there. Oh, man. Why did I take Spanish in high school? I didn't know any French. What the heck was I supposed to call the hotel? Something in French. Maybe. I finally said. We were climbing the ranks of top hotels in France. But we're still growing. Maybe you've heard of Fleur Hotels. She thought about it for a moment, tilting her head to the side. Um, perhaps? It's been over two years since I've last been in France. Have your parents come with you? I would like to speak with them. No, they're still in France. I said quickly. Her lips twisted down a little. I see. Still. It isn't right for Bennett not to introduce his mother to someone he's thinking about dating. Or for you to not properly greet me, thinking about dating? Did she miss the part about me being his girlfriend already? I will not recognize you as his girlfriend until I've met your parents and you prove your worth to our family she continued as if reading my thoughts. Our business needs to keep growing and keep evolving. Bennett needs to be with someone who will help us reach our goals. I may have given him a bit of leeway for dating, but don't think anything will be set in stone. I'm only telling you this so you don't get your heart broken. It takes a lot to become a Callaway. Some people just aren't cut out for it. She ended as if she was trying to sound kind, but it didn't sound like that at all. It sounded like a threat. What if it's what Bennett wants? I asked and Sebastian shook his head vigorously and gave me a next signal. Her eyes steeled and her lips flattened into a straight line. Bennett understands that the business comes first. No matter how much he might come to care about you, I can make him let you go in a heartbeat. There are many pretty faces out there. So don't get too ahead of yourself, Hadley. It's Henley, M.M., she responded and I felt my jaw twitch. When was the last time you had a haircut? I glanced down at a lock of my hair and grimaced inwardly. How did she pick up on that? Did you forget to take care of your looks after coming to America? Or do you generally look like someone who came from the slums? I felt my lips curl up. Sebastian placed his hand on my shoulder and gave it a squeeze. All right, all right. It's a day off. Excuse her looks. I'll help to arrange a meeting with her parents. This topic aside, is there a reason you came here, Mrs. Calloway? Just to make sure his belongings were still here, I moved to get up, but Sebastian held me down. Ha, huh, nice joke. She smiled, but it was more like a sneer. I respect that you and my son are both adults, but he has a reputation to uphold. Please stay decent as if to make a point her gaze zeroes in on my shirt. She must have known it was Bennett's. No worries. We only do it in the bedroom I told her sweetly, smiling wide. Maybe once in the kitchen. We'll make sure to shut the shades. The look of complete reproach on her face was totally with Sebastian digging his nails into my skin. After a moment of both of us staring each other down, 
she turned her nose up at me. She needs to work on her manners before she meets me again. Don't mind her. She gets a little grumpy when she's hungry. Right, Sebastian said, punctuating his last word with pinch to my shoulder. I chose to remain silent and eventually Mrs. Calloway began walking away. We listened to the click of her heels all the way up the stairs and down the hallway until they disappeared. Sebastian let out a long sigh and I felt myself calming down, only for that feeling to be replaced with dread. Well, that could have gone better. I'm doomed, I whispered with wide eyes. The hair laying on my chest teased me with every breath I took. Why couldn't I even take care of my hair properly? It's fine, Henley. Next time you see her just apologize. Calm down, I ran a hand through my hair roughly, sucking in a big breath of air. Then it's going to kill me. This is my job. I messed up. He's going to kick me out so fast. Ah, I'm dead. I'm so dead. I'm going to be homeless and dead. Calm down, he repeated, moving his hand to my head and fixing my hair. I looked up at him. Why friends? Why Flushy was a Harry Potter character he snorted and then coughed. Really really? I'm screwed, aren't I? Well, groaning, I reached back for the newspaper and opened the classifieds again, this time to look for jobs. I was going to need a new one because I was certain I'd be getting a phone call from Ben at any minute telling me I was fired. I really knew how to mess things up. Henley's POV after the incident with Bennett's mother, I couldn't sit still. I wandered around the kitchen, pressed my face against the glass wall in the living room, walked up and down the steps to the balcony at least 20 times, and checked my phone at least 100 times. I was waiting for it. Waiting for the text from Bennett telling me to get out of his house and give him his money back. He told me to be careful around his mother, but I ended up lying to her that we had sex on the table. I cried suddenly, stopping on the middle step in the staircase. Sebastian jumped and threw me a concerned look from where he was sitting on the couch. Henley, come sit down. Ben it's probably going to be here any second. I pressed my hands to my cheeks, giving him a horrified look. Do you think his mother will sue me for defamation? I doubt it she's probably doing a background search on me right now. Do you think she's going to put a tail on me? She wouldn't be able to figure out who I am. Wait. I told her my full name. I have a Facebook. Oh man. Oh man. I have to deactivate it. Sebastian stood up and came over to the staircase and climbed up the stairs to where I was. I backed up a little, pressing my back against the railing. He reached out and held my forearm, holding my gaze. You're fine. She also thinks I'm not good enough for Bennett. I muttered, low enough so Sebastian wouldn't hear. Why else would she have made those remarks? I guess anyone with eyes could see the difference between Bennett and myself. Even if I was pretending to be someone I wasn't. Stop thinking and clam down. I supped in my lips and made a sour face. I am the essence of calm. Except for the fact that I breached the contract between Bennett and myself and he's so going to kill me, or worse, take his money back. A crease appeared in Sebastian's eyebrows. How was that worse? Suddenly the front door opened and I let out a terrified squeak. What if it was Bennett's mother again? Or Bennett? I twisted to escape from Sebastian's grasp, but only managed to lose my balance. My foot slipped on the wood and I felt myself fall for about three seconds until firm arms wrapped around my waist. With my head about two inches from the stairs, I looked up at the top step. Through my upside-down vision, I saw Bennett standing there looking absolutely confused. What are you two doing? He asked. In a swift motion, Sebastian helped me straighten out my back. My head spun for a second and I held on to his arm. Bennett I started. I'm sorry. It's okay if you want to end the contract. What are you two doing? He repeated, jaw tensing. It just happened this way. I'm really sorry. I couldn't help it. Help what? Fooling around with my best friend while I was at work, he snapped. I paused. What he gestured towards Sebastian and I, I wasn't aware you two were so close. I think you're getting the wrong idea, Ben, Sebastian said, grinning a bit. We're not doing anything bad here, 
then its suspicious expression didn't disappear. Why do you want to end the contract? Don't you want to? Why would I want to? Your mother. My mother. He repeated. Then his eyes widened. Did she come here while I was away? I nodded. When? What happened? Were you dressed like that? Of course. He would mention my outfit. Yes. I grinned out. He ran a hand through his hair, closing his eyes. I should have expected this. What happened? Did she find everything out? No, Sebastian answered before I could. I told her Henley was a family friend visiting from Paris and I'd set the two of you up. Did she believe you? I'm not sure. She didn't attempt to kick Henley out, if that counts for anything, Bennett covered his mouth with his hand, looking out toward the lake. Why would she come directly here? She did insinuate that she thought I was robbing you, I told him. He didn't need to know about her also insulting my looks. He groaned. It's because you're wearing my shirt hold on, why are you wearing my shirt? I don't have any clean clothing here, remember. He raked his eyes over me slowly and then cleared his throat. Oh, right. That's fine then. Sebastian coughed into his hand and I swear it sounded like a laugh. Can you speak French, Henley? Eventually you're going to have to meet with my mother again now that she's met you once. I'll speak to her myself before that then, but just in case, I grimaced sheepishly. Well? No. I can't speak French. At all. He didn't seem put off by my answer, so I assumed he hadn't expected me to be able to. I figured as much. He said unnecessarily. That was my fault, Sebastian told him. It was the first thing that came to mind. Did anything else happen? I felt my cheeks warm up and I gave him an innocent smile. Well, um? His face fell and he braced himself. Yes, I might have said we have sex on the kitchen table. Sort of. Haha. -ha. His ears tinted pink and he opened his mouth to speak. But I cut him off. We're both adults, why does it matter? And she's basically told me not to be a slut so I had to say something back. Not that being a slut is even a bad thing. It's okay to like sex. She shouldn't be interfering in our sex life anyway. I bit my tongue, realizing I was saying too much. Our sex life. We didn't have one. This time Sebastian did laugh and I shot him a dirty look. In Henley's defense, her provocative words were in your defense, he said. That's not something my mother would ever need to know, he muttered. I scuffed my feet on the floor. Awkward. Well, we can work on the lie you told her. Henley can learn a few simple phrases in French and we'll get her proper wardrobe. We'll just have to come up with a concrete background. Find out what the top colleges are and maybe we can create a fake degree, he continued, frowning in thought. Maybe fix her hair a bit, too. Good thing your car wasn't here. Yeah, yeah. No problem. I'll just change my whole life. Just for you, I said, nodding my head along to his suggestions. He pressed his lips together. Are you upset? No. I mean I guess I should have known not even a part of me is good enough to date you. It's not. Then it started but trailed off because yes. Yes, it was. I bit my lip to keep from retorting. I'd already known I would have to lie to his mother about who I was but hearing just exactly what I'd have to change. I felt a little hurt. Was I really that worthless to these people? Were they really on such a different level than me? Did I really look so trashy to them, too? I'm sorry, Bennett said. He was apologizing. I didn't know what to say. Wow, impressive, Sebastian said instead, giving him a small round of applause. Never thought I'd see the day Bennett acted considerate without someone telling him to. Bennett shot him a dirty look, obviously embarrassed. I'm generally considerate I beg to differ. I said, if this is too uncomfortable for you, I'll understand if you don't want to continue with our contract, Bennett told me. My mother isn't pleasant. The women she suggests to me are comparable to herself and that's where my problem stems from, part of me really really wanted to tell Bennett good riddance and hightail it out, but my kinder side fought with that part. If this was what Bennett was faced with, it was no wonder he didn't want to be forced into a relationship with someone his mother chose. 
His mother seemed to think she was the Queen of England. She'd even had the audacity to accuse me of stealing Bennett's stuff and attack my appearance. Who did she think she was? Was I really going to get scared off by her? I was stronger than that, wasn't I? I'm still going to help you, I said. Bennett looked relieved. Thank you Henley, but if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this right. She thinks I'm not good enough for you. Make me good enough for you, I continued, feeling my pulse begin to rise. Your mother's pretty intimidating. So I guess I'll have to become intimidating too. My words seemed to surprise him. You want me to make you good enough for me, he repeated. I nodded, squaring my shoulders. Yes, Sebastian hummed. Then it appears we have some shopping to do, I turned to him. You'll help, of course. If that's okay with Bennett, Bennett stared at me, eyebrows crinkled. I suppose so, but then I'll go get ready. I started down the stairs and then stopped, suddenly remembering something. Sebastian and Bennett were both boys. I'd need a girl for this. Looking over my shoulder, I smiled innocently at Bennett. We're just going to have to pick up one thing. Ariano was waiting patiently on the bench in front of Coffee House when Bennett pulled up to the shop an hour later. Her eyes widened at his sleek car and when she didn't move to get in, I rolled down the window and beckoned her over. She quickly hurried over and slid into the back next to me when I opened the door for her. This is like the Princess Diaries, she whispered. I rolled my eyes at her. Not even close. Hello Ariana, Sebastian greeted turning to face her from the front seat. She beamed at him. Oh, it's you. From before in the shop. Sebastian, right. And hi Bennett. Nice to see you again. My favorite part about Ariana was that she didn't let anyone feel awkward. She was the type of person whom you could feel you were best friends with even if you just met her. She could make any situation into a favorable one. And her sense of fashion was impeccable. Hello, Bennett said looking at her through the rearview window. He squinted at her a bit and made an uncommittal noise. I suppose you will be adequate ignore him, I said immediately. Just drive, Bennett she grinned. I see you two have become a lot closer. Where are we going, anyway, to the Woodbury Common Outlets, I told her. That way there are stores that will satisfy both my own tastes and Bennett's mother's tastes. Her tastes are big above that, Sebastian told me what but there's like coach he shrugged there's better than coach i drew back probably creating a double chin gross i know i'm all for shoving what mrs calloway said down her throat but i don't want to buy stuff i'll never wear either i'm sure we'll find something suitable we'll just try to find things that don't have brands plastered all over them i also need to get some everyday clothing for myself i'm not going to go everywhere in Prada. I said, directing my words mainly to Bennett. You could still replace what you had before with better outfits, was his response. I shot him a dirty look and Sebastian nudged him in the leg. Ariana tilted her head at me adorably. Why do you need to replace it? Anyway, that's right. I hadn't told her yet. On the drive to the outlets, I explained to her what had happened to my apartment and why I ditched out of work and what had happened at Bennett's earlier. Better for her to be in the loop than out if she was going to help us. After convincing her that I was fine and telling her not to cry, she took things to heart easily. She gave me a big hug. Does Brandon know? She asked me. Yeah, I told him. I was aware that both Bennett and Sebastian had gone unnaturally still. Obviously, they were listening. He didn't call you, did he? No. Why? Just wondering if he hadn't called her. Then who had he called after he hung up with me? He didn't have many remaining friends. Oh. That reminds me. I wanted to tell you today at work but you weren't there. I was at McKellen's the last night and the owner said he wanted to talk to you. My ears perked up. McKellen's? What did he say? Not much. Just that he had something to show you. Was it about my brother's car accident suddenly Bennett jerked the wheel to the right and my seat belt locked? digging into my waist. I looked out the window, trying to see if we'd hit something, but he hit the gas again and kept driving. What was that? He didn't answer and I looked at Sebastian, 
whose face had paled a bit and lost all humor. He gave me a slight shake of the head. Confused, I settled back into my seat and didn't say anything else. What was that reaction for? Was it something I said? I'll tell you later, Ariana said, gesturing toward the front of the car. Don't let me forget. Okay, I responded. Maybe it was better that way. I didn't need Bennett listening in if it was about my brother's accident. That was something he didn't need to know the details about. But what the heck was Sebastian's look about? We arrived at the shops around 6 o'clock. As we all climbed out of Bennett's car, I realized just what a right deck group of people we were. Bennett was in a suit, Sebastian was in a button-up and a vest, Ariano was wearing a long sleeve polo and jeans, and I was in an oversized t-shirt. I had no doubt no matter what store we went into, everyone would flock to Bennett and Sebastian. I guess we should start with stores I would never even go into, I said as we entered the main strip of shops. What kind of shops did Bennett's mother shop at? Probably nothing here. What would come close? Maybe like Gucci. That's popular. Right, Bennett and Sebastian exchanged looks. I narrowed my eyes at the pair. Let's stay away from Gucci, Sebastian suggested. Huh? Why? Isn't it popular? I don't think you'll find it suitable, Bennett said. What about Prada? He pressed his lips into a firm line. Hey, I'm just going down the list of brands I figure suburban moms that drive low in Mercedes would buy. This earned a giggle from Mariana and I struggled to keep a straight face. It's not hard to afford a low end Mercedes, nor Prada, Bennett said and started walking. But if that's what you'd like to look at, let's go. I'm sure we could find something there that'll work. I quickly fell into step beside him. It's not going to be like Alexander Wong, right? Please don't say there's flower pattern grandma prints on everything. That's why we didn't suggest Gucci. I also feel like it would make you seem you were trying too hard. Well, sorry, it would be better to get you clothing directly from designers in France, but we'll have to settle. Prada was settling. My poor wallet was already starting to cry in my pocket. However, I needed to do this outfit. Jake who will also be a good store for you, I believe he continued. I'm assuming what you want is something simple you can wear as an everyday and a business maybe, at this point. I just wanted anything that would make Bennett's mother beg me to marry her son. Their clothing will work for you. Even I shop there from time to time. Not everyone is about what name they're wearing, was he really saying that to me? Well, duh. I said a little more harshly than I meant to. He looked down at me. Weren't you just saying suburban moms wear Prada? Yeah, but just as you are not the chain store clothing you wear, I am not the designer clothing I wear. I switched my attention to the ground, feeling like a child who'd been scolded. My words had been mostly just for a laugh. Maybe I put a little bit of my jealousy into them too. I'm sorry, I mumbled. Henley, hey! What's taking you two so long? I called, turning away from him and waving at the two stragglers behind us. Sebastian must have said something really funny, because Ariana was basically dying of a laughing fit back there. Seeing her made a lurch of jealousy go through me. She and Sebastian looked meant to be standing next to each other even in her work outfit. Bennett would have had an easier time if he'd chosen Ariana over myself. I was just childish, sarcastic, and bitter. No wonder Bennett's mother didn't approve of me. Prada, it turned out, actually had some acceptable clothing. While still a bit pricey, there were outfits I'd actually wear on display. After trying to go straight for the sail rock and being rerouted to the displays by Sebastian, I started pulling things I wanted to try on, doing my best not to look at the price tag. Ariana roamed around the store, sometimes coming back to me and holding a top up to my chest and then throwing it into the pile to try on. Picking up a nice trench coat, I searched around to show Bennett, realizing he was busy chatting with one of the sales attendants. Her flirt face was on and I felt the sudden urge to interrupt them. Wasn't she supposed to be doing her job? And wasn't he supposed to be helping me? Ready? Sebastian asked, holding an arm full of clothing. I tore my eyes away from Bennett and Ida's hall. Are those for me? Of course. Let's head to the fitting rooms. Wait, do I have to show you them? Well, 
Not me necessarily, but they have to get Ben's approval. I had to showcase everything to Bennett. Suddenly I regretted grabbing a pair of leather leggings I'd seen, and a tiny black dress. Let's go, Bennett. She's ready, Sebastian called. I hurried to the fitting room, pulling Ariana in with me. If anything looks bad, you have to tell me the truth, she nodded seriously. That's what friends are for. First thing was a simple, black dress. It looked elegant, but it was also something I could wear out in town as well. Upon approval from Mariana, I walked out to show the two men. Sebastian applauded politely and Bennett just stared at me. Is it okay? I asked him. Comma, yes. I waited. He didn't say anything more. I went back into the fitting room, and that's how it went with everything I modeled. I'd walk out and no matter how great I looked, Bennett would just blankly approve. No eye widening, no gasping, no thumbs up. Just a simple yes. I didn't know why it bothered me so much. It wasn't like anything I was trying on was that impressive. Sure the dresses were nice, but they were rather conservative. And I wasn't expecting much excitement from jeans and long sleeve shirts. But did he have to have no reaction whatsoever? I thought maybe this would be fun for him. Yet he looked like he'd rather be anywhere else. Wait, I have this. Ariana told me as I was taking off the last outfit in the pile. I looked at the article of clothing in her hands and felt myself smile. It was a mid-rise burgundy colored, twist dress. Out of everything I'd been handed, I knew this was exactly what I needed. It was beautiful and refined. This is perfect, I thought it would suit you. Put it on, she said excitedly. She helped me zip up the back after I slid it over my body and then I adjusted the belt to make my waist appear smaller. Looking in the mirror, I grinned a bit. Good clothing could really make you feel good. With my confidence sky high, I walked out of the room and into the waiting area. How's this? I asked haughtily, placing my hands on my hips. Bennett was standing by the door now with his back to me, talking to the same saleswoman. I felt my heart fall a little bit. Henley, I thought you were. He trailed off as he turned back around, eyes falling on me. I had one more, but it's okay. I'll go get changed, I responded, stepping back toward the fitting room. Give us one second, Bennett told the saleswoman and she nodded, heels clicking as she left the waiting room. I ran my hands over my sides. Is this good enough to meet your mother? Once again, Bennett's face didn't change. I look good, don't I? I tried, attempting to sound as confident as I'd felt just moments before. Nothing. I felt my heart pound harder in my chest. I didn't get it. I was doing this for him. Couldn't he compliment me? Was it that I didn't look good? Was I wasting his time? Did it not suit me? Do I still look worthless in this? I demanded not liking how desperate my voice sounded. Finally I got a reaction from him. His eyes hardened and his posture tense. What did my mother say to you? That's what he had to say in response. That's what he had to say instead of no. Henley, you look amazing. I didn't answer him, feeling my teeth grin as I bit down hard to keep myself calm. I had to get out of this dress and never look at it again. Why had I been so arrogant? How could I ever think I could equal someone like Bennett? Just as I made to return to the dressing room, Bennett's hand shot out and grabbed my upper arm, holding me in place. I gave him a warning look and he held my gaze. Henley. What did she say? It doesn't have anything to do with what she said. I snapped at him. She must have said something. I felt my chin tremble and I clenched my jaw harder. Let me go. I need to change. Why did you ask me that? ask you what? If I look worthless? Isn't that what you think? No, he interjected loudly. I froze, my voice cutting out. Not once even for a second have I thought you were worthless, he told me, his hand gripping me tightly. Is that why you decided to come here today? To prove your worth? To my mother? To me? I've been trying to figure it out. It is, isn't it? I swallowed. Why did you even bother coming? You look like you'd rather be anywhere else the whole time, worthless because I knew something was wrong. 
You wouldn't have suddenly decided to come shop for clothing you would never buy for no reason. He replied. Did she call you no one do I make you feel worthless he asked, voice dropping considerably. I softened my face. It wasn't surprising he would come to that conclusion. No, why would you ask me that? Then, I'm sorry, I apologize for what felt like the hundredth time. You should have chosen someone else for this. I'm just making it difficult. This is my own stupid ego and my own problem. I shouldn't have pinned it on you like that, at this moment. I was regretting everything that had happened. I'd been way too headstrong after the confrontation earlier. I should have taken time to calm down first. Now I'd made Bennett feel like it was his fault. His hand slid down my arm and he used my wrist to pull me closer to him. Our faces were only a few inches away from each other. You asked me earlier to make you good enough for me. I'm the one making you pretend to be someone you're not. I'm the one making you feel this way. I'm the one who's not good enough for someone like you, cheesy for a moment, I forgot how to breathe. I dropped my gaze to the floor. He was too close. His cologne smelled too good. His hand was too warm. That's kind of Henley, he said sternly. I slowly raised my eyes to meet his gaze again. Compassion and loyalty are worth more than wealth. By these standards, you're worth the world. Bennett gather what you're going to purchase he ordered letting go of my arm. I will pay for them, Bennett I repeated. When we get back, I'll help you find a place you can move into as soon as possible. Don't worry about the contract anymore. I'm terminating it. I'm sure we'll come up with an agreeable cancellation fee. Breathe. His words caught me off guard. So much that while I was still trying to comprehend them, he was already out room. Then when they hit me, I felt like I couldn't been at one to turn the contract. Henley's pop. I blinked rapidly, trying to process what had just happened. The contract was over. Just like that. Why had Bennett snapped like that? I couldn't let it end. Not if it was because of me. Ariana poked her head out of the dressing room door, mouth slightly agape. Is everything. Okay, yes. I'm just an idiot. Ariana, you are not. And you are not worthless either, she replied firmly. I didn't mean to listen in and I don't know what has been going on, but please don't think like that. It hurts to hear you say that. I'm sure Bennett feels the same way, maybe this is a good thing. He deserves someone better. I'm so immature. Everyone is a little immature. Henley. Especially when it comes to our feelings. I smiled wryly. I can't even deal with being told I'm not good enough for someone who doesn't get hurt by that, she shot back. But she closed the door to the fitting room a little more roughly than she should have. Henley, what are you doing? You're not the type to beat yourself up like this. You're not good enough for Bennett. Why? Who can decide that? His mother doesn't know you, she interjected. Just prove to her you're good enough for Bennett. Personally, I think you're too good for him. Even if this is just some fake relationship. Where's that feisty spirit of yours? Her brown eyes bored into mine as if daring me to talk back. I felt my shoulders relax. You're right, I know. Now go chase that man down and talk this out. I nodded. Right, Bennett was my first priority. I couldn't let him think this was his fault. I couldn't let this contract end. Thanks, Ariana. In only my socks and the dress I tried on, I hurried out of the waiting room and back into the main room. A quick survey of the room showed no signs of Bennett. Sebastian was chatting with the young man at the register, his back leaning against the counter. Where's Bennett? I asked him. He just went outside, he replied, frowning a little. Did something happen? He looked this. Kind of, I said and then headed to the door. Excuse me. I heard the salesman call after me. You can't leave in that. I ignored him and exited the store. The sun had set leaving the sidewalk slit up only by fluorescent street lights and the little bit of light seeping out from the stores. The pavement was chilly and I bounced a little on the balls of my feet as I looked around in hope that Bennett was still nearby. When I couldn't spot anyone, I decided to head back to the parking lot where the car was. He wouldn't leave, would he? A part of me thought he was oblivious enough to leave us stranded, 
but the better part reasoned he was smart enough not to do that. But it wasn't a time to question Bennett's intelligence, anyway. As soon as I set off, a loud voice sounded from somewhere around me. I jumped a bit and then recognized the voice as Bennett's. Rounding the corner of a section of buildings, I found him standing in the little hidden area between them. He was partially concealed by the shadows and I felt a little relieved knowing I wouldn't have to try and hunt him down. I know she's there, he was saying and I realized he was on his cell phone. Give the phone to her right now, her. Did he mean his mother? Bennett, I called, closing the distance between us. Wait a moment, he glanced at me, eyes tight. Not now, Henley, even in this situation, I felt a little irritation at his tone. Who are you talking to? Your mother, Henry, I will fire you if you do not put her on, he warned the recipient of the phone call. What was he doing? Trying to start an argument with his mother? Over me? I wasn't worth that. I couldn't let him do that. Before he had a chance to react, I snatched the phone from his hand and hit the in button multiple times. What are you doing? I demanded. Give me my phone. I moved it behind my back. No. If you're calling your mother to yell at her about the situation, I'll keep it until you calm down. You should want me to do this. I overreacted earlier. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have taken it out on you. I really didn't mean it. I apologized, lowering my gaze. Please forgive me. He let out a frustrated noise. You shouldn't be the one apologizing here. I pursed my lips as I looked back up at him. Yes, I should. Hearing you say you're not good enough for me sucks probably as much as you thinking I thought the same way about you. I don't want you to feel like that, Bennett. It's my fault for it's no one's fault. Yeah, your mother surprised me, but I shouldn't have let her get me so easily. I don't even know why she got to me so easily. I don't think I'm worthless. Please don't cause trouble over me. I know I'm pretty awesome, so don't worry, Sol she did say something. He asked, ignoring my attempt at lightening the mood. I gripped my teeth a little. Did he only hear what he wanted to hear? Let's just drop it, Bennett. I didn't come outside to argue with you. I can't just leave this alone you can and you will. I cut him off firmly. This isn't something to have a family issue about. He folded his arms over his chest. Just hand me the phone and go back inside. You're barely wearing anything. I stood up a little straighter. I won't, Henley. I don't feel good about this. Let me rectify it. All right, that's all I needed to hear. Problem solved. Do you feel better? He gave me an exasperated look. No. My mother shouldn't be able to just do as she pleases with my relationships and she should know that. We're not even really dating, I said sharply. It's not worth creating a problem over a fake relationship. In six months, this won't even be an issue. I'll be gone and your mother won't have to worry. Please don't say anything to her. I waited for his response, but he stayed silent, fists clenching. This is the way you wanted it to be too, isn't it? Your mother knows of me now and I take it she doesn't really like me. So after this whole thing is over and done with she'll probably be more than happy that we broke up and give you all the time you need to find someone you actually care about. I tried trying to put a cheerful note in my tone. It actually works out perfectly. Oh, his expression didn't change. I said I would cancel the contract. My heart fell a little. Why? Because of me? I don't want that, Bennett. You don't want us to cancel the contract. No, I told him, shaking my head. I'm not going to let this happen again. I was just frustrated. Remember what I said earlier. Next time your mother sees me I'll make sure there's nothing for her to nitpick at me about. He pulled a hand through his hair, sighing. That's exactly it, Henley. I don't want you to feel you have to pretend you're someone you're not anymore. It's part of our contract, I pointed out. You wrote it yourself, that's and I knew what I'd be getting into when I agreed to this. No, you didn't. That's why you think I make you feel worthless, he said. You don't. I snapped at him frustrated. I told you. It was just a moment of insecurity. I don't care what your mother said, so please don't make it a big deal. He narrowed his eyes. 
you're angry at the wrong thing here. Why are you arguing with me over this? We should cancel the contract and just, I'm the one who had the problem here and now I don't. I'm telling you right now that I don't want to end this contract, so don't to convince me to end it. My voice echoed through the small alleyway and I clamped my mouth shut, realizing I was getting too worked up. I fidgeted for a moment, eyes anywhere but Bennett's face. This wasn't what I'd wanted to happen. Why was I fighting with him? I really wasn't helping out the whole immature aspect about myself like this. Why don't you want to cancel it? Why? I repeated, looking up at him. He held my gaze for a few seconds, dark eyes smoldering into mine and I lost my train of thought. Because, because, the money? No, I said immediately. It wasn't because of the money. And I didn't want Bennett to think that was the only reason why I wanted to help him. Then why, what reason could I give him? What was the reason I wanted to continue it so badly? Was it solely because I was too stubborn to let his mother get to me? It was probably best to let both her and Bennett go. He irked me to no end and sometimes it was hard to keep up with him. But I found myself not wanting that to end. I didn't want to let Bennett go. In this whole world the number of people I cared about, I could count on one hand and Bennett had become one of them. I, I started, feeling my mouth go dry. You what, Fenley? You better give me a good reason. You were so against this at first. Why do you want to help me now, tell him, Henley? I don't like going back on my word, I babbled. I said I'd help you and I will. Something like this won't stop me. Let's just forget this happened and go back to how we were before. We're getting to be pretty good friends, aren't we? I kind of want to rub our relationship in your mother's face. Ha ha ha. I kept laughing for a few more seconds and then slapped a hand over my mouth to make it stop when his lips didn't even twitch. You're a psycho. I scolded myself. My cheeks grew hot and I wanted to shove my face into the brick wall we were standing next to. What the hell was I thinking? I didn't want Bennett to go. I couldn't tell him that. It would give him the wrong idea and he'd definitely cancel the contract. He'd probably run 30 miles in the other direction because no way in hell Bennett would ever end up with someone like me. He'd stated it right at the beginning we couldn't have feelings for each other. And I didn't have feelings for him. It was Bennett. We were just friends. I peeked at him and he stared back at me, his lips pressed in a straight line. Was he really not going to budge? Maybe I had to go for a dirtier tactic. Also, I wouldn't have anywhere to live, but got him. He relaxed his posture and let out a long breath. You're right. I understand, so you won't cancel this contract. He nodded. I felt a weight lifted off of my shoulders. Okay, good. Let's forget this even happened then. It's embarrassing. I don't usually fish for compliments, so I feel slightly mortified right now compliments suddenly it seemed to hit him his eyes widened wait you just wanted a compliment from me having him put it that way made me cringe you didn't know his face flushed no that aside i'm adding one condition to our agreement what's that from now on there's no interaction between you and my mother unless i am present i shrugged that's fine with me I mean, I didn't even plan to see her that time in the first place, go back inside and get changed. I don't want the store thinking you're stealing from them, was that his try at being light-hearted. Like mother like son, huh? You're coming with me right, in a minute, I add him warily. Should I hold on to your phone then, he frowned as he held out his hand. No, I'll take it. I won't be calling my mother. I won't risk my position for a fake relationship, and you shouldn't, I agreed, but I couldn't help feeling slightly disappointed in his words. Which didn't make sense, because I was the one who had told him not to make a big deal out of it. I didn't understand my emotions. We both stood there for another moment, sharing the silence between us. I chewed on my bottom lip, unsure for a moment. We are we really okay now? It wasn't a huge issue. But I felt like Bennett took things further than they had to go. Eventually, I turned away from him. If he said things were okay now, I'd believe him. Henley, he started. I paused, looking over my back at him. What? 
You should get that dress. I'm sorry I didn't say so earlier, but it really suits you. I cracked into a smile. Thanks, Bennett. He didn't smile back. Bennett's POV. Over the years, I'd been with a handful of girls presented to me by my mother. They usually had one thing in common, greed. Greedy for the highest fashions, greedy for attention, greedy for the wealth of the air of a great hotel. I'd cared for them about as much as they cared for me. But we also had one thing in common, trying to appease my mother. That's how I lived my life. I was so scared of losing everything, I could give up anything. Money was more important to me than cherished relationships. I didn't care what I did, who I hurt, what I ruined, provided that at the end of the day I'd come out on top. But suddenly everything was different. Henley was someone I didn't want to hurt. She was someone I didn't want to ruin. She suddenly because someone I didn't want my mother to ever touch. I didn't know when it had happened. At first, she was simply an impecunious young woman I needed in order to complete my ruse. I could have cared less about how she felt. But now, now I cared more about how she felt than that idiotic, ludicrous plan. And now she cared more about that idiotic, ludicrous plan than how she felt. I didn't understand it and it was driving me crazy. Why didn't she want to end the contract? If we ended it, my mother couldn't say another word to her. If marrying a stranger was what it took, I would gladly do it just so I wouldn't ever have to see that defeated expression on her face ever again. Why don't you want to cancel it? I asked because no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't understand. My question seemed to take her by surprise as her pretty eyes grew wide. Why? Because, because, the money? I asked because I couldn't help it. Everyone wanted money. How could I expect her to be different, no matter how much I wanted it to be so? No, she responded quickly. Then why, you what, Henley? You better give me a good reason. You were so against this at first. Why do you want to help me now? I demanded, the frustration I was feeling slipping into my tone. It didn't have to be like this. There wasn't any need for a contract. It didn't have to be an act. I don't like going back on my word. She burst her, her voice high-pitched. I said I'd help you and I will. Something like this won't stop me. Let's just forget this happened and go back to how we were before. We're getting to be pretty good friends, aren't we? I kind of want to rub our relationship in your mother's face. Ha ha ha, I swallowed. It felt like ice had flooded my veins. What were you expecting? An even voice questioned. What was I expecting? This always was and always had been just a job for Henley. That's what I should have expected. It's exactly as the contract said. The contract that I'd written. Henley just seemed to have a great work ethic. It wasn't about me at all. Also, I wouldn't have anywhere to live, she added quietly. Not for the first time that day, I felt guilty. Ending the contract to her meant more than just never seeing me again. It meant losing a place to live. It meant losing necessary money. It meant Henley appearing weak to my mother and Henley knew that. I was making it about myself. As usual, I sighed. You're right. I understand, so you won't cancel this contract, I nodded. She looked visibly relieved. Okay, good. Let's forget this even happened then. It's embarrassing. I don't usually fish for compliments, so I feel slightly mortified right now. She wasn't the only one. What kind of fool hired someone to be their pretend girlfriend and then expected them to want to be their actual girlfriend? Then her words hit me. Compliments I echoed. Wait. You just wanted a compliment from me. She drew back a little, making a face. You didn't know all this could have been avoided just by a simple compliment. I couldn't even realize that. Henley didn't care what my mother thought about her. She cared what I thought about her. No, I answered. That aside, I'm adding one condition to our agreement. What's that? From now on there's no interaction between you and my mother unless I am present. She shrugged. That's fine with me. I mean, I didn't even plan to see her that time in the first place. I hadn't planned it either. It was time to change the locks for good. Go back inside and get changed. 
I don't want the store thinking you're stealing from them. She sucked in her cheeks as if she wanted to talk back. You're coming with me right in a minute. Should I hold on to your phone then? I held out my hand for my phone. No, I'll take it. I won't be calling my mother. I won't risk my position for a fake relationship. The words stung my tongue and I regretted it instantly. It wasn't Henley's fault I felt rejected. I couldn't take my feelings out on her just because we felt differently toward each other. I may have been scum, but I didn't want to drop that low. I thought Henley said something in response, but the ringing in my ears was too loud to hear over. I just stared at her, unable to process anything. As bad as it was, I wasn't used to the feeling of not acquiring the things I coveted. Finally, her face fell and she turned away and I felt my mouth fall open. Henley, she glanced back. What you should get that dress, I told her. I'm sorry I didn't say so earlier, but it really suits you, she grinned. Thanks, Bennett I couldn't find it in me to return it. She noticed and I caught her expression falling again as she turned away from me, heading back to the store. I fell back against the brick wall, closing my eyes and taking a deep breath. If Henley wanted to settle the problem like this, I'd let her. I couldn't become another problem in her life. Not with everything else going on as well. I couldn't act like a petulant child. In six months, this won't even be an issue. I'll be gone and your mother won't have to worry. I scowled a bit. Was it really that easy for her to say that? Would she toss me away? Sever our ties with looking back? How would she know what the relationship between us would be five months from now? I paused. I still had five months with Henley. Maybe. I unlocked my phone and clicked on Henry's contact. He picked up after the first train. Yes, Mr. Calloway. Henry, is my mother leaving town anytime soon? He hesitated. She is leaving for California on the 17th. Come to my house on the 17th. Do you know how to change a lock? I asked him. Change a lock? Why if not, you have the week to learn. I expect you no later than noon, Bennett that's all, I said, quickly pulling my phone away from my ear. It wasn't quick enough though. Mr. Callaway, he called frantically. While I have you on the phone I need you to come back into work tomorrow. You have a lot of paperwork to do still, I frowned. Hadn't I done enough today? I still had to bring Henley back to her apartment to clean things up. We'll see, Mr. Callaway, Henry, I started. His voice instantly quieted. Sorry for threatening to fire you earlier threatening. Oh, it's okay. No worries. You don't need to apologize. I know you must be stressed with all that's going on. He chattered happily. Yeah, thanks. I'll see you then. See you, he responded. Then I heard a gasp. Hey, wait. I quickly hit the end button multiple times to make sure the call disconnected. Phew, skimping out on work again, the sound of Sebastian's voice surprised me. I twisted around and saw him walking toward me, eyebrows cocked. Are you okay? Why are you asking? Something happened between you and Henley, right? Even if Sebastian was my best friend, I didn't feel like discussing this. We've settled it, he nodded. I'll take your word. Then. Don't be too discouraged by your mother, though. We'll think of something to help Henley out. I folded my arms over my chest. I'd forgotten just how sharp Sebastian was. I can handle it, um, what's that noise? You don't think I can? He gave me a one-shoulder shrug. I'm just saying I'm available if need be, her. I caught his eye and he gave me a challenging look. Since when were he and Henley on such good terms? What had I missed while I was at work? What did he want with of course? I could always help Henley out in my own way. Fine. I relented. I knew Sebastian's methods and I wouldn't let him use them on Henley. Maybe he could be useful. Perfect. Let's head back in. I think the girls are getting antsy. And I think Henley said she needed to buy underwear. Would you like to come with us to Victoria's Secret? Maybe choose something sexy for her. You seem to know her size better than her. I almost choked my own spit. W-what? He smirked. Pervert. 
the back of my head grew hot and I debated on doing some shopping of my own because I knew there was no way I could accompany Henley without imaging her and everything she looked at. Henley's POV. For the next week, I felt Bennett tiptoeing around me. He woke up in the morning before me and rushed off to work before I could greet him and he came home later than me, heading straight into his room before I could even speak his name. Even when we finally made it back to my old apartment so we could clean up, he stood aside by the door and watched silently as Sebastian, Ariana, and I packed my things into boxes and trash bags. I shivered just thinking about my apartment. It didn't feel right anymore. It didn't feel like home anymore. Which was all the more reason to be grateful to Bennett for letting me stay here. Which was all the more reason for me to find an apartment quickly and get out if I was making him uncomfortable. Annoyed, I slammed a coffee cup into the sink a little harder than I'd meant to. Ariana jumped from beside me, letting out a startled squeak. Sorry, I apologized sheepishly. Things still awkward between you and Bennett, she guessed. I don't know. I can't even talk to him. I thought things were okay, but now I don't know, maybe he's just really busy with work, she offered. It was possible, but if Bennett had so much free time before this week, where did all this work come from? It felt more to me like he just wanted out of the house. She suddenly gasped. Oh yeah. Did you ever get to me, Cullens? I turned toward her. No, I forgot. What did you say Wilson said again? He said he had something to show you. I think it might be something from the security cameras when my chest suddenly fell tight. Why? We've already seen the footage of my brother leaving the place. Did he find something new? Is it important? Ariana shook her head, arms crossed over her chest. I'm not sure. He wouldn't tell me about it. I think you should go see him. I'll go today after work. I couldn't believe I'd forgotten about going back to McAllen's. It had been over a week already. Was he still waiting for me? Did he still have the video? After that, work passed by very slowly. My fingers kept twitching and I felt a heavy weight in my chest. I couldn't almost hear the clock ticking every second. The minute we closed the shop I tossed off my apron and clocked out, urging Ariana out the door so we could lock it. Let me come with you she said. Okay, I agreed. Maybe I'd feel more at ease with her. I'll drive though. Might as well use up some miles on this beast while I still have a chance. Ariana and I both looked at the rental car Bennett had given me. It was a Dodge Charger, sleek, black, and beautiful. This way I could drive myself around and park it at Bennett's house. I loved my clunker, but it was best to leave it here in the parking lot for now. McAllen's pub and bar was located in the downtown area. Since it was a Friday evening, the place was packed by the time we arrived. Boisterous shouting by a bunch of men playing pool greeted us as we entered. Huge tea, versus were blaring sports or the news or even parks and rec I grimaced. While this wasn't the place for me, my brother fit in here fine. Ariana on the other hand, I wasn't sure. She came here all the time though. Wilson was behind the bar, speaking to the bartender. I went up to him and smiled, waving a bit. Hi Wilson. It's been a while. Welcome back, Ariana and Henley. I was starting to think you weren't coming, he said, raising his voice slightly to speak over the noise. Sorry. It's been a hectic week. And month, he nodded sympathetically. Have you heard from your brother yet? Not lately. Why? I think he's onto something. Let's go into my office so we can talk better Ariana and I exchanged surprise looks and we followed Wilson into the much quieter room of his office. He took a seat at his desk and Ariana and I sat on the opposite side in the leather chairs. I sat straight up, trying to keep my breathing even. What's that video you want to show me? I asked. It's the same video as before. The one where we see your brother leaving and entering the parking lot. What about it? Well, your brother's new lawyer requested the footage to take a look at it and he pointed out something we hadn't picked up on before. I don't know why we didn't notice, my brother had hired a new lawyer. I remembered he'd said he'd wanted to, but I didn't know he actually went through with it. Still, I leaned forward in my seat, feeling my heart pound against my chest. 
What? Is it something that can prove his innocence? Wilson's lips curved down a little. I can't say for sure. I haven't been told anything. I just thought I'd show you the tape and see if you could recognize anything. Let me pull it up. I grasped my knees with my hands, eyes trained on the computer screen. Once the familiar video was pulled up, Ariana scooted closer to the monitor. I followed suit, eyes searching. I spotted my brother immediately. Unlike me, his hair was dark brown and shaggy. He wore a black button-up that night and a dark pair of jeans. You could make it out well on the camera. We were so focused on your brother while watching this, we didn't look at the surroundings. Look at the corner here, he tapped on the bottom, left side of the monitor. Does he look familiar? I moved my face or closer to the screen, staring at the stranger he pointed to. His back was to the camera, but he looked a lot like. Oh my god, oh my god, Ariana repeated, apparently coming to the same realization I had. I keep thinking, how could we have missed this, Wilson said. How did no one notice, I stared at the screen, my mouth open. The person with his back to the camera, he looked just like my brother from behind. He wore almost the same outfit black shirt, dark jeans. His hair was shaggy and dark. Even their builds were the same. It was almost a spitting replica. The only difference I could note was that this man was wearing two gold watches on the same wrist. My brother never wore watches. Ariana's hand gripped mine and I turned to her, seeing her eyes starting to water. What if this is who actually stole the car and crashed it? What if it wasn't your brother? My eyes roamed back to the monitor screen. I couldn't pull my gaze away from the back of that stranger's head. It almost felt familiar. Was it because he had the same appearance as my brother? Or was it something else? Was it someone I knew? Suddenly I sucked in a deep breath of air and realized I'd stopped breathing. Ariana chewed on her fingernails, a habit I'd been trying to get her to break. But I couldn't scold her now. How did no one notice? I managed to get out. How did no one notice this guy looks just like my brother? And who wears two watches on the same wrist? The anger came fast. My chest heaved and I balled my hands into tight fists, my fingernails digging into my skin it. Wilson shook his head. I have no clue. So many people have looked over this footage. Maybe we were searching for something that wasn't so obvious. Everyone overlooked I felt thick. I'd seen this tape over 20 times. How could I have not noticed this before? How had my brother's lawyer not noticed? It didn't make sense. Henley, calm down. Now we have something to work with. Your brother's new lawyer seems to know what he's doing. Ariana spoke gently. She was right. This was more than we ever had before. Letting out a shaky breath, I slumped back into my seat. This was something new. Maybe my brother was innocent. Maybe my brother was innocent. I can't believe he didn't tell me this right away. I think they're trying to keep this quiet, Wilson said. He told me not to mention it to anyone but you. I feel something fishy might be happening here. The back of the stranger's head stood out on the video. I couldn't shake the strange feeling I was having. I felt like I knew that person. I didn't know how, but somewhere inside me I knew he seemed familiar. Suddenly the door to the bar burst open and an employee with an ashen face stuck his head in. Sorry for interrupting, sir, but some dude flipped over the pool table. Wilson groaned. Again, again, I said. Now even more than before, I couldn't imagine tiny little Ariana hanging out in a place like this. But definitely my brother. Sorry guys, I have to get out there. If anything new develops, I'll let you know, he said, standing up from his chair. Ariana and I followed suit, saying our goodbyes. As we were headed back to my car, my phone started ringing. Then its name flashed on the screen. Hello, are you home? I'm not at your place yet. No. Why? Please head back now. Henry will be there shortly and one of us needs to be there. And you can't. I'm busier than you. I purse my lips. Oh, are you? Please just meet him here. I have to go. Wait a second. Who's Henry? Bennett? Bennett I pulled my phone away from my face, seeing he disconnected the call. I ground my teeth together. 
He'd barely spoken to me all week, and this is what I'd gotten. Ariana grinned a bit. It's like true love. I don't think you should want to beat the crap out of the person you love. Huh. That's very true. Anyway, I guess I have to head back to the house and meet this guy Henry, or whatever. Let's head back to the shop. The ride back to coffee house was quiet. Both of us were probably consumed by our thoughts. I know I was. My brother was spending time in jail when he should have been drinking Aunt McAllen's with his friends. If it turned out he'd been innocent all along, my hands clenched on the steering wheel. After dropping Ariana off, I went straight back to Bennett's. There was an unfamiliar car parked in the driveway. I parked next to it and cautiously walked to the front door, afraid of who would be waiting. A young man in a black suit that looked a little too big for him was standing on the front steps. He had a tool case in one hand and a medium-sized cardboard box in the other. His head was down and his back faced me. I didn't think he heard me approaching so I cleared my throat. He jumped, letting out a frightened sound. Turning around, he lifted the tool case up defensively. Curly black hair framed his face and he squinted at me, his eyes crunching up behind think black glasses. You must be Henley, he said, relaxing his posture. Sorry, do you surprise me? I smiled. Sorry, I'm Henley. You must be Henry. Yes. Nice to meet you. I'm Mr. Calloway's secretary. An assistant I immediately felt pity for this poor man. I'm so sorry, my response caught him off guard and he froze up. Then he laughed bashfully. It's not really a bad job. Sometimes, I grin at him. It's hard to be near him sometimes. I can't even imagine working for him. Why are you here? He held up the toolbox in his hand. He wants me to install new locks while his mother is away. New locks. I believe it is so his mother cannot come in without his permission again. It was never a problem before, but I think Mr. Calloway is thinking about you. Meeting with Mrs. Calloway isn't something most people want to do, I could definitely agree with that. So he's making you change the locks? He can't do it, well, since he personally requested me to do it. I don't mind, Bennett was going through all this trouble just so his mom couldn't meet me randomly again. Or rather, Bennett was making Henry go through the trouble, but the point remained. Do you want some help? I asked, feeling a little like it was my fault he had to do this. His eyes widened. No, I'll be fine by myself. I think Bennett, oops, sorry, Mr. Calloway just wanted you to be around so I can tell you the passcode he was putting in an electrical lock. Was this guy a jack of all trades or something? I'll help you. I don't know much, but just tell me what to do. I'll be bored anyway. If you insist, I'll take your help. I'm just watching a YouTube video on how to do it anyway. Maybe a second pair of hands would be useful, a YouTube video. Suddenly I was feeling more nervous about this. But it was too late to take back my word. Since it was dark out, the only light we had to work with was the floodlights in the back and the main light in the front. Fortunately, there was only two doors in Bennett's house and the video on YouTube was surprisingly helpful, even with all the electric jargon. How long have you been working for Bennett? I asked Henry. For Bennett alone. Only a couple years. But I've been with the company for about seven years. I used to be Mrs. Calloway's secretary. I whistled lowly. That sucks. He hesitated, as if not wanting to speak bad about her. It's gotten better, he admitted. Do you like it? I prefer Bennett over his mother. Why did you switch? Bennett asked me to work for him after he was forced into the position of the next CEO. I frowned a little. He was forced? Yes. He had no choice after Lee he abruptly shut his mouth, his eyes widening. My ears perked up. Me? What about Lee? Please don't mention I spoke of him. I won't. I promise. Was Bennett's brother supposed to take over the company? Bennett hadn't wanted to. Henley? Yeah, I hope you can help him. Who? Bennett Henry put down the drill he was using, his face turning somber. I think he can't get over Lee. He doesn't show it, but I know he's struggling. I know he didn't want his life to become like this. Please help him move on. If he's letting you stay in this house, it means he's finally letting someone in again. 
I think you can help him out of whatever is holding him back. Do you understand what I'm saying? I tilted my head to the side a little. Kind of. He stuck because of what happened to Lee. I'm sure Lee's bedroom is the same as it was while he was still here. Please help Bennett find his freedom. Help Bennett find his freedom. From what? The serious look on Henry's face made my heart heavy. I couldn't imagine losing Brandon and I couldn't imagine how Bennett felt when he lost his brother. Just what was Bennett's life actually like? And how could I help him? Bennett's POV, MR. Callaway, wake up. Your mother would like to speak to you. I lifted my head up from my desk and stared blearily at Henry, who was standing in front of my desk, his cell phone in hand. My mother? Suddenly more alert, I straightened and cleared my throat. Why didn't she call me first? He quickly muted his phone. I think she knows you wouldn't answer. Is she back? No. She says she has something to tell you. I hesitated. Had she already found out I'd changed the locks? Or maybe the security cameras were finally shut off and she found out about it. Begrudgingly, I took the phone from Henry and unmuted it. Yes, mother. Were you sleeping? No, I lied. Did you finish your work for the day? I glanced at the pile of paperwork on my desk. Plans for new locations. Ideas for new promotions. Severance plans for the one employee that got fired in California. A paper requesting an updated OSHA certification. A payroll incident our accountant wanted me to double check on. And God knows what else was under the mess of papers that I hadn't gotten to yet. Did you hear about California won the earthquake or the employee being fired? I heard both. I cut her off, feeling a headache coming on. They had the lowest KPI of all our hotels. Have you called them to talk about it yet? I glared at Henry, who held up his hands defensively. This was why I didn't answer my mother's phone calls. Why should we tell them something they already know? They're probably already stressed about it, I will do it then. You're obviously feeling sympathetic toward them, even though they're causing damage to our company. I curled my free hand into a fist. Fine. Please go right ahead and handle it yourself. Is that all? I have work to do. That's not the reason I called you. Michael Angelo's is your favorite restaurant, correct? She asked needlessly. She knew everything about my life whether I wanted to her or not. Be there at 8 o'clock sharp tomorrow. Dress nicely. Why? I asked warily. If it was another meeting with an old, balding company head I swear to God the daughter of Cecil Castrilli would like to meet you, so I've set up a date with you for her. This is a good chance to get on her family's good side. Don't mess it up. A date, I said. I have a girlfriend. No, you don't. You have a girl whom you are dating, who I haven't even approved of, that's not and there will be no problem with you meeting Cecil's daughter. You will be there at 8 o'clock. You will not cancel on her. You will treat her properly and ask for a second date at the end of the night. I resisted the urge to hurl my phone across the room. She'd set me up on a date. This wasn't part of our deal. You said you wanted time to date more on your own. You didn't say I couldn't suggest people. What's wrong with Henley? I demanded. If you want me to point out a problem, I could start with her attitude, what attitude? You met her once and I have no doubts you said more than a few rude things to her. I'm not asking you to marry this girl. I'm just asking you to go on a date with her. My mother snapped into the phone. You can keep dating your other girl, but ultimately I will see who is suitable for the company. I fell into silence. My mother never asked anything. It was either do it or face the consequences. I knew this was an order not a request. It didn't matter to her that I was already dating someone. Maybe our whole deal didn't even matter to her. But how could she ask me to see another girl when I already had Henley? Yes, we were faking it, but it still didn't feel right. Mother, I started, but she spoke over me. Do you want to become the CEO of our company or not? Things like this are sometimes required. My desire to argue back was fierce, but I bit my tongue. The worst thing about my mother was she knew how to end an argument. I had to become the CEO, even if it meant going on an unwelcome date. Bennett, are you listening? Her voice sounded impatient. Yes, I heard you. I'll be there. Very well. I'll be coming back in a few days. 
I expect to hear good things about you from Cecil. I pull the phone away and hit the in button, giving Henry a deadly look. He smiled awkwardly, carefully reaching for his phone. If that's all, you can go home early, I told him. His face grew white. Are you firing me? I didn't even have the effort to find it comedic. No, I'm leaving as well. But, he trailed off, his expression turning soft. Is everything okay? You're my assistant, not my friend, I found myself saying brusquely. His mouth fell open slightly and I placed a hand on my forehead, pressing hard. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that, I couldn't take out my frustrations on Henry. I wasn't my mother. He scratched the back of his neck and I hated how awkward I made him feel. I could try to get you out of it, I shook my head. That would just piss her off. I'll go, what about Henley? She doesn't have to know, I said, locking eyes with him. Henley probably wouldn't care anyway. She was playing along like she was supposed to. I was the one that almost broke the rules. Maybe the state would set my head straight. I didn't want Henley to be uncomfortable around me. Henry's face told me he didn't agree with my way of thinking, but I ignored it. I'll be sure not to mention it, then. I'm going to finish up the preparations for tomorrow before I leave, I nodded, feeling drained. Thank you. As soon as Henry exited the room, I leaned back in my chair and closed my eyes. On days like these, I could understand why Lee did what he had. How had he put up with it as long as he did? Twenty-nine years. Twenty-nine years of this feeling of suffocation, of being unable to control your own life. Why wouldn't you end it? I felt my body tense. No, I couldn't think like that. The role of the CEO was something I had to do. I could handle the crushing paperwork and I could handle a few dates with a lackluster young woman. I couldn't fail at this. I couldn't lose my position. What was a stake? I didn't even want to think about it. I couldn't fail my brother. I couldn't let his sacrifice go to waste. Damn it, Lay, I muttered shoving myself away from my desk. It was moments like these I wished I still had my big brother around. To stand up to my mother for me like he'd always done. To reassure me everything would work out in my favor eventually. My phone buzzed and I looked at it, a message from my mother glowing on the screen. After opening it, I let out a scoff. There was no doubt that it was an image of the girl I was being set up with. Short, coffee-colored hair framed her pointy face her eyes sharp and challenging. I recognized that look. It was the same one I used when I looked down upon someone. Another text buzzed. Carolise, 25. Get her orchids, not roses. Went to Harvard. Do not wear jeans. I locked my phone and resisted the urge to roll my eyes. I didn't need spark notes for a date. Especially considering I didn't care for said date. Then an idea hit me. Henry. I called. Five seconds later he popped his head in, glasses sitting crookedly on his face. Yes sir, prepare a dozen roses for me tomorrow. By five o'clock he gave me a confused look. Your mother requested a dozen orchids already, I felt the corner of my lip rise. If I was the one dumped, my mother couldn't complain. She made a mistake. I'll need roses all right, I will put the order in. Henry stepped back out and I began to pack up checking the time. It was still early. Maybe for once, I could catch Henley before she ate dinner and we could cook something together. Or maybe just head out to McAllen's or something. It would be nice to treat her out. Hopefully, she didn't mind a little rain, because it had been drizzling all day. I smiled at the thought, picking my phone up and starting a text to her. Before I hit send I paused, my face falling. Would she even agree to go to dinner with me? Would she think it was strange? I hadn't seen much of her recently. Maybe it was because I'd been catching up on work, but now that I was thinking about it, she could have also been avoiding me. My phone began buzzing in my hand and I almost dropped it, startled to see Henley's name on the screen. I swiped to answer it and placed it against my ear. Henley, no, a different voice answered. This is Ariana, Ariana? Why was she using Henley's phone? Where's Henley, um? We kind of got in a car accident that felt like my body temperature dropped 10 degrees. 
a car accident. My grip on the phone tightened and I felt my chest contract. A thousand questions jumped to my tongue. Is she alright? Is everything okay? Is she alright? Was it bad? Are you alright? Is Henley alright? How did it happen? Please not my brother. It wasn't bad, Mr. Calloway, she said quickly, mistaking my silence for anger. Is she okay? I asked Pascilly. Why was Ariana talking to me? Why wasn't Henley the one talking? Ariana was okay. Henley had to be okay too. There must have been some other reason for Ariana calling. Henley was fine. Yeah, she's okay. I felt like I could breathe again, but my heart still felt like it was shaking. Or maybe it was me. Did I scare you? Ariana asked softly. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have started like that. Henley's just kind of freaked out right now. It's your rental. She's reporting the accident to the police now. Oh wait, she just hung up. Here take the phone Henley. Henley, I said immediately. She was okay? I needed to hear her voice. Yeah, it's me. Do you ever say hello? It was funny how sometimes things that irritated you could sometimes soothe you. Case in point, Henley's sarcasm. Using your name is a form of greeting, I returned. Comma, right. But anyway, like Ariana told you, I accidentally ran into one of those railroad crossing signs. The front right of the car is a little bent. I'm really sorry, Bennett. I know it's a rental and under your insurance. I'll pay the costs, don't worry about it, I said, yanking at the tie around my neck. It felt suffocating. Where are you? I'll come pick you up. The car is drivable, I think. I can take it down to the rental place. I already notified the police, but they said someone will come later to look at the pole. Where are you? I repeated. I'll have Henry bring the car back to the rental place. She sighed lightly. I'm sorry. You're mad. Aren't you? I'm like five minutes from your house. That first set of railroad tracks down your street. I can, I'm on my way, I said before hanging up. I shot out of my office and caught Henry just as he stepped into the elevator. Henley crashed the car. Can you bring it back to the rental place? He turned to me, eyes wide. Is she okay? She's fine. Are you okay? You look sick. I'm okay. A sharp pain shot through my head and I grimaced, placing my free hand on top of the area. Henry stayed quiet and for once I wished he were talking. I couldn't keep memories from flooding my mind. Lee's been in a car accident. Bennett, why weren't you with him? Bennett, he's not going to make it. Bennett, you've got to take over now. Bennett. Don't let your brother down. Bennett. Bennett, I snapped out of it, finding Henry peering at me worriedly. Let's just go. I snapped at him. A dull ache was starting to form behind my eyes and I knew the migraine was going to be a bad one. To keep myself focused, I decided to drive us to where Henley was waiting. I tore through town to get on the highway, weaving through the traffic until I reached my exit. Henry was clinging onto the grip assistant handle, which I thought was a little excessive. My car had impeccable handling and I was an excellent driver. The rental was easy to locate the front of it hugging the pole to the railroad crossing sign. Henley stood by the car, huddled together with her friend, her arms folded over chest. That last bit of tension left my body the moment I laid eyes on her hunched up form. I parked the car and Henry and I both got out. Bennett Henley started as I marched up to her. Her cobalt eyes searched mine, as if she was trying to gauge what my reaction might be. As she shifted, her hair slid off her shoulder and onto her chest, damp with the rain. I opened my mouth to say something, anything. I didn't know your hair had ridden it, she blinked at me. Looking down, she picked at a lock of it. Oh, yeah, when it gets wet it kind of looks copper Why? I see. I responded, reaching out and taking the lock from her and letting it slide between my fingers. It felt grounding. A faint blush spread across her cheeks and she shuffled her feet. Sorry, she said again. I shook my head. It's fine. Henry will take care of it. I'll take you home. She chewed on her lower lip, eyes traveling over to Henry. Sorry Henry. Henry waved a hand in dismissal. It's okay. I'm glad you weren't hurt, 
I shot him a petulant look to which he returned with a bewildered one. He was glad Henley wasn't hurt. I should have said that to her first. I don't think this will affect your insurance too much. Ariana spoke up, her lips curved up the slightest bit. We slid on the tracks because they were slippery I'm not worried about that, she stared pointedly at Henley. I can't tell, I cleared my throat and turned away from her. I don't know why you were waiting outside the car when it's raining. Get in mine and try not to get the seats too wet. Henley pursed her lips as she stepped away from the rental. Maybe I should go with Henry, we're going home, I said decisively. Her face contorted into a way that made it seem like she wanted to argue, but then her posture relaxed and she gestured to Ariana and the pair made their way to my car. Henry said his goodbyes and took the keys to the rental. Tell them I crashed the car, I said lowly. The rental was under my name and I didn't feel like going through the trouble of multiple insurances or being sued, though I doubted that would ever happen. And also, Henley probably felt stressed out about it enough. Henry nodded. I'll get it settled thank you Henry, no problem. I'll call you later and let you know what happens. I walked back to my car, sliding into the driver's seat. Both Henley and Ariana were sitting in the back seat, dead silent. I'm not a taxi driver, I said pointedly. Henley sighed and began pulling herself through the middle gap between the two front seats. I leaned away from her, eyeing my leather. Watch your feet. Why are you climbing through? She carefully lifted herself over the middle console and somehow managed not to touch her feet onto any of the leather. Once settled, she snapped on her belt buckle. I stared at her. She stared out the window. I swallowed thickly. What was up with her? Was she mad at me? She was the one who crashed my rental car. Was she embarrassed? Did she still feel awkward about the whole fiasco at the outlets? Ariana, where do you need to go? I spoke up. First thing first. My car is at coffee house you can just drive me there. I shifted the car into drive and made a U-turn, heading back the way I came. The rain was starting to fall heavier now and the only noise in my car was the squeaking of the windshield wipers that needed to be replaced. Every now and again I'd peek at Henley, but she kept a constant gaze at the outside world. Ariana said goodbye as she hopped out of my car, running through the rain to the cover of her own. I waited until she drove away before leaving the parking lot. The longer we sat in silence, the more agitated I became. Was she really not going to speak to me? I felt like I'd been worried for nothing. Henley, she started at the sound of my voice, head twisting a bit to look at me. What? You scared me. Why aren't you speaking? Do I need a reason to not talk? I frowned, unappreciative of her sarcasm at this moment in time. Are you giving me an attitude after you crashed my rental car? Sorry. It's a habit, she mumbled. I'm just thinking. She ran her fingers through her bangs, messing them up. Maybe I got too distracted while driving. I'm sorry about the car. I'll definitely pay for whatever repairs it needs. Stop saying sorry unless you're apologizing for making me worry about you. Her cute eyes widened a bit. Did I worry you? Why? I was fine. I felt my palms become clammy and I suddenly rubbed them on the steering wheel. You don't have to worry about me, she added. I ground my teeth. It's not an option, Henley. The words came out heavier than I'd meant them to. My insides twisted and I wondered if I'd overstepped that boundary again. I'm so used to doing everything alone, I guess I kind of forget what it's like to have people worry for me, she said sheepishly. I didn't know what to say. I wanted to tell her she wasn't alone, but I was too afraid of crossing the line. Be more careful next time, she laughed once. Yeah, hopefully there won't be a next time. My car insurance is expensive enough as it is. Of course she would be thinking about how much money she would have to pay after it crashed in her actual well-being. And, she groaned, stretching out a bit. I could sure use a bath in that jacuzzi tub. I pressed my lips together, eyes on the road, wondering how a person like Henley had settled so deeply into my veins. Henley's POV, Holly, when are you coming back to work? I pulled back my phone a little bit, giving it an are you shitting me look. It had been, what? How long since I'd been away from Michelangelo's? 
a couple weeks, and this was the first thing out of my manager's mouth when he finally spoke to me again. It's Henley, I replied flat. Henny, yes, yes. Sorry about that, my fingers twitched and I resisted the urge to throw the phone. Anyway, is your availability the same as before? I'd like you back on the schedule as soon as possible it's the same, I said begrudgingly. I really, really didn't want to go back to work there. But after thinking things through, it was probably for the best. I had the money Bennett had given me, but with the sudden change in the situation with my brother, I figured it'd be best to keep extra money aside. Lawyers weren't cheap and as far as I knew my brother wasn't making any money in jail. And on top of that, I had to leave Bennett's house at some point. Good. Can I expect you tonight at 5 o'clock that we have a reservation for 40 on top of the other patrons who may show up tonight? I need the extra help. There was a pause. No one seems to be as capable as you are. Would you be able to make it tonight? I glanced at the time. It was 3 o'clock, which gave me more than enough time to get ready. But it was my day off. But then again, I'd crashed Bennett's rental car and he hadn't told me if the insurance had covered it or not and I didn't have any idea how much it might be. I'll be there, I decided. At the very least it would get me out of Bennett's house for a bit. The only productive thing I'd done was use the jacuzzi tub. See you then, he responded and hung up. I texted Ariana to see if she could give me a ride. Bennett had told me to text Henry if I needed anything, but I didn't want to bother the poor man. He seemed swamped with just handling Bennett. It was my fault I'd crashed the rental, so it wasn't right for me to become a burden on anyone else, anyway. And my car was still at Coffee House, so that wasn't an option. She quickly texted me back an affirmative. I glanced out the window out onto the lake watching the heavy rain pour from the sky. As much as I wanted to blame the rain for the crash, I couldn't. I'd been so distracted by my thoughts I'd hit the turn on the slip and train tracks too fast. I couldn't stop thinking about that video. Who was that guy that looked just like my brother? How could this new piece of evidence turn the investigation around, if it even could? I knew it was best to leave it up to my brother's lawyer, but I just didn't understand how it was missed the first time. Stop saying sorry unless you're apologizing for making me worry about you. Suddenly Bennett's words rang in my ear and his worried face popped into my mind, all wide eyes and tense drawn. I felt my cheeks warm and I slapped my hands over them, covering my eyes with my fingertips. It was so embarrassing to think of. What was with him? Why had he been so worried? I'd expected him to be pissed about the car, but he'd only been worried about me. He hadn't even checked the on the car. He'd only had eyes for me. It made me feel all tingly. I didn't like it. Bennett was out of my league. Out, out of my league. I wouldn't even dream of actually dating someone like him. So I wasn't sure how to react when he made it seem like I meant more to him than just a business partner. If that's even what we were. I didn't even know what we were. All I knew was that was the first time where I'd felt that unfamiliar sense of warmth by being near someone. My mind kept trying to say but what if? I kept telling it to shut its mouth. There was no what if. I wasn't Bennett's type anyway. Crap, stop thinking Henley, I muttered, pulling myself away from the glass wall. Bennett's house was enough to tell me we didn't belong. I let out a sigh deciding to search through Bennett's fridge to see if I could find anything to eat before I had to leave. Two hours later, I begrudgingly trudged through the doors of the restaurant, my hair in a high up in a ponytail. The familiar smell of beer, steak, and God knows what greeted me and I instantly regretted agreeing to come in. That regret grew deeper as I saw Colin making his way over to me, beetle eyes scouring my body. He had a thing about the uniform looking fashionable, but I didn't see what was so fashionable about a black skirt and black blouse. I have a new weight apron for you, he said and handed me said apron. Thanks, a few guests for the party of 40 have already shown up. You can go and start their drink orders for Jessie. She'll come to help you in a bit. I felt my face twitch. Not even a please? I wasn't really surprised. But since I was going out of my way to help him out tonight, it would have been nice to be treated a little better. 
Trav caught my gaze from behind the bar and mimicked hitting Colin over the head, which made me feel slightly better. At a crappy place like this, he was a beacon of sunshine, with the flaming red hair to prove it. Plastering the fakest customer service smile I could muster onto my face, I headed over to the back room where the party of 40 was gathering. The ones already seated were chatting quietly and I felt the dread come back full force as I noticed they were all elderly folk. There were two sides of the spectrum to waiting on old people. First, you had the nice ones, who were a delight and tipped you well. Then you had the cranky ones, who wanted you to pick the seeds out of the lemon slices in their water and then not leave a tip because they were sick of younger people getting everything handed to them. The time crawled by and Jesse still hadn't shown up so with every arrival of a new guest I was off to retrieve a beer or a martini from the bar. Even though it was early, I could feel my feet starting to smart. After such a long time off from waitressing, it was going to take a bit to get my feet used to all of the running around again. Especially since the only good pair of shoes I owned had been stolen and now I was wearing brand new sneakers that hadn't been broken in yet. They ordered four more Boston lagers, I told Trav as I slid onto a bar stool and rested my elbows on the counter. They're getting wild tonight, aren't they? He responded with a quiet laugh. Gonna turn up in that nursing home, I grinned. Well, a couple of younger people joined them. Maybe I should just bring over a pitcher. Here you go, he said, handing me four ice-cold bottles. I returned to the table and handed out the beers to their respective owners. The group was still waiting on about 15 more people and I prayed Jesse arrived before then. They put in some salads and garlic bread as appetizers, so I headed over to the computer to program it in, hoping they weren't going to want separate bills at the end of the night. The door jingled signaling the arrival of a new customer and I turned around to greet them since the hostess was also currently MIA. Two familiar faces met my gaze and my mouth fell open a little. Then suddenly Sebastian moved forward, grabbing me by the elbow and pulling me away from the door. I almost tripped and struggled to regain my balance as he tugged me along into the alcove where the bathrooms were. Sebastian, what, what are you doing here? He asked, his hand still gripping my arm tightly. I looked up at him, raising my eyebrows. Working? What does it look like? I thought you didn't work here anymore, no. I still do. I tried to peek around him because I was pretty sure that was Bennett next to him. He immediately put his arm up and leaned over me, blocking my view of the door. I froze up, not expecting his proximity. His chest was almost pressed up against mine and our shoulders were touching. I never realized just how much taller than me he was. Or how good he smelled. Henley, listen to me. Don't go over to our table. I snapped out of the stupor you get into by being too close to a handsome guy immediately. What don't come over? Why? Why was he being so weird? Was Bennett's mother here? I peeked out a little bit, seeing Bennett staring dead at us. He looked different tonight, almost a little run down. His jeans had a hole in them. Right next to him was an unfamiliar woman in a red dress. Her tiny figure turned back to me. Long, brown hair cascaded down her back. Sebastian quickly pressed my face into his chest. Don't look at Bennett, he said. Right now, he's on a date with that girl. I paused, unsure if I'd heard him right. Bennett was on a date with someone. Why? It's a blind date his mother set up. Sebastian explained. I looked up at him, my chest feeling tight. Why was Bennett on a date with another girl? Why did his mother set it up? Why did Bennett go on it? Why did they come here? What about me? I had so many questions. But I couldn't ask them. Bennett could do whatever he wanted. He wasn't my boyfriend. I'm sorry, Sebastian said, a frown pulling at his lips. We didn't think you'd be here. I forced myself to smile back at him. It's fine. I was just a little surprised to see you both. I don't care that Bennett's on a date or anything, so don't be sorry, you don't. Why would I? He hesitated a moment, his eyes holding my gaze. Well, we'll try to be quick. You still shouldn't come near us. I know Bennett's mother and this won't be the only time we'll see this girl. I don't want her recognizing you. Where are your tables? I was tempted to look at the girl again, 
but I managed not to. It would most likely hurt my self-esteem if I did. I only have one in the back there, I pointed toward the back of the restaurant. There's a huge party, he nodded. I'll make sure she sits with her back against the room. And I'm sorry for being unmannerly about this, he added, offering me the most adorable regretful look. I shouldn't have grabbed you, it's okay, I said, smiling at the apology. He was a one-of-a-kind type of guy. Thanks for warning me, I have to go before one of them starts looking for me. Try to be careful, Henley, I nodded and Sebastian finally moved away from me. As soon as he did, I turned my back to the door, just in case the girl was still standing there. I gave it a few more moments before I returned to my table. Jess had arrived now and had started to take orders. I helped her out and then decided to hang out with Trav while I waited for Colin to tell me what to do next. The bar was on the opposite side of the restaurant, so I'd be nowhere near Bennett or his date. Who's that guy? Trav asked the minute I walked up to the counter. The guy I talked to earlier. He's my friend, Sebastian, I told him, looking over at the table where he sat with Bennett and the brown-haired girl. Trav smiled a little and shook his head. Not him, the other guy. He hasn't kept his eyes off you since he got here, just as he finished his sentence. Bennett glanced over at me and our gaze is locked. I ducked my head and shifted so he couldn't see my face. Why was he staring at me? What if his set girl noticed? If he was going to be weird, I was going to have to stay out of his sight. Should I say something to him? It's okay, I said quickly. Although the idea of Bennett being called out as a perv would be hilarious, I didn't want to completely embarrass him. Trav didn't seem convinced, but then again, he'd seen a lot of handsy patrons before, that is star-spangled moron. He kind of doubled as a bartender and security guard sometimes. Leaning forward, he gave my upper arm a pat. Let me know if you have any problems. Henley, Colin rushed up to me just then, his face red. Henley. Mr. Calloway is here. Yes. Go take their table. He ordered. What? What about the back room? Jesse can handle it for now. You should go thank Mr. Calloway since he is the one who called to make sure you got your job back. My eyes widened. He went he'd called the restaurant to secure my job. When had he done that? Don't keep his table waiting, Colin said. Go over there. Now, I cursed in Ridley knowing I'd have no choice but to listen to Colin. I silently apologized to Sebastian as I made my way over to their table. Bennett's gaze followed me the whole way and I gave him a sharp look, hoping he knew what Sebastian had told me. As I walked up to the table, both Bennett's and Sebastian's eyes grew wide. Hello everyone, my name is Henley and I'll be your server tonight, I greeted them, keeping my eyes trained on Sebastian. Bennett was sitting on the outside of the bench, closer to me. I could feel his stare at me. Could I start you off with a drink? Water all around, Sebastian said immediately. Can I actually have a lemonade? A quiet voice spoke up and I switched my gaze to the girl sitting opposite. A bad decision. She was beautiful. And not in the Cosmo magazine cover way. In the natural, worn with it way. It took me an hour and a crap ton of makeup to look that good. This girl didn't look like she was wearing any. Long eyelashes, clear bronze skin, shiny hair. I was so jealous. And to top that off, I knew she was wealthy, because no way would Bennett's mother set him up with someone who wasn't. AKA someone like me. I realized I was staring and felt myself blushing. A lemonade? Sure, she smiled widely, showing off her pearly white teeth. Thank you very much. I kind of cringed back at her, because I felt like when I smiled I sometimes had a double chin and I already felt inferior enough. I'll have a water, Bennett said. I nodded, looking at Sebastian again. Then I'll be right back with those drinks, thank you, she chirped. You're welcome, I replied before turning my back and hurrying away, my heart racing. This was the worst. This was exactly why I didn't want to have those kinds of weird thoughts about Bennett. Someone like this girl was more suited to be with him. And I hated the way that made me feel about myself. I hated that I felt inferior. I hated that I felt ugly. 
I hated the fact that I felt like this because I was next to someone like Bennett. And I hated what that meant. You're not his girlfriend, I reminded myself. Chill out. I took a deep breath, trying to calm down. It was dumb to get upset over this. Bennett could do whatever he wanted. But if he was going on dates with girls, why did he want someone to pretend to be his girlfriend? He was okay with that. Did he see nothing wrong with that? If he was going to listen to his mother anyway, why didn't he just call off our contract? It was a good thing only Ariana knew about our relationship. Otherwise, I'd just look like a fool in front of everyone. I returned to the table with drinks, keeping my expression courteous and avoiding eye contact with Bennett. A part of me was absurdly mad at Bennett for doing this, but I couldn't show it. I couldn't even act like I knew him, anyway. I would just silently take their orders and run away. It might be weird to say this, but I love your hair color. She spoke up, completely destroying my plan. She leaned towards me a bit, eyes wide. It's so pretty. Is it natural I felt caught off guard? My eyes automatically darted to Bennett and I felt a surge of annoyance. He opened his mouth but abruptly closed it when Sebastian elbowed him in the side. I turned back to her. I didn't want to talk to her, but I couldn't be rude. Besides, she hadn't done anything wrong. Thank you, I said. And yeah, it's natural no problem. I'm kind of jealous. My hair could never get that straight, or light without spending a lot of money. I've always wanted to try going blonde, she responded, pulling at a strand of hair. Especially because someone told me this guy here likes blondes, she smiled bashfully as she looked at Bennett. My mouth felt dry. I wanted to leave. I should go put your orders in. Okay, can I have another lemonade too, she said gesturing to her almost empty glass. Yep. Excuse me, Bennett started and I felt his fingertips brush my arm as I quickly turned and hurried away. After putting in their order, I headed to the bathroom, needing a moment to myself. This sucked. I wanted to go home, but I didn't even have a home to go home to. I only had Bennett's place. I groaned, putting my hands into my face. When had my life become so complicated? When had I become such a sorry person? There was no reason to be jealous of this girl. She seemed nice. I couldn't be upset with her. I was more mature than this. After scowling at myself in the mirror for a few seconds, I decided to head back out. I grabbed the lemonade from the kitchen and rounded the corner to the main room, slamming into someone with such force I fell over and the lemonade glass went flying, shattering across the floor. Looking up I saw Colin hovering over me, jaw dropped. I'm sorry, I apologized quickly before he could say anything. My right wrist throbbed where I'd landed on it. Get up, he hissed at me. I glanced around, realizing everyone was staring at me, including Bennett and his date. My face flushed red and I scrambled to get up, wincing at the pain in my wrist. Sorry, I'm going to get a broom. Start picking that up and make sure no one walks by here. I crouched down on my ankles and started carefully picking up the glass off the floor. I could feel my throat getting tight and I grit my teeth. This sucks. This sucks. This sucks. Ow. I cried as my fingers slipped along a side of the razor edge glass. Blood started pouring out and I found myself irrationally pissed off. A pair of hands cupped my shoulders and a body knelt down next to me. Henley. Are you okay? I turned my head to the side, my face coming two inches within Bennett's. My lips trembled for a moment and I had to force myself to get the words out. Go away, Bennett I said lowly. I was sick and tired of embarrassing myself in front of him. I didn't want his help right now, especially. He narrowed his eyes. What you're not supposed to be acting like you know me. I'm fine. I'm not going to leave you here like this, he said putting his hands under my shoulders and easily lifting me from my crouching position. He tried to grab my hand and I yanked it away. Leave me alone, I told him, stepping away. Why would I? He demanded, looking genuinely confused. You're hurt, I bit my bottom lip, feeling frustrated with myself. I had no right to be mad at Bennett. I had no right to be rude to him like this. Why was I acting so immature? 
That girl is watching us. I murmured finally. He moved so that he was blocking my view of his date. Now she can't see, I refuse to look at him. We shouldn't act like we know each other. I don't want to affect your date, I didn't want to go on this date in the first place, he snapped. Before I could reply, Colin came back with the dustpan and broom. He caught sight of Bennett and quickly put himself between us. Ah, Mr. Calloway, everything is fine. You can sit back down. It seemed like Bennett was going to argue for a moment and then his shoulders fell and he walked back to the table. I took the broom from Colin and cleaned up the glass and saw Trav heading over with the mop. Take this, he ordered Colin. Colin gave him a bewildered look. Why me? She cut herself on the glass you told her to pick up, he said, pointing at my bleeding finger. He then took the dustpan and broom from me and told me to follow him back to the bar. I felt a little sense of triumph as Colin didn't talk back and started mopping the floor. Traff set me down on a stool and grabbed the first aid kit, cleaning up my cut before placing a square bandage on it. Thanks, I said to him. Are you okay? He asked. I nodded. You don't look too okay. I stared at the table, where Bennett's blind date was leaning across the table and had Bennett's full attention. It's fine. Blood just makes me nervous. Okay. Take it easy. Why don't you go help Jessie bring out her food and then take a break? The bar is dead so I'll bring out the food to the other table when it's done. Have I told you you're a lifesaver? He shrugged nonchalantly. Maybe but I like to hear it. I grinned at him and then went to the kitchen to start bringing out the plates. Jessie was relieved to see me and I felt sorry for her having to handle the table alone for the little time I'd been gone. After the table of 40 had finished, it was almost closing time. At some point, Bennett's party had left, but I hadn't noticed. Trav had taken over completely and even bust the table. I felt relieved though. I'd already embarrassed myself enough for the night. Henley, you can go, Colin told me after I'd bust the table up back. Okay, I said, annoyed when he didn't even thank me for coming in before he walked away. I headed outside to wait. I told Ariana to come get me at midnight because that's when I figured I'd be out, but since he'd let me go early, she wasn't here. Just as I picked up my phone to call her, a shadow stepped out of the bushes, scaring the shit out of me. I held up my phone defensively, ready to strike the person and run. Wait, the figure cried. It took me a second to realize it was Bennett. I lowered my cell phone, wondering if my eyes were working properly. Bennett? What are you doing here? He crossed his arms over his chest. I was waiting for you to get out. Why? You don't have the rental right now and Henry said he didn't give you a ride here. So I thought you might not have a ride home. He explained. Have you been here this whole time? No. I dropped Kara off first and then came back here to make sure you would get home okay. I pushed my bangs behind my ear, unable to look at him. So. Kara was her name. No, that wasn't the thought I should be having. Bennett had come all the way back to wait for me. While I'd been mad at him for some stupid reason. What was wrong with me? Are you upset? He asked when I didn't say anything. I couldn't go against my mother this time. I'm sorry, Henley, he was sorry. For what you had to pretend you didn't know me because Kara was with me. I'm sure you felt subservient I grimaced at his use of the word subservient. I knew he didn't mean for it to come off as offensive, but there were better word choices. It's part of the contract, isn't it? Can you say anything else? He demanded. It's because of the contract. Why can't you say what you want to say? Why can't you tell your mother what you want? I countered. You're mad, he concluded. I gave him the most sarcastic look I could manage. Really you have a right to be mad. Move on, Henley. Don't say anything. Why are you on a date when you're supposedly dating me? I asked him. Your mother thinks I'm your girlfriend, and yet you went on a date. Bennett adverted his gaze, shrinking in on himself. There are some times where I just can't go against my mother. This was one of them. I'm not proud of it. Do you even hear me? I feel like I'm just hanging around and getting in the way. I need you. He responded firmly. You're going on dates. That's what your mother wanted you to do. 
So you don't need me? Bennett shook his head. No. My mother's deal with me is still on. I still need you. I didn't let his words get to me. Why don't you just use that other girl instead of wasting my time? She seemed nice and obviously she was pre-approved. And she's pretty. Not as pretty as you, he mumbled. I caught my breath. Had I heard him correctly? He thought I was prettier than in her. Ha, huh, you're right, I responded, trying to play it off, while inside my heart was pounding like crazy. He stood up a little straighter, clearing his throat. You're pretty, he said resolutely. We both stood there quietly, staring at each other. A soft wind blew, ruffling my hair and caressing my skin. I wasn't sure whose face was redder. Mine, or his. I'm sorry about tonight. Please accept my apology, he said sincerely and I didn't feel angry anymore. Dot, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry for being stubborn. He smiled a little bit. No. I like that about you. It was then and there I decided I was in trouble. What I'd been trying to deny all night demanded to be noticed. I could pretend that I didn't know why I'd been so mad, but deep down I did know why. I broke the number one rule of the contract. I like Bennett. Henley's POV, I'm going to throw up, I said, covering my mouth and searching around frantically for the bathroom. Ariana rubbed my shoulder soothingly. You're fine, you're fine, Bennett looked at me distastefully. If you're going to vomit, do so privately and quietly, I'll make sure to aim for your shoes. He narrowed his eyes at me and I parroted his expression but I had the feeling it wasn't too intimidating. I felt sweaty and I knew my face was pallid. From the other side of the giant glass wall of the airport, I could see the nose of a Boeing. My insides clenched nervously and I swallowed hard. I'm not going, I decided. I already bought our plane tickets. I honestly felt like I could cry. Flying was almost my number one biggest fear. Being 50,000 feet up in the air with the threat of immediate death upon crashing was not something I was interested in. Ever. And yet here I was, inside an airport and ready to board the flying death machine. It doesn't even make sense. Why do you want to get into something that defies logic? It's a hunk of metal that flies the freaking sky. Ariana tried to hide a smile but failed. Come on, Henley. It's not bad. And it doesn't defy logic. There's science behind it, the force of pressure on the top of the airplane wing is less than the bottom, which causes a lift and the force of the lift brings the plane into the air while the engine the thrust propels the plane forward. Bennett explained simply. I actually have a diagram on my phone that explains it if you're interested in seeing it. No thanks, I said immediately. I'm going to go to the bathroom and puke up this morning's breakfast, that's too much information. Henley. I jutted my chin up at Bennett and shoved my suitcase at him. Watch this. Ariana, come with me. She nodded and handed Bennett her suitcase as well, much to his displeasure. Together we headed off toward the airport bathroom and I tried to calm my nerves, taking deep breaths. It had all started last night. Bennett came home around 7 o'clock, a couple of suitcases in hand and told me our flight to Hawaii was leaving at 2 o'clock the next afternoon. What followed was an intense squabble of I'm not going anywhere versus this is part of our contract, do what I say and in the end, he had won. He tricked me into giving in by telling me Ariana had already eagerly agreed to go with him and Sebastian and she was already packing her suitcase. He paid for a ticket for her as well. So even though I really, really didn't want to go. I couldn't let the opportunity pass. Ariana was like me too poor for luxury such as a vacation to Hawaii. I couldn't ruin this for her because I was terrified of public transportation. So we'd both somehow managed to clear our schedules and here we were, waiting to board the death trap. You and Bennett fight like a married couple. Ariana giggled. You guys would be so cute together. I shot her a dirty look. First, don't make me regret telling you about that. Second, that saying is messed up. Healthy couples aren't supposed to fight all the time. After coming to the realization that I might have developed feelings for Bennett, I'd had to spell to someone, and Ariana was the person I trusted the most slash the only other person I talked to. 
I'd expected her to tell me I was insane and I'd probably just been wooed by him for the moment. But she just said she'd known I'd liked him for a while now. Which didn't make sense. Even now when I saw Bennett's face, I felt annoyed. How in the world did I have feelings for him? How could I let myself have feelings for him, knowing it would just end with us going our separate ways? You're right, Ariana said slowly after a second, breaking me from my thoughts. Why does everyone say that, beats me, you and Bennett don't fight though, you just spat. Spatting his cute, I looked at her flatly, squinting my eyes a little. She got the hint and grimaced sheepishly. Okay. After I said that out loud I realized it was dumb. But you know, it's common for characters in books to flirt by fighting, writers are so messed up. If we weren't, there wouldn't be any good books. Now go to the bathroom and take some anxiety pills before we miss our flight. Flight. That's right. Suddenly feeling nauseous again, I hurried into the bathroom and released the contents of the minuscule breakfast Bennett had practically forced down my throat this morning. After that I grabbed my water bottle and swallowed a couple of pills, hoping it would be enough to knock me out for most of the flight. Ariana and I returned to Bennett, just in time for Sebastian to catch up with us, a bag of magazines from the airport bookstore in hand. I felt like a robot as we moved together to the waiting area to board. My pulse would not stop racing. I could feel the blood in my ears and I prayed for the medicine to kick in. My hands were slick with sweat. It only grew worse when we boarded the plane. If I'd been feeling normal, I would have rolled my eyes at Bennett seating us in first class, but now I was a little glad. It was definitely more private. Less people to see me freaking out. Ariana stayed by my side the entire time, holding my arm tightly. I love that girl. Over here Henley, Bennett said as we walked down the narrow aisle of the cabin. He stopped at a pair of seats that were almost at the front of the section. I'll take the window seat. Give me your luggage, I numbly let him take my carry-ons from me, my eyes trained on the window, taking in how high up we were by just being in the plane. We weren't even in the air yet. I wasn't going to survive this. Why don't you sit down, Sebastian suggested, gently guiding me into the seat I was standing next to. I did as instructed. Ariana went to sit next to me and Bennett slid his body between her and the seat. She frowned at him and I looked up to see him gesture to the seats on the opposite side of the aisle. I accidentally booked the seats wrong. We can't swap, so you'll be sitting with Seb. What? No, she has to sit next to me, I said quickly. It's fine, Henley, Ariana replied. I'm just across the aisle, I wanted to complain but I also didn't want to be immature about it, so I kept my mouth shut. Bennett settled into the seat next to me, looking completely calm and at ease. His posture was perfect, back straight, chin forward. He was wearing an actual suit today, instead of his usual vest and jeans. The jacket and waistcoat were dark gray while the button-up underneath was a light lavender color, all complemented by a maroon tie. I tried to focus my attention on his outfit and not the fact the cabin was filling up and that we'd probably be taking off soon. If you're going to get sick, please move away, Bennett said, eyeing me warily. This suit was cut and sewn by hand to tailor to my exact form. That's not cheap, I didn't even have the effort to retort. I closed my eyes, taking slow, deep breaths, trying to keep my heart from exploding. It worked for a little while all the way up until takeoff. The engine roared loudly, scaring me half to death. Then a firm hand grasped my own, scaring me again. I opened my eyes, seeing Bennett watching me, eyebrows knit together. I tried to pull my hand back, but he held it tighter. The plane started to move. I held onto Bennett's hand like it was my life support. I wasn't sure whether it was consciously or subconsciously, but as Bennett held my hand, his thumb stroked my skin soothingly, and I didn't want to admit how much it worked. It was enough to distract me from the takeoff. Almost. I screamed a little as we hit a bump on the runway. By the time we landed in Honolulu, Hawaii, I was a wreck. I'd thought that I'd feel a little calmer for the connecting flight, but I managed about the same. 
Now I felt gross and sticky from perspiring and I was tired and cranky from being emotionally drained during the combined 12-hour trip. Not to mention the fact of the time change, so it was really only 8 o'clock p.m. when it felt like 2 a.m. Why couldn't Bennett have chosen an earlier flight? There were two cars waiting for us when we exited the airport. The longer I was off the plane, the better I felt. Once that first wave of fresh, warm air hit me, I could have cried. My stomach rumbled loudly, proving that I was starting to feel better. I'd barely been able to choke down a granola bar on the flight. Bennett waved to one of the drivers, who hastened to gather Bennett's luggage, packing it into the trunk of the fancy BMW. Bennett then turned to me, adjusting his tie. Get to bed early tonight, Henley. Sebastian, make sure they eat something before they fall asleep. Sebastian smiled a little. Sure, very well. Wait, where are you going Bennett I asked as he started to walk away. He paused. I have work to do, I thought we were here for a random vacation. He gave me a one shoulder shrug and I noticed that he looked just as tired as I felt. For you, Sebastian, and Ariana, yes. However, I came for work. There have been some problems with the construction of my hotel and I'm here to solve them personally I felt faintly disappointed. Bennett wouldn't be spending any time with us. Or was it just for today? What work would he be doing at this time? Why did I care so much? Sir, you're going to be late, the driver of the BMW spoke up. Ah, let's depart then, Bennett said, putting a hand up to us in farewell. Please enjoy your stay, I pressed my lips together, unused to Bennett's formal tone. It was weird. The last time I remembered being around his business self was when he was trying to get me to sign our contract. Now it felt isolating. After Bennett left, we all piled our luggage into the remaining luxury car, and then piled ourselves into the back seat. We left the airport and I pressed my face against the window, wanting to take in the view. We'd flown in over the ocean, but I'd been too scared to look out the window, so I hadn't taken a good look at it. Now we were headed inland and even though it was almost sundown, I could see mountains looming in the distance. We passed clusters of palm trees, something I'd never thought I would get to see in person. I could see why the place was such a tourist attraction. What hotel are we staying at? Ariana asked, letting out a yawn. There's only a couple in Walea, isn't there? We'll be staying at my resort, Sebastian answered. I turned toward him. Your resort? Yeah. Now I get to show you how impressive I am. I grinned, rolling my eyes. Okay, Benedi chuckled. I'm actually surprised Bennett wanted to come. I also have a little bit of work to do here and I mentioned it to him and he insisted on coming with me and bringing you and Ariana along, really. Why? Beats me. Usually, he hates traveling for work. Believe it or not, he doesn't enjoy flying either. Since this is his project, I guess he had to come anyway. Might as well all come together, Bennett didn't like flying but he'd seemed so calm the entire time. His hand hadn't even been shaking when he held mine. He was putting on a brave face for you, Ariana cooed. I shook my head. No way. It wasn't him trying to appear at ease so I wouldn't be more worried, was it? I didn't want that to be true. It would be easier to get over him if he wasn't a nice guy. Something tells me he might be trying to make it up to you through this though, Sebastian commented thoughtfully. Make what up, for the blind date he went on. He probably doesn't think anything of bringing someone on vacation as a means for an apology. Why would he need to make anything up to me? He can go on blind dates. We're not really dating, I said, even though my stomach tightened at the thought of the beautiful woman in the red dress. Sebastian and Ariana both watched me with the same expression. I didn't like it. In any case, he didn't feel right about it. Sebastian told me. He didn't want to be there. He brought me along to make it seem like less of a date. I didn't want to admit it, but Sebastian's words made my chest feel lighter. Even after speaking to Bennett about it and knowing his mother forced it on him, I couldn't shake that feeling of envy about it. Envious that she was there with them. Envious that she fitted with Bennett so well. Envious of her beauty. You're prettier. I slapped my hands to my cheeks startling Ariana. 
She glanced at me quizzically and I cleared my throat, returning to looking out the window. Don't think about it, don't think about it, I chanted in my head. My cheeks felt too warm for my liking. When we arrived at Sebastian's resort, my mouth almost dropped. It was enormous. We pulled up to what I assumed to be the main building. It towered over us in the night sky, lights shining brightly and illuminating the main entrance and surrounding parking lot. From inside the car, I could see the lobby because it was completely open. No windows, no walls. I turned to Sebastian in awe. What if someone robs you? My question caused him to laugh. That's not where you check in. You can't see it from here, but there's an inside lobby. This is just the foyer, is this where we're staying? Ariana asked. No, we're staying in one of our single suites. We have multiple buildings for accommodation. This one is the most common, but we have more private suites for clients who are willing to pay the extra fees. Our driver opened my door for me and I climbed out, stretching widely in the warm, salty air. The smell of the ocean was relaxing. Now that we'd arrived, I felt the tiredness leaving my body. Is our sweep by the ocean? I asked Sebastian. He nodded as he helped unload our bags from the trunk. Yes? We also have a private balcony and infinity pool. Ariana grabbed her suitcase from Sebastian and nearly jumped up and down. Let's go see the ocean. Let's drop off our luggage first, Sebastian suggested, leading the way up the stairs to the open foyer of the resort. The floors and walls and support beams appeared to be made of the same sandy-colored marble. There were a few people relaxing in comfortable-looking wicker chairs and couches. The lights were hanging low and etched with beautiful tribal markings. As Sebastian had mentioned, we came across a glass wall that held the door to get into the actual lobby. It was just as clean and neatly decorated as the foyer. Same sandy marble and everything. The receptionists greeted us warmly and then exchanged glances when they caught sight of Sebastian. Ah, Mr. James, I'm glad to see you've arrived safely, one of them chirped. She gave our trio a bright smile. I'll check you in, come over here. Would you like a schedule of the resort's activities? Yes, thank you, Sebastian answered politely. I think we're in building A, the receptionist nodded, tapping into the computer on her desk. Everything is all set for you. Shall I get someone to drive you? No, I'm fine. I'll just take the keys. Here you go. She handed him room cards and also a set of keys. Those are for cart nine. Then she gestured for me to come forward and then handed me a couple of brochures and a laminated paper. Welcome and I hope you enjoy your stay. Thanks. I responded, feeling a little overwhelmed. Sebastian guided us away from the receptionists and down the polished hallways. A couple strolled by us, laughing loudly and wearing lays around their necks. I smiled, suddenly finding myself in a great mood. We went through a set of automatic glass doors and were outside once again. This time I could see just how big the expanse of the resort was. There were lights stretched for what seemed to be miles. I couldn't make out everything since it was nighttime but it looked like there were at least three gigantic pools between all the buildings, with paths cutting through them to the either the beachfront or to another building. There's a golf course behind those far buildings, Sebastian said, pointing to the furthest set of buildings. It'll be easier to see things and explore tomorrow when it's light out. Follow me, we'll take a golf cart to our suite. As we drove to our suite, I noticed that the three pools were actually connected. There were crowds of people in the pools laughing, drinking, and splashing at each other. At the edge of the pools were what I assumed to be tiki bars. It was incredible. I could only imagine how much a night it cost to stay here. I shuddered. When we came to our suite, I almost couldn't believe it. It was something I'd seen in movies that I never thought was actually real. We were basically on the ocean. In fact, there was a little dock that had a roof and couches and chairs situated a little way into the water. As much as I wanted to go check it out, I wanted to look inside first. There seemed to be four rooms in the building. Sebastian led us up the porch to the second floor, where he unlocked the room closest to the beach. It was clean and cozy and the whole back wall against the ocean was made of glass, just like Bennett's living room. 
Those are windows too, so if you want to leave them open at tonight you can, Sebastian told us as I started to inspect them. You two will stay in this room and Bennett and I will stay in the adjoining one. The two rooms below us are empty. Thanks for letting us come, Ariana said while I gazed out at the ocean in amazement. The moon reflected off the waves and I could hear every crash as they spilled onto the sand. No problem, Sebastian said. If you give me a second, I'll figure out where we can grab a quick bite to eat. I'm sure you're tired, but you should really eat something first, so you don't feel sick in the morning. Want to go put our feet in the ocean? I asked Ariana. She nodded vigorously and we both kicked off our shoes and socks bolting through the door and racing the short distance to the water's edge. You first, she said. I gently dipped the toe into a breaking wave. I yanked it back, expecting it to be cold like the waters in New England. But it wasn't. I put my foot back in and grinned. It's like 80 degrees. Ariana tested the water too before taking a few steps in. This is crazy. I love Hawaii. I decided. I loved Hawaii even more as we ate dinner. Besides the fact that the restaurant was completely open and we basically sat on the ocean as we ate, I was ravenous. I'd been distracted by my excitement, but the minute I smelled food my appetite kicked in full throttle I stuffed my face. A decision I soon regretted after we were finished eating. Fatigue set in quickly as the exhaustion finally caught up to me. My eyes were having trouble staying open as we headed back to our suite. Ariana was leaning against me in the golf cart and I swear I could hear her snoring. I barely managed to get her and myself up the steps. Sebastian followed behind us, probably ready to catch us if we passed out. I'll be next door if you need anything, Sebastian said, covering his mouth as he yawned. I rubbed a hand through my hair, staring at him blearily. Okay, Ariana collapsed on one of the queen-size beds. Good night. Thanks for dinner. You're a great man. Sebastian laughed quietly before bidding us good night and walking through the door to the adjoining suite. I slipped into the remaining bed, glancing over to see Ariana already under the sheets and dead asleep. I settled back, searching for my phone. There were no texts. What was Bennett doing? Had he eaten yet? Was his work finished? When would he be coming back? I grimaced. Just how bad did I have it? Bennett was my last thought at night. I closed my eyes, trying to fall asleep. It didn't work. I rolled over and brought my knee up to my chest to try and get comfortable. Five minutes later I rolled back over. I couldn't fall asleep. The longer I listened to the sound of the waves, the more the crazy idea of a random tsunami hitting us took over my thoughts. Instead of feeling relaxed, I felt on edge. I wasn't sure how long I tried to fall asleep for. An urge to pee hit me and I forced myself out of the bed and into the bathroom. On the way back I glanced out the window, nearly having a heart attack as I saw the figure by the edge of the dock outside the building. After examining it for a moment, I realized it looked familiar. I left the suite and headed down the stairs, making my way to the wooden dock. Bennett sat in one of the wicker chairs facing the ocean. I slowly made my way up to him. Hi, I said to announce my presence. He jumped a little. Henley, what are you doing? Why are you awake? I think I'm afraid of tsunamis. He looked at me, a frown appearing on his face. What, what time is it? What are you doing out here? I asked, noticing that his clothes were rumpled. It was a rare sight. His hair was curlier than usual and his eyes didn't hold that tight look they usually did. He was actually kind of cute right now, even if he was exhausted. It's a little before midnight, he answered, pushing himself out of the chair. I'm about to head in, did you finish your work? He gave a slight shake of his head. No, tomorrow I have to rework the contract with our lawyer. There's no pleasing these guys, you should get some rest then, I will. The sky is clear tonight, so I was looking at some constellations before bed. I turned my face up. The stars were twinkling brightly, each one doing its best to outshine its neighbors. They blanketed across the endless sky, lighting up the earth. That's the Big Deeper, I pointed out. Bennett nodded. Yes? The Ursa Major, you know the technical names, 
I know many things you probably don't. I scowled a little. For your information, I did know that. Can you make out Hercules? I looked back up at the sky and pointed at random. Is that it? Bennett sighed lightly and moved closer to me, stepping right up to my back, so close I could feel his chest on my back. He took my hand into his and guided it to the right a little bit. It's these stars here. Here's his head. His arm. He moved my arm down, making sure my finger pointed at each star respectively. His leg. If you look more south, we can make out Scorpius by the red star Antares. I found myself holding my breath as Bennett dragged my hand across the sky, showing me all the visible constellations. His chest rose and fell against my back his breath caressing my neck. Even after that long flight and whatever he'd done afterward, he still smelled good. Warm and spicy. His scent and his low voice felt like a lullaby and I found myself closing my eyes, leaning back into him. After a moment he let go of my hand. Let's head inside. You're falling asleep. I didn't want to, but I nodded anyway. The longer I stayed out here, the longer I kept Bennett away from rest. I stumbled wearily back to the suite, Bennett walking beside me. Like it better when you walk beside me than in front of me, I told him. Hmm. I made a waving motion. Nothing. Never mind. Good night. Thanks for showing me the constellations, if you'd like. I can show you more tomorrow night. The idea was tempting his warm body so close to mine, watching the stars together. It was romantic and I lacked that department in my life but I knew I shouldn't. The more I was around Bennett, the more I found to like about him. I had to save myself from the heartbreak that was bound to come. But no matter what argument I thought of, I still came out with, aren't you going to be too busy? He turned to me, lips pursed together. I can make time for you, his response threw me off guard and I kind of just stood there dumbly. And actually, Henley, there's more I have planned for us tomorrow than just stargazing, us, I echoed. Just you and I I'd like to take you on a date, Henley's POV. I woke up the next morning to a knock on the adjoining door. Groaning, I rolled over and peeked my head out of my comforters, seeing Ariana on the other bed doing the same. Come in, she mumbled. Sebastian slid inside the room, balancing a tray of food on his left hand. The scent of bacon and eggs wafted through the air. Breakfast in bed, he offered. Ariana sat straight up, oblivious to the fact that her hair was standing in every which direction and her tank top was halfway rolled up her stomach. I don't believe you're real, she told him, eyeing him suspiciously. I grinned a little bit and Sebastian chuckled, looking embarrassed. He was wearing a black pair of sweats and a tank and for the first time, I realized just how buff he was. Where Bennett was more on the slender side, Sebastian was broader. His biceps were huge. He could probably break Ariana in half. I have to prove how amazing of a host I am, don't I? Sebastian said, placing the tray on the foot of Ariana's bed. He kept his eyes on the floor the entire time and I realized he was trying to be modest. Thank you, we chimed together. He waved us off. No need for thanks. It was delivered to our door anyway. I just ordered it. Did you already eat? Where's Bennett I asked. I'm here. A new voice spoke up and I turned back to the door, where Bennett was propped against the frame, hands in the pocket of his sweatpants. Yep, he was wearing sweatpants too. Instead of a tank though, he was wearing a v-neck tee. It was weird to see him so dressed down, but he definitely could work it. He looked sexy, more attainable. He didn't make that, by that way, he added, lessening the charm. I rolled my eyes. Sebastian clapped him on the shoulder, shaking his head. Ben, let's give them some privacy. I brought some more brochures for you too, Bennett said, coming over to my bed and handing me a couple of colorful pamphlets. I suggest a trip to the Mander Spa or maybe learning to do stand-up paddleboarding. Sebastian will help you find your way around, you're not coming. Ariana asked, beating me to it. He gave a slight shake of his head. No. I have a meeting to attend in a short while. I'm not sure how long it'll take so I'd rather not make you guys wait up for me. I stared at him questioningly. He wasn't hanging out with us. 
Hadn't he said he'd be spending time with me today? Just the two of us. Was that not happening anymore? Maybe it was better that way. Maybe he'd realized he'd made a mistake the night before by saying that. Henley, make sure you have your phone. I will call you when I become available, he added, making my melodramatic thoughts come to a stop. So our plans were still on. Why did he have to say it like that? Was I supposed to be waiting on him all day? I gave him a polite smile. Sure. Once you let me know your availability I'll let you know mine. He didn't blink. I already know your availability how could you know that? Sebastian has reservations at 5 o'clock with Miss Kinsley. For two. You will either be with me at that point or back here. I glared at Ariana accusingly. In her defense though, she looked confused. What reservations? She asked. Sebastian gave us both a meek look. Dinner. Bennett made me. I mean I. Ha ha. I know of a good place. Bennett seemed satisfied with Sebastian's response and nodded his head. Now that this is all cleared up, I have to shower and dress. Enjoy yourselves today. After he left I pursed my lips at Sebastian. Dinner reservations for just the two of you, but I personally would have liked to get dinner all together. But Bennett was insistent on having dinner alone with you so he set up the reservations for Ariana and me. He paused. Not that I'm against having dinner alone with you. Ariana. Ariana pretended to scratch her chin. Is this some kind of setup? Do you want my hot pot? A cute blush spread across Sebastian's face. No. I laughed feeling a little nervous. I could trust Sebastian to watch over Ariana tonight, but I wasn't sure how I'd fare alone with Bennett. Alone on a date with Bennett. Was it even a real date? Or was it him just playing the part of a boyfriend? I hadn't asked and I didn't want to think about it. Both answers to that question didn't mean anything good. I'll leave you two to get ready. I'm up for anything, so you can decide what we do today. Sebastian told us before exiting the room. Ariana and I looked at each other. I could marry that man, she commented thoughtfully. I rolled my eyes. You can't marry someone just because they give you food. You're dating a guy just because he gave you money. My mouth fell open. She smirked. I will eat all that food, I warned her. She quickly pulled it closer to her, shoving three pieces of bread into her mouth. Never. Hurry and eat. I'm 99% sure what we do today is going to be billed on Bennett, so let's do as much as we can. She took some of the bread out of her mouth. It's typically supposed to be that you don't want to spend any of his money. I shrugged. Don't look a gift horse in its mouth. Right, right, she agreed, shoving a fork full of scrambled eggs into her mouth. Since we didn't have the whole day to play around together, Ariana and I narrowed our plans to hitting up the spa, the shops, and learning to stand up paddleboard. Sebastian told us about the history of Hawaii and pointed out some of the mountains, making plans to hike up them someday with us. He knew a lot about Hawaii because his family owned the resort there. I'd never really thought that he would know so much. I'd just assumed they'd build a hotel and that was that. It was starting to make more sense why Bennett knew all these weird and random facts. He probably learned a bunch of stuff every day. I was learning a lot about Hawaii myself. It felt like peace. Everyone was so friendly and so relaxed. The air was warm and relaxing, with just a hint of the taste salt from the ocean. It felt like I was in an alternate universe, where time had slowed down. With so much going on in my life, I'd forgotten what it felt like to be stress-free and carefree. On our way back from paddle boarding, a passerby handed me a pretty white hibiscus flower. I smiled and put it in my hair while Sebastian said, Mahalo the young man winked before walking off. I stared up at the trees around us, and awe at their vibrancy. In fact, the whole island was vibrant. All day, I'd been having trouble taking in just how beautiful this place was. I got water in my ear, Ariana complained as she tilted her head to the side and shook it. That's what you get for falling so many times, I teased. What did you get then? Sebastian asked. You fell more than her, I narrowed my eyes at him. It was hard not to get distracted by his surprisingly muscled chest. He was tan and glorious. How had I fallen for Bennett, again? 
Whose side are you on? He shrugged. His hair wasn't even wet. That's how good of a paddleboarder he was. He hadn't fallen once. 30 minutes isn't that bad to get it right. I guess, he said. Look at this. I'm seeing a new side to you. Well, I figure I owe you this since you show me a new side to Bennett every so often, he responded. I raised an eyebrow, trying my best to keep eye contact with him as I wrung out my wet hair. I do. I never thought I'd see the day he'd volunteer to go on a business trip, but I know he did it so you could come along and relax. He knows the stress you're going through. It makes me proud to see him being compassionate is that really why he brought me? I'd figured it had to do with something about our contract. It made me kind of embarrassed. What about Ariana? He invited her so you wouldn't feel alone and you'd have more fun, Sebastian told me. Ariana grinned. Hey. I'm all for that. Free trip to Hawaii. I'd have even come along to be her personal assistant. I stared out at the ocean for a moment, biting my lip. I wasn't used to Bennett being so human. Where had this come from? Since when had he been so in tune with what I was feeling? Had he found out I liked him? Is that why he invited me on the date? To tell me it couldn't happen? I ground my teeth together. No Henley. Why did I have to be so negative all the time? I couldn't read Bennett's mind. There was no use speculating. I'd just have to wait. Maybe he just wanted to spend some time together since he hadn't really got to enjoy anything yet. After we left the beach, we headed back to our suite so we could rinse the salt off our bodies. I decided to be cute and wear the white and red hibiscus patterned sundress I'd purchased earlier to match the white flower in my hair. Hopefully where we'd be going wouldn't have a strict dress code. Knowing Bennett, he would find something about my dress to complain about. Are you nervous? Ariana asked as she studied herself in the mirror, trying to get a good look at her backside. She'd opted for forest green sundress and it complimented her beautifully. I feel like I'm always nervous around Bennett but you're going on a date, she all but yelled. Are you happy? Are you excited? I'm all excited for you. I couldn't help but smile at her. What about you? You get to go out with Seb, Ariana grinned. He's cute. But I still think your brother is more my type. Gross. There was a knock at our door. Then it's outside. Sebastian called, keeping it closed. I felt my heart jump into my throat and I gave Ariana a panicked look. She giggled and shoved me at the door playfully. Wiping my sweaty palms off on my dress, I slipped through the door. Sebastian smiled at me warmly. Have fun. Thanks. He reached out for my hand and gave it a squeeze. No matter what you think the future might hold, we'll all be there with you through it. I found my mouth dry up. Did Sebastian know what I was afraid of? How was he so perceptive? Thanks, I said again, feeling an overwhelming emotion of admiration for the sandy-haired man. You better treat Ariana nicely, I added because it was the best friend thing to do. You better treat Bennett nicely, he countered, then paused. Well actually, he deserves some sass from you, I grinned, feeling like a weight lifted off of me. He waved me off and I headed outside, the wind from the ocean ruffling the bottom of my dress and disheveling my hair. As I pushed it back behind my ear, I noticed Bennett standing at the bottom of the deck, staring up at me. He kept his eyes on me as I descended the stairs and I felt like he was scrutinizing my outfit. Per usual, he was in a button-up and a pair of nice jeans. I had been expecting what are you wearing, to come from his mouth. That dress suits you nicely, is what he said instead. For a moment I didn't know how to respond. He was actually complimenting me. This dress. This $20 dress. His gaze zeroed in on the flower in my hair. Where did you get that? Oh, some guy gave it to me earlier he muttered something and reached out, taking the flower from my hair. Just as I was about to protest, he put it back in on the other side of my head. Wear it on the left side, why? I asked. He didn't grace me with a response. Are you hungry? Where would you like to eat? I get to decide, I always make you go along with my agenda. Today we will do what you want, he told me. I eyed him for a moment, feeling a little weirded out. Who is this and where was Bennett? Whatever is fine, 
What do you want to eat? Anything. He flattened his mouth. Just tell me what you want. Henley, sushi. The look that crossed his face told me that he absolutely did not want to eat sushi. But once again, the words that came out of his mouth surprised me. Sushi it is. Do you even like sushi or are you just agreeing? I've never had it. He responded, beginning to walk away from me, toward an idling car I hadn't noticed before. I followed behind him. He slowed so I could walk beside him. Then he opened the door for me. The ride was a silent one. I didn't really mind though, I enjoyed looking out the window at the gorgeous scenery. By the time we pulled up to the restaurant, I felt relaxed again. Bennett once again opened my door for me and even helped me out. The building was black and sleek and there was a sign that read Morimoto. We entered and immediately delicious scents wafted over us. For two, Bennett told the hostess. Outside please, she led the way and I barely managed to keep up, too preoccupied with how gorgeous the interior decor was. It was spacious and modern and very elegant. The restaurant was crowded and I wondered how we'd made it in without reservations. Our table was indeed outside and the view was incredible. There, laid out before us, was the ocean front. Merely hundreds of feet away, our table was on a wooden platform, surrounded by a small trough of water. This is fancy, I said to Bennett. Now I was a little scared to look at the prices on the menu. Bennett shrugged one shoulder. It's showy, I raised my eyebrows. Really? It seems like you've come here before, though. You didn't even look up sushi restaurants in the area. He hesitated a moment before saying, My brother really liked this place, actually. He liked sushi had I heard him right. Was he really talking about Lee? So easily? Lee is actually the one who decided to build the resort here. He went on, looking out over the ocean. My mom wanted to abandon it after the accident. But I said no. It was what Lee wanted. He always did everything for me. I had to do something for him in return. I know it's too late though. I kept silent, not wanting to pry. He seemed to notice what he said and he turned to me, face paling. Sorry. Being here just makes me think about him. I didn't mean to reflect. It's okay. I said quickly. I don't mind. I'd like to hear more about your brother. Bennett's shoulder hunched, guarded. You don't need to be concerned, I scowled. Fine, I just don't want to ruin our time together with unpleasant thoughts. You mean our date? Yes. Is it a part of our contract date? He shook his head. I fidgeted with the napkin on my lap. Then what is it supposed to mean? What do you want it to mean? He asked me, green eyes smoldering into mine as if challenging me. Our waiter showed up just then, saving me from having to answer. I didn't even know how I would answer. What was Bennett trying to get at? My skin felt clammy and I picked up the menu, flipping to where the sushi was, trying to distract myself. We will not take the chef's choice, Bennett said, not even opening the menu. The waiter nodded and Bennett took my menu from me, handing it back to him. I frowned. I didn't even get to look. The chef's choice is a multi-course entree. This way you'll get to try a bit of everything, he explained. It made sense, but I still wanted to look at the menu. But since he'd been here before, I figured I could trust him. And it would also keep me from cringing at the prices. Did you settle the issue you came here for? I asked him as a distraction, sipping at the wine our waiter had dropped off for us. It was sweet and smooth. It worked. His expression grew weary and he nodded. Yes? We have the green light again. The construction should start within a week. My mother won't be happy though, why not? Our budget went up, I sincerely doubted they couldn't afford it, but I kept my opinion to myself. Bennett then went into talking about what the resort would have and what the best selling points would be. Most of the business jargon made no sense to me, but his eyes were lit up in excitement, so I tried to keep up. For someone who complained about his work, it did seem he enjoyed some aspects of it. It was cute. And I was once again stunned by just how smart he was. Our food started to arrive, putting a halt to Bennett's monologue. First up were some delicious oysters. Bennett looked like a finicky child, 
taking the tiniest bite to decide whether he would like it or not. I bit my lip to keep from smiling at him. After the final course was finished and the bill was paid, I was stuffed. The sun was just beginning to set and I was glad we were outside to catch it. Shades of gold were stretching across the sky, reflecting off the ocean. I looked up at Bennett and caught him staring at me. Well, not really caught. It seemed like he was always staring at me these days. Why are you always staring at me? I'm curious about what why you are so attractive to me. He answered simply, his eyebrows furrowing the slightest bit. For a second, I thought I'd die. I couldn't feel my heartbeat at all. Then it kicked in full force and I felt heat rise up the back of my neck. How could he say that with such a straight face? My mind was buzzing as I tried to comprehend it. Was it because of the wine? Was it because of his words? You're nothing I expected to want, he continued, completely ruining the atmosphere. I glowered at him. What is that supposed to mean? I'm not rich and his tan is an onion ring from Burger King. That look of horror that spread along his face was almost enough reason to excuse his ignorant insult. Almost? That's not what I meant. He spoke quickly. Want to take a walk on the beach? I asked because I could not sit here face to face with him for this conversation. He nodded, standing up from the table and moving to pull my chair out for me. I did it myself before he could. Then I beelined for the beach, not even bothering to think about whether it was private or not. I took off my sandals so I could walk better in the sand and notice Bennett doing the same. Why are you walking so fast? He called to me. So I don't have to face you. Sorry, I said instead, allowing him time to catch up with me. Do I make you uncomfortable? He asked slowly, as if afraid of my answer. I paused turning to face him. The sun shone on his skin, creating a golden hue that contrasted well with his dark hair. Why did you ask me out today? I blurted out. Idiot, I berated myself. But I didn't stop there. Was it for the contract? Or was it something else? A hint of irritation crossed his features. Do you think everything is for the contract? No, I said honestly. I don't know anymore did you want today to be a date? He questioned. Forget about the contract. A real date? Between you and I? Yes. My mind shouted. It's not right. We don't suit each other. Say no, Henley. I, I didn't know what to say. My mind was in turmoil. Rationality versus irrationality. Reality versus daydream. Stop holding back what you want to say. Tell me exactly what you're thinking. He said quietly and pleadingly, as if he knew the internal struggle I was having. Yes, I breathed out. I felt my hands shaking at my sides. This wasn't right. He stilled, expression blank. But we have a contract, I said, dropping my eyes, unable to look him in the face. And our lives are too different. I understand that, suddenly I felt Bennett's hand on my cheek, turning my face back up. Suddenly I realized just how close he'd gotten to me. Suddenly there was nothing in the world but him and I felt his breath on my lips. I felt the warmth of his body on my cool skin. The world came crashing back. I pulled away from him, feeling like I couldn't breathe. Through bumps covered my exposed skin. I realized I was scared. His hand dropped. This isn't a good idea, I said. I wanted to kiss him. So, so so badly. But I couldn't do that to myself. This wasn't my life. This wasn't my future. I wasn't the one for Bennett. Deep down, I knew it. It wouldn't be worth the pain. I backed up a few steps, preparing to run. Just as I was about to, Bennett moved forward, pulling me into his arms. My body went rigid, allowing it to happen. He tightened his grip on me, pressing my chest to his. Damn it, Henley. What did I just say? I don't care what you think you should do. Tell me what you want. You have to tell me what you want. You have to let me know I'm not on my own in this. Tell me, Henley. Yes, no sooner had the words left my mouth, Bennett pulled back, eyes searching mine briefly. Then his hand was on my cheek again, lifting my head up. Then his lips were on mine. Hard, 
then soft. Then I realized that it was worth it. My heart hammered against my chest door was it as hard. Every sense of mine was heightened. The waves roared in my ears. My pulse rushed through my veins. His hand squeezed my waist. My hand found his neck. I was the first to pull away, my breathing coming out shakily and uneasily. His eyes were half-lidded and he watched me for a moment before a small smile crossed his face and he went back in for another kiss. The only thought that crossed my mind was, thank God I ate that mint. 